Thank you, Chair. We're now live on YouTube. When you're ready, I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, Wendy. So good morning and welcome to the East Devon District Council's Virtual Strategic Planning Committee meeting on the 22nd of February. I'm your Chair, Councillor Dan Ledger. Now, based on the decisions of Council to continue virtual meetings until the 11th of May, I would like to remind both members and public watching and attending the, the council has delegated much of its decision taking powers to our senior officers. We will continue to adhere as closely as possible to the procedural rules detailed in our constitution. In the event, in the break of an internet connection, please bear with us as we try to reconnect. After 15 minutes, if we are unable to reconnect, we'll consider this meeting adjourned and reconvened at a later date. If you wish to comment, please raise your electronic hand and wait to be called. Any members of the public wishing to view the agenda can do so by visiting our website, eastdevon.gov.uk. We'll now start the meeting by doing a roll call of all committee members here present. Over to you, Wendy. Thank you. Chair, I'll start with you. Councillor Ledger. Present, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Allen. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Arnott. Present, thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Councillor Bailey. Present, thanks. Thank you. Councillor Blakey. Present, Councillor Bonetta. Councillor Chamberlain. Present, Wendy. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Haywood. Councillor Howe. Yes, thank you. Councillor Ingham. Present. Thank you. Councillor Moulding. Present. Councillor Pratt. Councillor Rylance. Councillor Skinner. Thank you, Chair. We are correct for today's meeting. Thanks very much, Wendy. Um, I think we are a bit light on numbers, but I think we can also see that I'm missing a vice chair today. So with that, I'd like to propose that Councillor Mike Howell becomes the vice chair just for today. And we need to take a short vote on that. So all members in favour can you just give us a green tick for yes, red cross for no. We've got uh, six votes in, seven votes in eight. It keeps going up, but they're all in support. Fantastic, thanks very much for that. And thank you to, to Councillor Howe for stepping in today and stepping up to the plate. Um, we'll move on into the agenda to agenda item one, which is public speaking. Um, we've got two members of the public wishing to speak. Uh, Councillor Bruce. Councillor Bruce, you are available as a, as a member of the council to speak at any time. Uh, throughout the meeting, if you wish, but you're also obviously welcome to speak as a member of the public. So over to you, Thank you Chair. Whenever you're ready, Councillor Bruce. Oh, well, I'm off first. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, bear with me a second. Uh, Would you like me to come back? No, no. Uh, right. Chair, members of the committee, you will today be considering a strategy for the distribution of new developments in the draft local plan. Most importantly, for local communities, you'll be identifying the specific sites where its proposed development should be located. I'm aware that the initial draft of the local plan does not meet the government's housing target for East Devon by some 900 houses, and that the committee faces a potentially difficult task in bridging the gap. I've noted that among the potential options to achieve this, the village of Fenniston is identified in at least two. This seems to be partly because the call for sites produced a number of superficially suitable sites and partly because of its identification as a larger service village. I would like to remind the committee that four of the sites at Featherton have already been tested at the Consolidated Planning Inquiry of 2014, when all but the smallest sites were rejected. The planning inspector concluded unequivocally that Featherton is not a sustainable location for new large-scale housing. The developers of these sites and the new sites now proposed at Feniston cannot claim with any authority or credibility that Feniston has become a more sustainable place for large-scale housing. Indeed, I and the Parish Council would contend that, if anything, the situation is now worse. Relative to the population, the number of jobs easily accessible to the village is tiny. As a consequence, the working population has to drive to its employment and car ownership in the village is way above the national average. While it is tempting to conclude that the presence of a railway station in the village makes it suitable as a commuter village for Exeter or Honiton, the reality is that trains only stop every two hours. The prospect of providing a service in the peak period that is sufficient 
sufficiently frequent to attract commuters from their cars is zero. The single track line will not allow it. Bus services are equally uninviting or inconvenient. The primary school is at capacity and on a constrained site. Consequently, the parents of new families coming to the village are already often required to transport their children to other villages by car. None of these parents is then going to return, park up and seek public transport to get to their jobs. The village shop provides a good service, but very few could rely on it for their total weekly shop. Most travel by car to supermarkets in nearby towns. While the draft plan identifies Fenton as a service village, less facilities and other services in the villages in the villages are limited. There is no doctor. So again, more car journeys are needed to meet the needs of the village population. So typically of many East Devon villages, the pattern in Fenton is one of already high car usage on completely unsuitable village lanes. The main roads into the village all have places where two cars cannot pass, are dangerously narrow and none have footpath. There is already, this is already completely unsustainable. More housing at the scale proposed is simply not acceptable in this location. In addition, Fenton is already well known for its propensity to flood. Housing on open fields around the village will only add to this problem. I've already, I have reason to believe that the one small flood development approved in the inquiry of 2014 at Ackland Park has failed to implement its flood mitigation measures. Moreover, the site is incomplete, abandoned and a health hazard. The experience in Fenton is that more hard services always add to the existing flooding problems for the rest of the village. Developers put forward land around Fenerson that in theory could provide 650 new homes. While the committee might be tempted to include some of this in the draft local plan to meet the 900 shortfall, I would urge you to consider this very, very carefully. The HELA assessment has not yet been published for these sites. No sustainable assessment has been made of the sites and individually and more importantly collectively. I believe that the categorization of the majority of the sites as four or five is not supported by the facts and is in direct conflict with the 2040 decision of the planning inspector. The village's neighborhood plan of 2018 is clear about the implications of vast development and the problems facing Fenton. In supporting the plan, East Devon District Council noted that it was made with considerably considerable community engagement and congratulated the parish working group on all its hard work. Members will be aware that a plan inquiry is a quasi judicial process the planning inspector was very clear in her judgment in 2014. Fenderson is not a sustainable location for new mass housing and nothing has changed since then. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Bruce. We'll, we'll next come to Councillor Roger Charles uh, speaking on behalf of Ottery St Mary. Roger, are you with us? No, he doesn't seem to be with us. Um, we'll try and get him in and I'll, I'll happily take uh, the question at a later point. We'll move on to agenda item two minutes of the previous meeting held on the 25th and 26th of January and the 8th of February. Um, does anyone have any comments they wish to make or uh, are we happy just to accept those? I'll take those as accepted. Thank you very much. Um, agenda item three is apologies. Wendy, I'm sure we've received some apologies. Just one from Councillor Davey. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I hope those are accepted by the committee. Um, agenda item four, declarations of interest. Again, we need to remind members, can you declare what type of interest, whether it's a person or a DPI, uh, and why you're declaring the interest and what agenda item it, it's referring to. So over to, to Wendy to do a roll call. Thank you, Councillor Ledger, I'll start with you. None from me at present. Thank you. Councillor Allen. I have none. Thank you. Councillor Arnott. Um, I can't do it as rock and roll as Councillor Allen, but none, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bailey. Hi, I'm just a personal interest for all items as Devon County Councillor for the Otter Valley. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Blakey. None that I'm aware of. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you. Councillor Chamberlain. Thanks, Wendy. The only ones are 
um, to declare me as a broadcast parish councillor also and the ones in my ward. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have Councillor Hayward in the meeting. Good morning, Councillor Hayward. Do you have any declarations? Good morning, Wendy. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, can I make my sort of standing personal declaration as the locum clerk to act against the town council uh, and the uh, clerk to Chardstock Parish Council and All Saints Parish Council um, in respect of items 7, 8, 9 and 13, please. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Howe. Yeah, um, with relation to items 13, I'm a Bishop's Cliss Parish Council uh, member, which a lot of these sites are based in my ward. And also I um, own a shop in Cliss St Mary, and there is one or two allocations that are possibly related there. But at present they're personal, if that changes, because I think it's more relevant, then I'll obviously go that way, shall we say. Thank you. Councillor Ingham. Nothing. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Moulding. None. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Councillor Pratt. Do you have any declarations? Not to my knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Councillor Rylance. Do you have any declarations? Good morning. Um, yes, so I'd like to declare a personal interest as a parish councillor and resident of Broadless Parish. Um, in item 13, please, because a lot of it is located in my ward and my parish. Well, some of it is anyway. Thank you. And I don't think we have Councillor Skinner, do we? So back to you, Chair. Thanks very much for that, Wendy. Uh, we move on to uh, item five, which are matters of urgency. So I can confirm that there are no matters of urgency. Uh, the next item is confidential and exempt items. Again, I can confirm there are no confidential and exempt items. Agenda item seven is housing monitoring and update to the year ending 31st of March, 2021. Uh, and it is over to Ed Freeman. Welcome to the meeting, Ed. Uh, over to you for a report. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good morning, members. Um, so this first report is uh, the annual housing monitoring report for 2020-21. Uh, apologies for the delay in bringing this to members. These reports would usually come forward to you around um, September, October. Uh, time, uh, unfortunately, because of work on the new local plan, uh, this has been delayed, um, as well as the need to develop a, a new methodology for undertaking this work in light of new government guidance and case law in terms of the robustness of evidence needed to, to support what's going into here. So um, I can confidently say I think this is the most robust uh, housing monitoring report we've ever produced uh, in the sense that it's backed up by robust evidence obtained from the landowners and developers of all of the major sites uh, in this equation in terms of their expected delivery rates uh, and timetables to help to underpin uh, what, what we're producing here in terms of a housing monitoring report. Um, so th there's a combination of good news and bad news uh, in this report fundamentally. Uh, the good news is um, that 872 homes were built in the district um, during the monitoring period of 2020 to 21. Um, that is uh, lower than in, in the number of the preceding years, but obviously uh, in, the, in the position of a, 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 a pandemic, I think that was pretty good going um, and certainly better anecdotally than a lot of authorities have seen uh, compared to normal levels of, of performance. So uh, I would take that as good. It's obviously less than the 918 that the government standard method would require us to do. So it has, um, added slightly to a shortfall, but um, we slightly oversupplied in some of the previous years within the five years. So we end up with um, an overall shortfall of, of only two. Uh, so that's that's good. Um, and we do still have a five year housing land supply. Uh, we're at 5.49 years supply. The bad news is that that is a declining position. Um, Members may recall that in the previous monitoring period, we had a 5.73 year housing land supply. So it has dropped from there. Um, and when we look ahead to uh, our projections for housing completions uh, beyond the five year period, um, which you'll see are in the report on the, in a table at the top of page 45, you will see how our projections start to drop off quite significantly from 20, 
for, uh, 2025 to 2026. We're down at 714 homes projected, and then we're down into the 600s uh, for, from there onwards to the rest of the plan period. Um, so this really illustrates a need to take action, um, particularly in terms of progressing the new local plan and obviously identifying that next generation of housing sites to come forward um, and maintain our supply position. Um, but also, as is, is highlighted in the report in the section headed future risks, section five, uh, there, there's perhaps also a need for, for more immediate action, accepting that the local plan is unlikely to be adopted before 2024 of um, looking closely at new housing applications coming forward uh, and, and where they don't necessarily fit with the adopted strategy, perhaps reviewing them in, in light of the housing supply position and seeing if there's something that uh, could be considered acceptable uh, to help to boost the housing supply position. Um, I think they would very much need to be taken on a case by case basis. Uh, and obviously officers will be advising planning committee uh, accordingly where we think that that would be the case. Um, obviously a lot of sites that come forward still have specific issues with those sites that would make them potentially unsustainable or unacceptable in some way. Um, but we do occasionally get sites that come forward um, where you know, they're largely acceptable, they just don't fit with our current local plan strategy and so are contrary to policy. And it's those sorts of sites where I think we may need to review our position and, and, and start to think whether or not uh, we, we need to look at those differently, particularly if they're sites that um, we're looking upon positively in terms of the emerging local plan as well. And members will recall from the previous local plan how quite often as a local plan starts to emerge, we start to see sites coming forward ahead of adoption of the plan. Uh, and that can be a way in which to um, help to, to boost and maintain supply. Uh, so draw members attention to, to those future risks and, and actions that um, I would suggest need to be considered in the meantime to help to maintain supply. Uh, aside from that, I would uh, recommend the report to members and the three recommendations at the start of the report that members note the residential dwellings completion date and future projections for the district, including the comments I've mentioned on future supply risks detailed in section five of the report. Uh, the members note the confirmation of five year land supply and the members note that the housing monitoring update will be published on the council's website. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for that, Ed. Really appreciate it. Um, Councillor Skinner, welcome to the meeting. Good morning. Do you have any declarations of interest you wish to give at the time? Good morning. And of course I do. I've got more declarations of interest than anybody. You know that, <laughs> Mr Chairman. And if I don't declare them all, I'll be another pile of poo that I'll be into with an undated leader that we have. So um, where shall I start? I, I don't have to comment on that. the interest that, on... on I don't have to declare an interest on uh, Plimtree um, Parish Council uh, any further um, because I'm now not a member of that. So I want to put the record straight on that so as that's clear. And I will make my um, interest um, uh, regarding um, the Hill Barton. Uh, so Stuart family, I suppose I ought to see Stuart family and the FWS Carter and Sons. And I will be having a declaration of interest if it comes up in the course of time regarding uh, a piece of land that I put in into Tallerton uh, myself, although it's, it's not hearing in these papers from what I understand, but if it does approach itself in the future, in, in a moment, I shall um, I shall declare it then, uh, as that's as far as I, I know, um, um, Chair. So, uh, yes, thank you for that. And I do apologise for being uh, running a bit behind time. I'm, I do apologise for that. Sorry about that. Thank you. No problem at all, Councillor Skinner. Thank you very much for that. Um, we'll move into back into the report and if I don't see any members from outside committee wishing to speak. So Councillor Ryans, can we go to you please? Thank you, Chair. So Ed, thank you for your report. Uh, it was actually really clear. It's much clearer, I really, I, even I understood it. But there's just a couple of typos, I think that in, the, in, in section 3.2, um, in lines B and C, I think the number, the, the way the calculation was arrived at, B, B and C, should be A times five and A times eight, not B times five and B times eight. Just because I'm a bird of very little brain, I sort of, you know, I stopped on those and went, oh, that doesn't make sense. But actually, it's it's the annual requirement times five and the annual requirement times eight, I think, isn't it? Uh, yes, I think you're right, Councillor. Apologies for that. Okay. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Rylance. Councillor Bailey, we'll come to you next, please. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the report, Ed. It does worry me, um, the paragraph 5.2, which... Um, 
because we're basically working towards our new local plan so that we can direct development. But now we're saying, well, okay, we we haven't got, a, you know, our local plan is emerging, but we might as well, um, or we could potentially accept sites coming forward that aren't in our local plan. And that I'm just worried that that's going to open the floodgates for, um, you know, loads of um, applicants who are in the local plan putting their sites preemptively forward. Um, particularly as we haven't yet seen the HELA. So um, when are we going to see the HELA, please? And um, I'm concerned about the comments made in 5.2, because surely the whole point of trying to get on with our local plan ASAP is to stop this kind of uh, preemptive uh, situation where some of those sites uh, uh, will start coming forward too soon. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Belly. Uh, we'll take Councillor Moulding next and then come back to Ed. So Councillor Moulding, we'll come to you, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, on page 48, under the heading of Future Risks 5.1, I again must mention the um, terminology there that says the removal of the Axminster Urban Extension from the supply projections. Well, I wasn't aware that we had yet determined that, and that will be determined as we progress through the local plan uh, and um, uh, as uh, members are probably aware the um, urban extension in Axminster has been in the local plan since the 1990s and it's been suggested that it should be uh, removed from the supply on the basis that it's undeliverable. Now in other words that means that at the moment just at the moment the developers have not been able to secure the funding to deliver the site or either they are waiting and we are waiting and have been for a little while for government to consider the urgency of this site, both from a point of view of uh, housing numbers, and that's very specific to this item, and in terms of the great need for a relief road for Axminster. Now, one or two sites have been put forward in the local plan process that are, uh, in my opinion, not deliverable because they uh, suggest that traffic will go through the busy Musbury Road, which is very narrow, and again, highlights the urgent need for a relief road for Axminster. But it's not just the relief road for Axminster. Axminster doesn't want to stagnate. It wants to grow. And the place for it to grow is in the Northeast Urban Extension area. Now, if there is a concern over five year land supply, then surely the Axminster Urban Extension should remain within the plan to deliver what Axminster needs and at the same time to assist with the five-year land supply that this council urgently needs. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Moulding. I think just going back to, to Councillor Bailey's point is, and I think what the report is trying to say is that if uh, a site comes forward through the planning committee, so it will be for the planning committee to decide that would be acceptable, that isn't in line with current policy, it would be for the planning committee to decide whether that would be that that would come forward ahead to and that would supplement the supply of our five year land supply. With Councillor Moulding, with regards to Axminster, I think the removal of the supply is just the fact that it's not currently felt by officers that Axminster will be any any housing will be able to be delivered in the next five years. It's not the we haven't it's for this committee to decide whether the urban extension is removed or is, is kept in place. But it's felt by officers currently that obviously due to the phosphates issues that we've got with the, the emerging um, nutrient management plan and the funding issues that that will not be delivered within five years. So we cannot include it within our supply figures. Ed, can, can I, I come back on that, Chair? Uh, uh, the, the, the whole matter of, of the phosphate issues, I understand what that means. But it's just not not just the River Axe. It's every river in East Devon. And, and I don't think you can make a specific point about phosphate problems for the River Axe. It must happen in every river. River Yarty, River Collie, uh, River um, 
uh, the rivers in in the um, Honiton area, the rivers in Ex the Exmouth Ottery area, phosphates yeah. are going to be created in the adjoining land and will be a threat to rivers and mitigation measures must be taken. And mitigation measures, I agree, should be taken and that would apply to the River Axe as well as it would apply to other rivers in the area. Totally agree, Councillor Moulding. Um, I'll come to Ed now just to, to cover off anything that, that I haven't. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, so just to, to, to go back to Councillor uh, Bailey's comments, I think it was um, the HELA report we hope to bring in at your April meeting. Um, there's a huge amount of work going into writing up all of those, those meetings, um, so we should have that for April, hopefully. Um, I, I understand the issue about preempting the local plan. Um, and I think you know it's, it's a difficult situation of trying to, to balance, obviously, going through due process with the local plan, but also trying to maintain a five-year housing land supply position. Uh, and I fear if we don't take uh, action, we're at a significant risk of not having a five-year housing land supply at some point between now and adoption of the new local plan. Um, and we also need to be in a position whereby the new local plan can show that we will have a five-year housing land supply upon its adoption. So if we fall behind before then, that becomes much harder to, to demonstrate and, and much harder for the plan to be found sound. Um, so, uh, but I'm not talking, hopefully not talking about bringing forward any sites that wouldn't necessarily otherwise come forward. It's about um, potentially bringing forward sites uh, that are acceptable and widely accepted uh, sooner um but as the chair has said um because that would be a departure from policy that would all have to go through planning committee so i'm not talking about delegated decisions here i'm talking about uh, conscious decisions by planning committee uh with, with sufficient advice from officers to to consider the position and the wider implications of those decisions with regard to the housing and supply position um, in terms of the, the removal of Axminster Urban Extension, um, just to quickly confirm uh, what the Chair has said, really, the, the issue here is about evidence of its um, building out within the next five years, um, and we simply don't have evidence to, to suggest that that would be the case. Um, I think even the developers were not suggesting that that would be the case. Um, so that's why it's not in um, our five-year our, our monitoring report and within the five-year housing and supply. Doesn't mean it can't come back in at a later date if we can unlock the issues there uh, and enable that to come forward. And, and doesn't mean, it, I see it as a separate issue from uh, whether it's allocated in the new local plan. Um, in terms of the acts, I, th I think the issue, yes, I'm sure there are phosphate levels issues in, in, in many of the rivers in, in the districts. The acts is the current priority, priority because uh, is, is a, a des European designated habitat, uh, especially over conservation. So um, it, it's uh, sort of prioritised, shall we say, at, at this point. But um, once we've resolved that, we may well need to move on and look at the other rivers in the district as well. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. We now come to Councillor Benningham. Good morning, Chair. Uh, I believe Councillor Moulding's absolutely right about phosphates. It's, he's right because it's across the whole country, you know, not just Devon or parts of Devon, that we have an issue. And that has to be addressed. Um, and I, I think he, he was right on uh, Axminster as well. Axminster is totally different and its needs and aspirations are quite different from uh, the other towns within um, East Devon, let alone the rest of Devon, which is why I believe that the hierarchy of tiered um, communities that we've got in uh, provisionally in the plan, it is fundamentally flawed and wrong. Um, but um, to me, what's important from the report chair is that I don't believe we should panic at all if you look at you know the top of page what is it 45 and you work out an average 847 a year that's nothing to panic about uh chair um each year you, you I'm sure you've seen it on, on television uh wildebeest migrate uh and they cross the Zambezi which is full of crocodiles and they do it in one big block. Uh, and the premise of that is a few will get killed and dragged under, but the vast majority will succeed. The reason I tell you that, when government reviews um, 
the ability of authorities to provide a five-year land supply. I think we're at the front and in the middle of that pack crossing the river. There's nothing for us to worry about. Please bear in mind the appalling position that other authorities are in. And if anyone's going to gun for an authority because of their failure to meet a five-year land supply, our track record's superb, and we ain't on that list. And uh, I don't think we should panic. We should be aware and um, cognitive of the position we're in. But let's not panic, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ian. Councillor Allen, uh, we come to you next. Thank you, Chair. Um, one or two points. Firstly, as far as I'm aware, Strategic Planning Committee considers major applications, not the uh, Planning Committee. And I'm wondering if um, uh, Ed Freeman can please clarify the procedures that should apply to major applications. The second point I'd make is that we should not remove the Axminster expansion because it will only cost an extra 10 million pounds to put that in place whereas Cranbrook will cost 40 million pounds in infrastructure and whereas the present administration has decided that Cranbrook should receive that funding approach um, the previous administration of independence under Ian Thomas took the decision to eliminate the willingness of the council to fund that relief road. Um, so I think that needs discussion again strategically and we shouldn't ignore it. Um, I'm very concerned that the types of housing don't seem to be figuring in these conversations. I've continually uh, stressed the need for elderly homeowners and disabled people to get the right kind of housing. And I'm still very concerned that that does not figure in the local plan. So I'd be very grateful with your permission, Chair, if I might bring an appropriate recommendation to the next SPC so that it will be considered because it's been rejected twice for uh, consideration. And I think we are in danger of missing uh, the constitutional and um, legal requirement to be equal and equitable in what we do. Last but not least, when we're looking at the housing numbers and where we put them, I'm very concerned that um, East Devon is the worst uh, district council for travel to work distances. And that's not acceptable. And I've constantly stressed the need to bring reasonable employment space closer to the place where people live so that they don't have to travel. Now that's totally in line with the green policy of this council, but again, is not being taken into account with any of our considerations of housing. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Allen. And ju just on your points with Axminster and trying to draw uh, similarities with Cranbrook, I think the difference between the two is Cranbrook is a revolving infrastructure fund, which should hopefully come through with the, the acceptance of the, the Cranbrook DPD. And Cranbrook will make up that, that, that shortfall. So anything taken from that fund will be met through developers building out the phases. Whereas with Axminster, there's an identified shortfall and that's why it cannot come forward currently. We can't, it is a shortfall on the funding so that they cannot pay it back. I think I just need to, to mention, just because you've mentioned another councillor, you said Councillor Ian Thomas was running the independent. It was actually Councillor Ingham not Councillor Thomas. I, I oh, beg your pardon, but I, but I think there. we're talking strategy on this um, meeting, and I think that is a strategic issue. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, no problem at all. Thank you. Councillor Hayward, we'll come to you now, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I suppose I should um, 
preempt what I'm going to say by saying this is not a statement on behalf of the town council. It's simply me as a member of strategic planning and the ward member for Yarty. Um, I just need to take issue with something that Councillor Moulding said, um, because he makes a fairly broad brush statement when he says Axminster wants growth. Um, well, that's a very subjective statement. Um, Axminster has been growing since the, the, the medieval period, you know, since the Middle Ages, but it's been growing organically. Um, what's proposed in recent um, uh, reincarnations of different plans is a huge growth spurt without the commensurate infrastructure improvements, job improvements, facilities, green spaces, etc. cetera. Um, so I just need to just for caveat, because this is a public meeting, it's, it's being recorded for the, for the public to view afterwards, that yes, some people want um, unfettered growth of housing, others do not. Others want an organic growth that allows the town to develop uh, at a pace um, that suits the residents who already live here. Um, so, you know, infrastructure is key, that the town is not anti-growth. What it's over is un, unchecked uh, and unreasonable and unfettered growth that doesn't match the realities of the town as it is. Yes, we have a huge transport problem that isn't going to go away anytime soon. Um, but I just need to just check what Councillor Moulding said. Yes, he may well be um, in favour of this, but that's not the whole of Axminster. Um, there are no other Axminster ward members here, so they can't speak for themselves. But I'll speak as the Yarty ward member and someone who lives in Axminster and is a resident of Axminster. In terms of the, um, the nutrient uh, issue, and Councillor Lord is absolutely right. It is an issue across the whole of East Devon, across the whole of the country. But it is specifically mentioned in previous plans, and it therefore has to be dealt with because it's mentioned and any future development has to deal with nutrient uh, discharge phosphates nitrates into the axe and yes the yarty is connected the kit is connected and the growth in chard is having a similar impact because it all flows down to the sea um but it can't be discounted just because it is this what if -ery. you know what about other places no axe minister it's specifically mentioned so we need to deal with it and i'm grateful to to mr freeman for the clarity of the report it's not discounting the urban extension it's just saying it's not deliverable within the time frame that you're having to use for this so it's not taking it out it's just noting that it's not probably likely within that period certainly until someone comes up with the means to pay for a relief road and determine a location which i should add is still up for debate because the jury is out amongst various different people as to the route that relief road should take should it go through a housing estate or should it follow a natural course along a railway and come out there. It's all to do with money. Everything is to do with money. Um, so thank you very much indeed, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hayward. Before I take any more um, speakers, I, I just think I need to mention to, to all councillors, we're discussing the housing monitoring report. We're not discussing phosphates in Axminster. We're not discussing the Cranbrook DPD. And it, we're, we're drifting off, of course. Can all members, when they're directing it, refer to the report? And we've got a lot of business to get through, so we really need to be focused. I've been kind of kind this morning and not jumping in on people, but I will start cutting cutting members off if we if we drift off course. So, Councillor Arnold, we move to you, please. Thank you, Chair. Cheekily, I think I was about to suggest something similar, so I, I won't even repeat that. Uh, well done. I just wanted to say two very quick things, Chair. First of all, uh, to congratulate Mr Freeman and you and others connected that we can say that as of today's report, we are content that we have a safe five year land supply. It's a very secure position to be in. It's come from a lot of work. It's very important. It protects us and it allows us to do the work ahead with a degree of comfort. Um, and I'm really proud of that for this administration. As I am, as you'd expect, perhaps fear me to say, Chair, very proud that uh, the policy on this committee in declaring interests it is now fit for the 21st century. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Arnott. Councillor Skinner, we, we come to you next, please. Um, yes, and I just there's just one issue I wonder, <laughs> and I don't want to fall off track, but it's, it's a question to Mr. Freeman, really. Um, and and it, it is around delivery and it is around um, 
these um, nitrates. And, and if he doesn't want to go into it now, that's fine because he could do it in the written one. But I'd like to know the impact of this and who's 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 going to pay for it within deliverable issues. Who who pays for the clearing up of the nitrates? How, how does it work? I wonder if Mr. Freeman just give me a, a quickie on that because it seems to be a stumbling block, block and it's going to be as we, we go on. But I don't want to make a big issue, um, Chair, Chairman. I just want to I just want to um, uh, just try to find out. Uh, just a quick premise of, of that one, just for the minute, just get me head into a, a place of understanding. Usually for the developer to, to pay a mitigation fee, but Ed, if you want to come in. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. So, so yeah, it would be for the developers to mitigate the impact of their development in terms of phosphate levels, which is the, the key issue with the, the acts. Um, the issue is, um, and what we're working on, is trying to develop a mitigation strategy so that there are projects that they can contribute towards delivery of, which might be in the form of, um, for example, reed beds that, that seek to um, uh, filter the... the um, discharge for, from the uh, development sites before it reaches the um, special area of conservation within the axe to then reduce the phosphate levels uh, reaching that area or it might be uh, off-site measures such as uh, changes to agricultural practices uh, in the area to reduce phosphate levels from from elsewhere to, the, to then allow scope for, for, for the discharge from, from the development uh, so that's what we're working on at the moment um, I hope to bring a report uh, sometime in the next couple of meetings, maybe April or May meeting uh, with an update on where we are with uh, developing a mitigation strategy. Uh, certainly much of the big issue at the moment is we can identify sort of short term mitigation measures, projects over five or 10 years, but delivering projects that deliver in perpetuity, which is what we need to do to enable residential developments to come forward in the area is, is quite challenging. Um, but um, yeah, we'll bring a report to, to a future meeting to update members on that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ed. Uh, Councillor Pratt, we, we come to you now, please. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Ed, I wonder if you could uh, advise me uh, whether or not there are any, any uh, developments by the District Council for housing in included in your figures. Thanks very much, Councillor Pratt. We'll just take Councillor Ingham and then we'll come back to Ed. So, Councillor Ingham, over to you. Uh, uh, thanks, Chair. It's just a point of order. Uh, in actual fact, I believe Councillor Allen was right because it was when Councillor Thomas was leader of the council as uh, leader of the Conservative administration that that decision was taken. Not while I was leader. I, I thought the other way during my short tenure, Chair. And by the way, I do think you mentioned phosphates first. I'll have to listen to the tape, Chair. Bye for now. Thank you very much. Whether I bring it in as a response to a question asked, I can't help that, Councillor Ingham. Um, the only thing, so looking to the recommendations, we will go to Ed just before summing up. Um, I'd like to add just one more recommendation with the agreement of committee is that there is a short briefing session with both strategic planning committee and the planning committee um, regarding giving advice basically we would ask the planners to give advice on um how we boost supply outside of this outside of the, the emerging local plan i don't think i think there has been some concerns raised by councillor Bailey and, and some other councillors and just for more clarity there uh, I, I wouldn't expect it today, but outside the meeting for both planning committee and SBC, could we invite planning committee over to a briefing session? Ed, would that be acceptable? Um, we can certainly set that up, Chair, if that's uh, members' wish, yes. Okay, so that, that would uh, be a Chair, I, I, I did ask for Ed Freeman to respond about the procedure for major applications. No problem, Councillor Allen. So we'll, we'll go to Ed now. Um, Ed, can you please answer Councillor Pratt's question uh, and follow up on Councillor Allen's as well, please? Yes, certainly, Chair. So um, in terms of Councillor Allen's comments, I mean, uh, this, this committee, Strategic Planning Committee, doesn't consider any planning applications. Um, so major applications um, can be determined uh, under delegated powers where everyone's in agreement, otherwise they're considered by a planning committee. So the applications referred to in the report where we may want to depart from policy would all have to be decisions by a planning committee. 
Um, in terms of, I think Councillor Allen also mentioned the discussion about different types of housing. Um, I, I think we did pick that up at a previous meeting discussion in relation to the working draft of the local plan. And there are certainly new policies proposed within the working draft of the local plan to secure a, a fuller range of, of different housing types to meet different needs in the district, including those for, with um, accessibility uh, and adaptable homes requirements. Um, I think the other point was uh, Councillor Pratt's comment about um, developments within the figures by EDDC. I can't think of any off the top of my head, but without going through um, the full list of, of sites, um, of which there are hundreds, um, I couldn't say for sure, but I'm struggling to think of any that uh, are EDDC sites that would be within this, this work. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for that, Ed. So with no other further speakers. Uh, may I? Since I've been named, uh, Councillor Allen, I think we need to move on now. I, I think we've, we've spent enough time on this. So, with but there's no been other, an ac inaccurate statement made. I don't think the officer will make an inaccurate statement, Councillor Allen. We need to move on to the vote now. We've got a lot of business to get through. So, with the recommendation before us, we, I've proposed it from the chair with this with one additional recommendation. Um, Mrs Shaw, welcome to the meeting. Can you please take us to, to a vote and sum up? Yes, Chair. Could I just ask if you would, at recommendation three, agree to the wording, note that the housing monitoring update as corrected will be pun published? As there was mention of an error in one of the tables, we don't want that to carry through to the publication. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, you have before you a recommendation to note the residential dwellings completion data and future projections for the district, including the comments on future supply risks detailed in section five of the report. Note the confirmation of a five year land supply. Note that the housing monitoring update as corrected will be published on the council's website and request a short briefing for strategic planning committee and the planning committee from planners as to how supply can be boosted outside the local plan. Members, please, when you press your green tick, if you're in support of the motion, press your red cross if you're against the motion or raise your electronic hand to indicate you're abstaining from the vote. And just waiting for all the votes to come in. So we have 11 votes in support, no votes against, and no abstentions. Thank you very much. So that's passed. Um, what I'd like to do now is come to Councillor Roger Giles. He's, he's now joined us in the meeting. Um, Councillor Giles, would you like to, to speak now or before the agenda item? I believe it's agenda item 13 that you wish to speak on. I'll speak now, if I may. And um, apologies for technological difficulties previously. And I particularly appreciate um, you uh, accommodating me when I missed my spot earlier. Thank you. Uh, so, Chairman, thank you for allowing me to address you about the East Devon Local Plan on behalf of Ottery St Mary Town Council and the people of Ottery. In, in the current local plan, Osprey St Mary has had a greater percentage growth, 25%, than any other town in East Devon, uh, other than Cranbrook. Those 500, 500 house approvals are still to be completed, and the infrastructure to accommodate those additional 1,300 people lags far behind. Osprey needs time to assimilate the, those new arrivals, who are very welcome, and provide the services they deserve. So what do Ottery people see in the latest emerging local plan? The possibility of a quite astonishing additional 1,300 houses. It's there in the map on page 27 of the papers that came before your committee on the 14th of December. 1,300 additional houses in Ottery was an option that councillors were asked to support at your meeting on the 8th of February. 1,300 extra homes represent further growth in excess of 50%. The key to strategic planning, Chairman, is sustainability, as I heard quite often at your meeting last night. Offering is no railway station, a poor bus service, a secondary school at capacity, a primary school at capacity, 
very narrow access roads, no bank and an overstretched medical centre. It's very far from being a sustainable location. To my mind, it's quite absurd to even think about such a level of extra housing in Austria. And Chairman, I'm also very concerned about the level of extra housing, 470 proposed in West Hill. You might tell me that that's none of my business, but West Hill secondary school children attend the King's School in Ottery, and West Hill residents see their GP in Ottery. West Hill Parish Council and Ottery St Mary Town Council are working together. They jointly wrote to you, you being East Devon District Council, on the 9th of February to express their great concern about the local plan proposals. Perhaps you can tell me, Chair, if the compelling arguments in that joint letter were brought to the attention of the strategic planning committee members. Parish and town councils are best placed to know about land availability and land suitability. They, they were excluded from the call for sites process. Last night, Chairman, I heard much about the government flawed planning algorithm. Can I gently and politely suggest that by excluding parish and town councils from the calls for sites process, EDDC also had a flawed approach? Thank you for listening. And I would like an answer about the joint Audrey St Mary Town Council, West Hill Parish Council letter that was sent to the step. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Giles. Um, with regard to the letter, I'm unsure without having I can't really go through my emails right now, whether it's been sent through to, to all committee members. I know that you did receive a response from the service lead, but I don't know if it's been shared with, with all members. I, I can't say that, that was in the meeting without, I'll, I'll go through my, um, my emails afterwards and, and obviously share it with committee if needed. Um, with regards to the sites, and I think I need to make this um, extremely clear to everyone is, all of the sites currently put forward are what officers are uh, officer preferred sites. I think the, the process that we've been going on since December is to indicate policy intent by the committee. What's gonna then happen after today's meeting, I'm hopefully we'll, we'll finish off all of the last remaining bits of policy. It will then be going back to the officers to, to reassess all of the sites in light of our policy intent. So everything that we are viewing now is subject to change. And there are a number of different sites that obviously through the policy decisions that we've made are now longer, um, no longer eligible for, for putting forward. I know that there is going to be some tough decisions to, to be made, but everything is obviously in the gift of this committee and um, we'll be taking a policy led approach throughout. Uh, what I'd like to do now, uh, thank you very much for your contributions, Mr. Giles, the Councillor Giles today. Um, we'll move back into the agenda. Um, and we move on to agenda item eight, further engagement with developers and site promoters to inform the local production. And again, it's over to Ed Freeman to present his report. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this report um, follows on from uh, members' consideration of this issue around engagement with developers and site promoters at the meeting on the 19th of November uh, 2021, where members resolved to set aside two days of committee time to hear presentations from developers and site promoters. Uh, members will recall that that happened on the 25th and 26th of January, and hopefully members found those sessions useful. Um, members heard presentations from about 33 uh, sites that have been put forward. Uh, in the local plan process. We did have to uh, rationalise those sites in terms of the requests that we'd received in accordance with uh, members' resolutions on the 19th of November 2021 and prioritise those mid-scoring sites, so those sites that were borderline in terms of officers' initial assessment as to whether or not they should be allocated. And that led to the, the 33 uh, presentations that, that members heard. There were, however, a further 27 sites where developers and site promoters wanted to make a presentation to members, uh, but those sites fell out of the, the scope of the meeting, i.e. They, they scored uh, quite lowly in terms of officers assessment or, or quite highly and, and were felt to be 
um, good sites for, for allocation in officers' initial assessment. Um, there's also uh, a number of parties who either missed the deadline or have come forward subsequently um, who would want to present to members as well in terms of their sites. Um, so that uh, left a question in my mind in terms of whether members wanted to set aside more time to hear presentations from developers and site promoters, uh, and if so, on, on what basis they would want to do that. Um, would they want to change the setup in any way in terms of what was heard previously? For example, uh, I, I thought on reflection of the two meetings that we had, it was quite noticeable on the second day that we ended up running quite a long way ahead of schedule because a number of the smaller sites didn't take up their full allotted time. Uh, so it may be that a shorter time slot on smaller sites might be appropriate if, if members were minded to set aside more time. Um, equally, members may want to look at um, whether or not they want to rationalise again in terms of uh, against uh, officers' initial scoring, which sites they hear, uh, whether you want to hear about sites that in officers' assessment have scored as, as a one and are, are really not acceptable in planning terms, or indeed those sites that have scored uh, five or six and, and, and are considered to be clearly appropriate uh, sites. Uh, they may be within an existing built-up area boundary um, and, and sites that are acceptable under existing policy and at which point I would question the value of, of, of spending time hearing presentations from those sites. So uh, welcome members' views on, on, on those issues as well as the, the, the principle of setting aside additional time. Uh, the other point I wanted to raise is off the back of those presentations at the end of January, a number of parties have contacted us as officers and said that, um, you know, they, they wanted to have further more detailed discussions about the evidence that exists that would uh, potentially help to inform for officers further assessment of, of those sites. And I can see merit in, in officers having some further engagement um, with some of those developers and site promoters to ensure that we've got all of the relevant information that may help us to uh, assess those sites and, and take forward further work on, on the local plan. So um, I would um, recommend recommendation two to members that officers be allowed to do that um, uh, on, on the basis of, of gaining that additional information and evidence to inform our work moving forwards. Um, thank you, Chairman. Thanks very much for that. I really appreciate it. Um, so members, you've got three options in front of you listed in the report. Um, can we please refer to, to which one would be preferable with each speaker? So we will start with Councillor Mike Allen. Um, the floor is yours, Mike. Uh, thank you. I think that uh, Ed has actually proposed one and two, um, which I think, strangely enough, is a very good idea that uh, we should allow time under option one for developers who have not yet had the opportunity to present because I think that's just democratic. But secondly, uh, to set aside more time for presentations when uh, Ed Freeman and the developers have uh, gone through the queries and, and uh, he, Ed, thinks it's appropriate to set up another meeting. So uh, the only other thing I would say is I'm totally in agreement with uh, Roger Giles. Strategically, we shouldn't add to Ottery. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Councillor Bailey, can we come to you now, please? Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Um, I feel that we should not set aside any more time for developers' presentations um, because I feel that we heard a lot of kind of information, um, but it's very difficult because none of the none of the, the information being provided with is actually ever going to be binding on the developers. Um, and apart, so I found it reasonably helpful have a, hearing about uh, the potential sites for the new towns, but I didn't find it very helpful, uh, a lot of the other information. And I personally think that there's so many things that we could be focusing our time on that I'm not sure that that's a particularly effective use. We've already spent, well, I couldn't go to the second day, but I spent six hours in the first day. Um, and I'm just not sure that it's a 
particularly effective use of our time to sit in a, a meeting online, listening to hours and hours and hours of presentations. And for me personally, it would be rather more helpful to have a synopsis from the developers, uh, you know, a two page of A4 that then I could look at it in my own time and evaluate um, and become informed about. Um, and I personally felt that each presentation should be shorter. Um, and I think that if we'd had shorter presentations, um, then we could have got through more potentially. But um, I, I personally don't, I'm not sure that the, the committee as a whole gained that much from those presentations. Um, and I know that it's all done with the best intentions of being um, open and transparent, but presumably as the report indicates, there'll have to be um, engagement between the planning officers and the site promoters. And um, at some point, and presumably that will all be minuted. Um, so it will be, we will know what discussions are going ahead. So yes, so I would pr propose uh, not setting aside more time for developer presentations, but I really, really want to hear about the new town. And I really want to see that report on feasibility. And I'd really like to have a specific meeting on that um, where we have time to really look at that in an in-depth in way. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bailey. Councillor Ingham, over to you. Thanks, Chair. Um, I think it's absolutely essential that we understand our position as clearly as possible and our opportunities and our problems. And that means listening to people as much as possible. Um, it's no good saying, well, we've got enough on our plate. We can fix something with this, so ignore everything else. That, that's just not right. That's not how we've done things previously, and it's not how we should do things now. So I certainly agree uh, uh, that we should uh, hear uh, uh, the next, uh, the remaining batch of uh, people who were um, told they couldn't present or ones that have come forward uh, uh, as explained chair uh, uh, recently, it's essential we hear them. And uh, I agree also with the second recommendation. And can I just say how brilliant it was to hear Roger Giles speaking again. He was bang on the target. And if, if you don't create a thousand jobs, why the hell would you build a thousand houses? We've got to get this right for 2020-40 and that strategy, Chair, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. And um, Councillor Skinner, over to you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to end up falling into the trap of um, uh, repeating. I, think I actually, all what Councillor Ingham just said is what I agree with. I, I don't agree with Councillor Bailey saying that we can spend our time more effectively. I think it's really important for the transparency and democratic process that we hear these other sites as well come forward. So I'm very much in favour of that. But what you were asking, Chair, I believe, was saying you need to decide whether you're going to go for one, two or three. And you did set that out when you very first started. And Councillor Allen said, I like one and two. Um, Councillor Bailey said, I believe she's going for three. Um, Councillor Ingham didn't actually say. Um, I'm, I'm thinking to myself that, that the words that you used earlier, I listened to and, and, and I took that on board. You wanted very much to get the, the policy in place so you can understand what is then going to fit and where and why. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to long on taking on those words that you said, they resonated with me and landed. And that was a very, very powerful point that you made there. And I think that the, the thing that I'm going to be supporting is point two, which is set aside time for more developer presentations at a late, later stage of the plan production. Not to say that there's any preference in one or the other, but just to say by that time, We'll have a little bit more about our policy and where we're going. And I think that's the option I'm going to go for. But we definitely need to be listening and to those other presentations that come forward for the sake of democracy. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Skinner. Um, totally agree. I think as well with the, the committee already deciding to do another call for sites. Um, it all depends on what that throws up. So if it can be done at a later stage, so it mops up all of the further sites that are that have found or come forward. Uh, I think that's the, the most sensible way forward, personally. Councillor Howe, we go to you, please. Thank you, and I'll start with the easy one. It's option two for me. It's the only one that makes any sense. Moving on from there, though, because I can't just leave it at that. Um, we have heard a really powerful um, presentation by Councillor Giles about Otry St Mary. We had earlier in the agenda, we were talking about Axminster. Um, 
and they're all on the same theme, which is developments happening and the villages and towns are not able to cope. It applies to every single one of our towns. And this is the problem. We're saying we shouldn't do something, but we're going to put it somewhere else. Exactly the same is going to happen. So we have to be realistic somehow and we have to change the way we do things. But fundamentally saying we can't put it there because of something isn't realistic because every other village town, my village in particular, actually has a higher percentage growth than Ottery St. Mary um, and is expected to take an even higher growth again this time round, according to the local plan. Um, so we've got to be really careful. None of our villages and towns are actually suited to the growth, but we've got to get round it and we've got to understand how we allow that growth to happen in whatever way it does in the future. So there's just a quick pointer to everybody that, you know, it's a lot of unsatisfactory, but unfortunately, sometimes we've got to shape things to make it fit better. Um, I hope that makes some sense. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Howe. Um, so with no further speakers, I'll happily do it from the chair that uh, we propose um, option two and recommend um, one and two in the recommendations as per the report. The only thing that I would like to further add is that we don't accept any sites uh, that aren't major. I don't think that we need to be spending any time on houses. We, we had some presentations where it was one house coming forward. I don't think that that's very strategic. No. So only major applications get um, put forward. But and what scale is that, Chair? What scale is major? 10, 10 plus. Oh, OK. Great. But good. Any major application. Um, I'm happy to second that if you want a seconder. Quite happy. Thanks very much, Councillor Skinner. So, Mrs Shaw, can you take us, uh, can you sum up and um, take us to a vote, please? Yes, Chair. Thank you. Members, you have the recommendations that members, having considered the report, recommend to senior officers they wish to um, promote option two in response to the remaining request for presentations to Strategic Planning Committee um, and specifically where whether more time be set aside to hear presentations from developers and site promoters, if so, when and how the meeting should be arranged, and that members recommend to senior officers that officers are able to meet with developers and site promoters where this is necessary to gain further information and evidence on a site to inform assessment work provided. Such meetings are minuted. Members, please press your green tick if you are in support of the recommendation, press your red cross if you're against the recommendation, or raise your electronic hand to indicate you're abstaining from the vote. Thank you. I'm just waiting for the votes to come in. So currently we have eight votes in support, nine votes in support, and one abstention and no votes against. Thanks very much for that, Wendy and uh, Mrs Shaw. Um, we move then to the local plan, revised plan making timetable. And again, over to you, Ed. Uh, thank you, Chair. So this report um, is sort of an interim timetable report. We need to do um, an updated, um, uh, well, full, full schedule um, for the local plan in the form of a local development scheme that would go through and, and be adopted by council. But this is to flag up where we sit in terms of the timetable and the work program that Strategic Planning Committee agreed last year, uh, which was worked through and um, took us to uh, the working draft of the local plan being presented to members at, at the December meeting. Um, in hindsight, that uh, work programme didn't leave a great deal of time to members to actually consider the, the working draft. Um, it was envisaged that we would be spending the first quarter of this year uh, refining the working draft and developing the evidence base into a draft for consultation. Um, when obviously, obviously members are, are, are debating the, the working draft local plan, which is clearly productive in terms of informing officers work and clearly necessary. Um, I think in hindsight, we should have worked more time into that timetable for members deliberation of that plan, but we didn't. Um, and, and so that is impacting on the timetable. Another aspect that's impacting on the timetable is, is resources. As said in the report, there were two additional posts that were created in the planning policy team to help to resource production of the local plan. We have struggled with recruiting those posts. 
Um, we did manage to fill one of them. The second one, um, not so successful. Uh, and then uh, one of the established members of staff left us at the end of uh, last year as well. Uh, I do have some good news in the sense that following some further uh, recruitment and interviews last week, we have managed to now appoint to one of those posts uh, with a member of staff due to start in April. So that will obviously help the situation, but um, one of those posts remains vacant and we will have to pursue other routes uh, for, for recruitment to that. Um, so the, the upshot of all of this and, and just the, uh, the other factor is the sheer volume of work that still needs to be done in, in terms of progressing the local plan and, and some additional work that's come out from, from members discussion so far is that the timetable is creaking somewhat. Um, we had uh, previously envisaged consulting on a, a draft of the local plan early summer this year. We now think that that's unachievable. Uh, fundamentally and needs to be deferred until the autumn. On the positive side, uh, I think that gives further time for members deliberation for um, further work to, to take place to establish uh, a, a evidence based undertake further assessment work uh, and, and develop a robust draft plan for consultation. Um, probably um, I would now envisage uh, sometime late September, early October uh, for starting a, a sort of six to eight week consultation. Um, so that's really just a, a heads up on where we are. Uh, the report goes on to talk about the additional work that needs to be carried out in a bit more detail. Um, but fundamentally, that's the, that's the issue. Um, and just asking members to, uh, to, to note that that is the situation in, in the recommendation. And we'll obviously develop a new local development scheme to bring forward that gives a more detailed breakdown of the timetable. Um, and envisage bringing that to the committee in spring uh, and then that would obviously have to go through to, to council to be adopted. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Ed. Um, council, we, we have to note, oh, sorry, Councillor Howe, I missed your hand there, apologies. I, th I think, Chair, it was just about what you were going to say is we're just here to note and happy to note and move on, shall we say. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Howe. Um, Councillor Bailey, you wish to come in? I do, thank you. Um, and I'm, I don't want just to note it and um, move on, please. Um, I just want to um, raise the issue about the call for sites. So uh, I'm trying to identify the paragraph. I have read the report, but somewhere it's um, kind of talks about the possibility of a call for sites. Now, this committee resolved at the, its last meeting to carry out a call for sites in early 2022. So I would like to, to have a bit more information about when that's going to be carried out, because I feel that it's essential that we do that. And um, you'll recall that um, I was concerned about um, having a more focused and targeted call for sites. And I think that is absolutely essential when we do this additional call for sites. Um, obviously, um, we have to... Um, uh, you know, we're not going out to consultation until... Um, the autumn so um, uh, can we can we please do the call for sites now um, so that then we're not going to be delaying things any further and my real concern is that if a lot of the sites as I understand it or some of the sites are, are colour coded green have actually been turned down at appeal before so my real concern is that if we don't if we don't crack on and do this additional call for sites we're going to get right down the line and then there'll be an issue with those those um, green coloured uh, sites. Um, so uh, where I'd just like to ask Mr. Freeman, please, uh, when we're going to be doing that call for sites. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Bailey. Ed, I'll come to you, but I, I thought that uh, we would be doing the call for sites in with the consultation, the proposed consultation. So would it come out at the same time as we consult on the draft local plan? Um, thank you, Chair. So yes, that was the uh, original proposal. Um, uh, sorry, <laughs> what as officers we had suggested we could do in the working draft of the local plan was to run a, a call for sites alongside consultation on the draft plan when that was envisaged to be in the early summer. Uh, I, I think what Councillor Bailey is referring to in terms of this report is paragraph 2.4, I think refers to the further call for sites. Um, and um, raises the question as to, to when we want to do that. Um, so uh, it would be interesting to hear committee's views on whether you, you're happy to wait and do that alongside consultation on the draft plan uh, now in, in the autumn, 
or, or whether you wish to run that separately before then. Um, bearing in mind that that in itself could impact on on, on timetables. Um, but there's an element of timing here as well in terms of how this fits with the discussions at the previous meeting because these reports were largely written before the previous meeting had taken place because of the timetables we worked to for committees so apologies if they don't quite align with um what happened at, at, at the previous meeting um I, I suspect the way through this may be for us to bring a further report to members in in regard to the call for sites outlining the options for undertaking this call for sites and the timetables and, and the scope of that um whether we can get that to your march meeting might be a struggle though um but um we can try but yes there are some questions hanging i suppose in terms of of that so it would be interesting to hear members views on that or whether members are happy to, to um, keep to the original uh, suggestion of, of doing that alongside consultation on the draft plan. Thank you, you Can I just come back in on that, please? Yes, because um, we've resolved, we resolved in our last meeting option G, and that was to do a call for sites in early 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bailey. Um, just coming back on, on your comment as well, Ed, I'd be interested to see what the, the resource implications are. And whether we do actually have the capacity to, to move what you've just mentioned, obviously we're one uh, one FTE down from what we would normally be, and we we are still a month away from the second FTE um, being filled. So, just comments on, on um, resources would be helpful. Councillor Faithful, we come to you, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, just coming back to um, well, partly this call for sites and the comment by the chair uh, about minimum size. Am I right to think that for this call for sites, they don't have to be all in the same plot of land because some of the developments brought forward are in more than one site. They're, they're, they're not necessarily on the same plot of land as a couple of pl plots of land put together. So if we were to have, say, six houses on one place and nine on another, and they would join together, then you'd have your 15, which surely should that be able to qualify as counting as part of the call for sites. Thank you, Chair. So for, for the call to sites, there can be any size whatsoever. It, it, all I was saying was for the developer and the developer in, well, the presentations that come forward, we only want to see uh, major sites coming forward in that. We wouldn't want to see the smaller sites. Whether you have um, six houses on, in one and five in the other, I think they'll have different constraints and they'll have different, um, well, they'll have different scores from the actual scoring that comes forward. So you wouldn't be able to lump them necessarily together. They would be slightly different, Councillor. Councillor Allen, we'll come to you now, please. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, planning forward, we're looking at um, an, a process which shouldn't simply be mechanical. And uh, uh, one of the things I'd like to ask is uh, to fill in some of the gaps in councillors' understanding. Uh, for example, the is issue of flooding and surface water and river uh, flooding uh, isn't being updated for the impact of climate change by the um, Environment Agency until about September. And of course, when you look at the Coombe River and the Funnerton area, you've got major, major problems in terms of water and how that will impact on the whole planning process. So I think that it would be advisable for a briefing to come from either the Environment Agency and or planning uh, policy uh, to advise councillors and bring them up to uh, date in terms of what the implications are with that new uh, discussion by the uh, Environment Agency. Secondly, when it comes to the issue of economy, transport, and jobs reasonably close to home and the whole green agenda and convenience of that. 
I don't think we've really tapped into what the strategic policy implications are. There are a few uh, comments about sites of uh, particular um, business premise developments, but the whole issue here is around the third point I'd make, and that is infrastructure needs. We keep on saying that we've got serious infrastructure problems in our development without defining what the restrictions are in any one town. And I think that that would be absolutely advisable, especially in view of the very uh, useful comments that Council, uh, Councillor Giles brought in. We really do need to have a more structured uh, briefing for councillors on these policy strategic issues. And I don't feel that we are actually doing that. And I'm not prepared to allocate sites on the basis of inadequate information. I think that would be absolutely wrong, democratically, environmentally, and pr practically. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Allen. Councillor Skinner, over to you. Just, just a quick clarification, um, Chair, and, and through you, and you may be able to answer this yourself, but I'm um, picking up on Councillor Bailey's point. I, I sort of get where, you see, I get both sides of the coin. I'm sure we do. There's, there's Mr. Freeman who's got this, this real pressure on getting things delivered uh, and, and having the manpower to do that. Um, but um, from Councillor Bailey was suggesting that, that we had already agreed. And you so you remember this, Chair, that we had already agreed to have a timetable when these uh, sites were going to come forward. And she's suggesting it, it's sooner rather than later. And we can all I probably agree with the fact it's sooner rather than later. So I suppose, I suppose really we would all prefer sooner rather than later, but the practicalities of sooner rather than later are what? Because that's really the defining moment. Yeah. Ed? Totally agree, Councillor Skinner. We'll go to Councillor Bailey and then we'll, we'll bring in Ed. Thank you. And I, I do think that with that call for sites, um, it's essential that we involve our parishes and town councils because I don't think that we've done that in our previous call for sites. So I think we're moving forward on the basis of incomplete uh, evidence and research. Um, and I, I note what Ed says about, um, about the pressures on the just department. Um, and I, I do understand that when you you'll have, there'll be a responsibility to evaluate the comments that come back in for call for sites, but I don't see that it's being um, labour intensive to start that process because presumably you communicate through as you did previously through your website, through uh, newspapers, and in this case particularly through um, through the town and parishes that this is the hierarchy of settlements, that, that we're trying to drive sustainable development, we've got our target, please come forward with any sites of which you're aware, um, which you may wish to be progressed. So I don't see that that in itself, and presumably you allow six weeks or eight weeks. So I can't see that, um, that that's particularly labor intensive. And I really am concerned that at the moment, we're working with sites that we could get better sites. And why are we, why are we proceeding? I mean, surely the, the search for sites underpins the whole local plan. So I struggle to see what is more important in any aspect of our local plan than actually getting the building blocks for, for shaping the future of the district. So um, I, would re I really think that we've, we have already agreed it. It refers to early in 2022 20, and possibly um, a further one at the stage where we do a um, go out to public consultation. But I can't see that we can now procrastinate and say, oh, no, we're going, not going to do one after all because it's too labour intensive. So um, for me, that th this is the kind of thing that I see as an absolute priority personally um, for for because particularly because we've under, we're under so much pressure to deliver so many houses and I, I'm not sure and I think Ed would probably agree that we haven't yet got the sites um, to even you know really progress so thank you. Thanks very much Councillor Bailey. Councillor Bailey can I just clarify obviously you say that you you wish to see towns and parishes brought in further can you just expand on that point slightly for the recommendation yeah, sure. you're putting forward? Obviously, no, I think some parishes are usually come forward with the consultations, and that's when they're consulted. 
So how would, sorry, I just need a bit more right. how you frame it. Well, well, I think that probably, you know, East Devon District Council sits above the towns and parishes. So East Devon District Council has done a call for sites, but it hasn't actually gone to the parishes and towns and said, can you, are you aware of any, any plots of land that you feel should be developed? Can you publicise um, the, the call for sites? Because I bet you that there's thousands of people in this district who aren't involved in planning, who may own some land, who are completely oblivious to the fact that there's, there's been a call for sites. So my view is that the parishes and towns should be made, I mean, they've been made aware of various other things, I think, through Angela King during this process and neighbourhood neighborhood, uh, planning groups as well. But I think that we should be reaching out to those towns and parishes to see whether they can identify any land which they wish to see develop or whether they themselves, uh, you know, have a particular aspiration for a certain number of houses in a certain, num- you know, in a certain location. So I think the problem is if we wait and, you know, I understand why everything's been pushed back. And I think that this is the challenge that faces our district when trying to look through as a committee, hundreds and hundreds of pages. So we could have actually done a more streamlined approach, but that's that's by the by. Um, but I think that it's I, I don't think that unless we actually reach out to our towns and parishes who know better than many of us about what's in their local areas, to, to ask their opinion on the sites um, and to ask their opinion if they can put any forward. So if we leave it, then we'll be far down the line. We won't be asking them until September. So that's another more than six months. Whereas actually, if there are good sites out there, we could be grabbing, well, not grabbing them, but you know, putting them in the mix now so that they're there from the start. And I'm worried that if we leave it for a long time, that actually we're just going to be kind of scraping along with what we've got, whereas actually we haven't involved the people that may know best. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Betty. I, I think that, that was very helpful with the differentiation of the two. I'd be quite hesitant for towns and parishes if they were putting forward um, land at other landowners' sites without the landowner knowing, if you, if you get what I mean. Um, we'd get ourselves in a quite precarious position that way. If they can help with the promotion of it, fantastic. Um, so I appreciate the clarification there. Councillor Skinner, we'll go to you, please. No, no that's, she's, she's done it really well. And actually, I, I was like you, I was very nervous when she started, when Councillor Bailey, I thought to say C, she, sorry, Councillor Bailey, Councillor Bailey's on, but no, she's actually clarified it. If it's, it's, if, if it's of the benefit, the interest, the only thing what I was going to come to was saying that there needs to be uh, a level playing field between the sites that have already come and, and, and what is being proposed. But having said that, the way she's laid it out, all she's saying is, helping in the process i don't see there's anything wrong with that i'm quite happy to support that. i think she laid councillor bailey you laid that out extremely well i'll be supporting that thank you thank you councillor skinner councillor Ingham. thank you chair well done chair for um, asking councillor bailey that question and well done councillor bailey for answering it uh chair we're in a very different position now Uh, for this local plan than our last one. The last one, we had um, a prime minister who had said, look, um, for the first time ever, um, parishes, villages, communities can decide where housing goes or certainly play a part in that through neighbourhood plans. Uh, And as you know, Chair, um, a huge number of our parishes have actually delivered those neighbourhood plans. So I think it is a brilliant opportunity for us to get them to engage and not take the vaccine and to help us identify those sites within their parish that in their minds, their community's mind, are either essential or highly desirable. Can I give you an example? Linston did that. Um, uh, last time and those 10 houses the last ones are just being finished off now and so they've actually identified um, 40 houses and 60 were built Um, and I think it would be of great advantage for those especially those parishes or those villages that still haven't completed their neighbourhood plan like Woodbury okay within my patch um to actually help Ed and his team by saying, yeah, yeah, you've identified potentially 200 houses, but please, please bear in mind, but these 20 provide a great dividend for us. But please, please 
make sure they're at the top of the tree, even if our neighbourhood plan hasn't been ratified. Do you see, Chair, it's so useful if we do that. So thank you, Councillor Bailey, for reminding us of those opportunities of engaging. Uh, and Ed, I know it's difficult. You need um, more players to help you prov provide the plan. Perhaps we need a short-term contract, guys, to actually deliver on that engagement and double-checking where the, the, you know, the cross-reference with neighbourhood plans. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Councillor Ian. Um, I think what we, we forget as well, it's not just the capacity in the planning team, it's also capacity in the comms team as well. And that's, a, that's obviously a team that's building up through at the moment uh, and is currently recruiting. Ed, can I come to you at that point, just to cover off all the, the questions asked and statements made, if you have anything further to add? Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, I uh, say, so I think the answer in terms of the call for sites is, is us bringing together a report on the practicalities of, of doing that as soon as possible um, and what we would envisage doing for members to, to, to review. Um, so uh, I would take that away as a task, having heard what, what, what members have had to say, uh, and I would do my best to try and bring a, a report on that issue to uh, the meeting on, I think it's the 8th of March, it's the next meeting, isn't it? Um, in terms of the other issues, I, I, I think generally it's about the build-up of evidence. I think uh, Councillor Allen was saying about flooding maps and infrastructure needs. All of that work is ongoing and we're gathering that evidence together and that will obviously need to feed into the work on the local plan as, as it moves forward and the further assessment of, of sites. And um, we'll obviously bring that information through to members as it, as it becomes available. Um, and that's, that's all part of the ongoing work um, that, that's uh, going into production of, of, of the draft plan for consultation. So that will come forward to members in, in due course. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for that, Ed. So um, if we're looking towards recommendation, um, I'd propose from the Chair that we accept uh, the, the recommendation as listed in the report and then add in a second recommendation that um, a, a subsequent report will be brought back on, on the practicalities of the call for sites. Councillor Bailey, obviously, is a lot of that. I'm putting words in your mouth there. Are you, are you roughly happy with that? Yes, I am. Um, I am roughly happy with that. That's Thank exactly you. how I would describe it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Mrs Shaw, can you take us, uh, can you sum up and take us to a vote, please? Thank you, Chair. Yes, members, two elements to this recommendation that Strategic Planning Committee note the proposed amendments to the local plan making timetable. Consultation proposed to now be in autumn 2022 and that a new development scheme with a detailed plan timetable will be brought to committee in spring 2000. 2022 that's easier and that a further report on the practicalities for a further call for sites be presented members please press your green tick if you're in support of the recommendation press your red cross if you're against the recommendation or raise your electronic hand to indicate you're abstaining from the vote the vote is currently taking place so we have 11, 11 votes in support, no votes against, and no abstentions. Thanks very much. So that's passed. Um, I think at this time we'll take a short comfort break uh, and could I ask members to join us back at 10 past 11. Thank you.
So welcome back everyone, thank you for that. We move to the next agenda item, bear with me, just getting this, which is agenda item 10 and it's First Homes Interim Guidance Note. Um, and again, over to Mr. Freeman for his report. Thank you, Chair. So, <clears throat> excuse me, this um, report covers a, a sort of new form of affordable housing known as first homes that the government has introduced um, and seeks to introduce an interim guidance note to explain to developers and our communities how we envisage operating the provision of first homes uh, within the district, given that this is a, a requirement of, of government policy. So effectively, um, first homes are a specific type of affordable housing that's uh, a discounted market housing product. Um, it uh, secures discounted homes at at least 30% discount on, on market value. They are discounted to that extent in, in perpetuity. So every time that property changes hands, that discount will be applied and maintained. Uh, they're to be offered at a price no higher than £250,000. Uh, they are for first-time buyers with a combined household income of less than £80,000 per year. Uh, and they need to have a mortgage of at least 50% of the value of the property. Um, so it's already quite complicated. <laughs> and that's just um, explaining what first homes are. Uh, and then you'll see from the guidance note. Uh, that is hugely complicated from there. Um, so the report goes into details about how this should be operated, when first homes will be required, uh, when not, there are uh, interim arrangements um, in terms of, of when it's applicable, when it isn't. Um, and as I say, members uh, are asked to consider the guidance note that's been prepared that's appended to the report. Um, also within the reports are a number of approaches to some locally led criteria that can be applied. Uh, these relate to options around the, um, the mix of, of remaining affordable housing uh, that's secured once we've secured the first homes requirement. There are options around the mix of 10 years of affordable housing that we secure for the remaining affordable housing proportion. Uh, there are options around the percentage discount that's applied in the district, um, the price cap, income cap, local connections, key worker eligibility criteria, etc. And those uh, are recommendations within the body of the covering report with each of the options set out. And then you'll see there's a, um, a, a recommendation uh, in bold uh, within the report just to highlight those key issues for members to focus on within the debate. Um, and then there's the guidance note itself, which has been prepared on the basis of the preferred options that officers have, have put forward within the body of the report. Uh, but obviously, members to bear in mind that um, should you wish to uh, pursue an option that uh, isn't currently recommended by officers, we will obviously need delegated powers to amend the guidance note accordingly uh, to ensure that it's accurate and up to date. I won't go into the huge amount of detail that's in here. Happy to answer questions as, as we go through this, um, but there's, there's a lot of issues uh, coming from this uh, and a lot of detail in here. Uh, but members are, are ultimately asked in the recommendations to, um, to recommend approval of the draft interim guidance note. Uh, and as I say, uh, would need to include any amendments that come out of members' discussion. Um, agreement to delegate authority to myself in consultation with the chair to make any minor changes to finalise the document uh, and recommend agreements to delegate authority to myself to authorise the use of the interim guidance note uh, for development management purposes. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much. Uh, just, just for clarity, I know that I see there's three options listed within the report. Would you like uh, members to agree those uh, well, give an indication on the preferred option today, or is that for, for later down the line? Um, thank you, Chair. Well, there, there are a number of options uh, within the report um, in relation to those, those various criteria. So you'll see um, there's um, options, as I say, around the calculating the mix of affordable housing, uh, which I think is the first option on the bottom of page 86, but there are further options further in uh, around the uh, level of percentage discount, the price cap. I think the key thing from my point of view is uh, whether there are any of those that members are not happy with the recommendation 
uh, that officers are putting forward and that is embedded within the guidance notes so that um, if there's a, a contrary view from, from members, we understand that as officers and can amend the guidance notes accordingly to reflect that. Thank you very much. Okay, so we will start with Councillor Rylance, please. Thank you, Chair. Sorry I had to leave. My internet connection didn't hold up. Um, I think hopefully we're back on a uh, more solid runner. Um, so I don't know if this is the right item on the agenda to raise this under, but I was reading through the DELC notes from the last DELC meeting, and there seemed to be mentioned quite a lot of um, developers challenging uh, rural exception sites. Um, on the grounds that they, they should be allowed to build there. If they're buildable, then they should be allowed to build there and it shouldn't be uh, affordable housing. Is this something that you've heard coming through, you know, echoes of? Uh, this is particularly in AONBs, I understand. Um, and is it something that we can head off at the pass in our new local plan um, by making our, our policies a lot more, well, very robust and unchallengeable? Um, and, you know, just wanted to know whether you'd heard of any echoes of this and whether it's something we should be aware of um, for our new local plan. I'll bring you in there just just from my point of view, though, that it's a they're, they're outside of what policy is usually. And that's why it's set at 66 uh, percent on these rural exception sites. Um, Ed, we'll, we'll go to you, though, on that. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. I, I'm not aware of that as, as an issue, as I say. I mean, I think our policy on rural exception sites is very robust and we haven't had those issues to date. Um, it may be that in circumstances where an authority hasn't got a five-year housing land supply, there's a greater risk of that happening. Um, so that's something to be mindful of, given the housing monitoring report and, and the situation there. Um, but um, I'm happy to look into that and, and, and just see if there is anything we, we need to do in terms of the new local plan to, to head that off. But um, our intention would always be to write those policies to be very robust um, and ensure that they, they're not a, a green light to things that the policy is not designed to allow, shall we say. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much. Councillor Allen. More of a question than anything else. Could we look at 1.3? where it says a policy compliant application will provide at least 25% of affordable units as first homes delivered by the developer through section 106 obligations. Uh, how do we know that there will be sufficient first home applicants to soak up 25%? And secondly, what are the implications for viability on um, section 106 uh, funds for other uh, uses. It looks a dangerous restriction. I'm not sure whether we can do anything about it, but I would like uh, Mr. Freeman to explain what the implications might be. Thank you. Thanks very much. We'll go to Councillor Ingham next and then I'll bring Ed back in. So Councillor Ingham, please. Thanks Chair. It's interesting, isn't it, on what our possibilities are moving forwards with this local plan, because if we box clever, um, rapid housing growth is acceptable as long as there's rapid growth in wealth. And how do you make sure that happens? That's by providing first homes and affordable homes immediately adjacent to where you have a, an expanding or a growing economy. And we have those sites in East Devon, and that I think is imperative where we should provide those first homes and, and consciously make sure we can do that. Because by encouraging that, we can, we can redress the demographic, uh, you know, I think it is it 30% of re residents in um, East Devon are uh, over the age of 65. That's, that's not a good spot to be, is it, Chair? And, but we do have these opportunities to put that right. So I, I welcome any opportunity that we can take strategically to put those first homes and affordable homes in exactly the right place as we've, dis, uh, you know, uh, as we've discussed with the opportunity for a new village come town where we can strategically make sure that happens. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Ingham. Um, Ed, can we come back to you, please? 
Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, I mean, just, just to clarify, the, the 25% uh, of affordable housing to be first homes is, is a government requirement, um, so that there's nothing we can do about that. It, it is, of course, 25% of the total. So if we were unable to achieve a policy compliance scheme because of viability issues and the percentage of affordable housing was reduced, then the number of first homes would proportionately reduce because it's 25% of the affordable homes. Uh, that, that, that has to come forward as first homes. Um, so I don't think there's anything we, we can do. We are stuck with this, although I would, would fully accept, and it's probably hinted at in, in the report, that we would question whether or not this is meeting the needs of those in greatest need, shall we say, of affordable housing in East Devon. Um, it's probably a, a product that will help those that would be able to achieve home ownership to uh, get there sooner, shall we say. Um, which is is obviously good, but it's not meeting the needs of those in, in greatest need, I suspect. Um, but we are stuck with it fundamentally. Uh, um, I don't think there's any real way around it. Um, it's about making it work for us as best we can in terms of these local criteria that, that can be applied, which is what we've we've sought to do. Um, uh, and um, I think the other question was really about the sort of financial benefits, shall we say? I mean, I don't. I think this scheme has been designed by government so that there isn't really a financial benefit to developers. It's it's intended to be neutral. Uh, fundamentally, um, it's just slightly changing. Uh, it's more of a top-down approach in terms of, I suppose, the ten-year mix in terms of affordable housing to what we've had in the past, um, and more about uh, promoting home ownership more than we, we perhaps would have done where our focus might have been more on, on social housing and affordable rent products. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Ed. Sorry, Chair, can I just come back on that? Because I didn't quite understand. Ed said that if the 25% isn't uh, taken up, then they shrink the affordable housing allocation until it is. Is that what you said, because um, that, that's uh, tricky. I, I just need some clarification, Ed. I'm not being difficult. I just don't understand. Ed, please come back. To you, Chair. Yes, apologies. I realise I didn't answer that part of the question. Um, I mean, I think the assumption is that um, the 25% the of uh, the, the first homes will, will be taken up. I think the question is what, what happens if, if there aren't and isn't enough demand for first homes. Um, I think the assumption is that, that there will be. Um, I'm not sure that the guidance actually addresses what happens uh, if there isn't. Um, I'm happy to look into that, um, but I, I suspect that probably won't be the case um, because I suspect this is quite an attractive uh, product for, for, for those uh, struggling to get onto the housing ladder to have something at a discounted rate. Um, but I guess only time will tell in terms of levels of demand for, for first homes as, as a product. Uh, I suspect the first challenge will be getting people to, to, to understand what it is and, and the benefit to them. Um, and uh, I don't think that's been particularly well publicised um, outside of planning circles where we've obviously had to, to write a, a policy document like this and get our heads around it all. So it's going to be interesting to see how that, that plays out. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Ed. Councillor Skinner, over to you. Uh, hi. Um, and, and it's aimed at Ed, really. I mean, it's, it's really quite complex. And <clears throat> I, I, I've just, I've going harking back a little bit to the the phosphate issue when the developers have got to be picking up that they've got to pick up the flooding they've got to pick up parts of the larger parts of infrastructure they've got to pick up they've got to pick up pick up pick up at the end of the day it's only so much money in the pot here and they get it from selling houses um is is a document like this i i really want to be supporting this but is a document like this is there anywhere that you could have seen where this has been done in other places or something similar, Ed, this is what I'm doing. And have you got any, or, or have you got any where you've seen it and you can get comparisons as to the success or not? Or have have you, do you scope this by anybody like, I don't know, the Builders Federation or something like that and say to, to the to developers, you know, going out with a plan of the, trying to deliver affordable housing at these levels, how, how does this fit with with with, with you doing it? Because at the end of the day, this is what's got to come. The developer's got to do it. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get to a place 
how sound is is are these things that we're putting forward in in trying to get developers to actually make them deliverable and make them work because that's fundamentally what it's all about it becomes affordable deliverable and developers um work with a scheme that or, or, or do they add anything in and say what about this way or that way or doesn't it work like that please tell Ed, I'll hand over to you. Um, well, I think the problem is, because this is a new new product, um, everybody, all the other local authorities are in the same position as we are of trying to get our heads around it and and, and write guidance notes and, and respond to it. So I uh, have had an ask around. I think Exeter are in a similar position that they're just adopting a, a, a guidance note on this. Other authorities don't seem to be as far forward as, as we are in terms of preparing a document and are, are still thinking about that. Uh, I hear word that um, Plymouth City Council are, are, are trying to avoid delivering first homes at all, I believe, um, and uh, not seeking to, to do a guidance document or, or promote it at all. But um, it is government policy, so I, uh, I don't know how successful they will be with that. Um, as I say, in a lot of this time, we'll, we'll tell on a lot of these things in terms of how successful this is uh, and, and how well it works and what it actually achieves. Um, so um, it would be interesting to to monitor over time how many first homes are actually delivered in the district, um, you know, demand for them, um, how regularly do they then change hands, because we're then, as the report says, involved every time these properties subsequently change hands. So we will be able to keep records of that and understand that and know how many first homes we have in total in the district. Um, so we'll have to set up some monitoring arrangements to understand that, I think. Um, have got a meeting set up with colleagues in, in housing and, and other services to, to work through those processes, because I think, as the report says, there's potentially quite a lot of work involved in operating this I see that, yeah. moving forwards. And the more first homes we secure in the district, the more work there will be. It's going to snowball, yeah. I suspect, over yeah. time. Uh, the more we've got and I, and I suspect they may change hands quite frequently because by their very nature they're going to be people's first step on the housing ladder and as yeah. they move up they will probably want something that they own outright um, sorry that, that isn't subject to a discount like this uh, and as they move up the housing ladder and, and out of that level of need so um, <laughs> there are a lot of questions that I can't answer at the moment because of we simply, simply don't know at this point. Okay. Um, a, a colleague has helpfully messaged me in terms of uh, Councillor Allen's point um, about what happens if there isn't demand. Um, and I understand that there is a route for if, if the if a first home is not sold within six months, there is a route for uh, the property in question to be delivered as a market property and for the discount to not be applied. But equally, I think we get a sort of first refusal uh, to, to buy up the unit for delivery on, on the first homes basis. Um, so again, another complicated area of this um, that uh, time will tell on. Um, but uh, yeah, it sounds like there is a route for them to, to uh, be taken out of the first homes equation and, and delivered as, as market houses. Chair, could I just come into that? There's something yeah, I would like to ask. Is that, is that possible? Sorry, yeah, I don't mean to jump, jump in because the council Island has also got a question on the seat. But, but the, the reason I was trying to say what I was saying is, is that I don't want to put words in your mouth, Ed, whereby this is a little bit of a suck it and see, but it seems a little bit like that. And, and I suppose as, as it transforms down the road, I just, you see, I, I don't look at developers like some people want to look at them. I look at but as partners, people who are going to develop our housing and are going to do our building and they're going to invest millions of pounds. And, and it's how we work with them. And, and if, if, if there was something like this to deliver, I'm, I'm pretty sure that developers would be in the, in, the, in the role of wanting to deliver something that's going to be really successful. They don't want to deliver something that doesn't isn't successful and all the rest of it. And I just wonder where within this plan process, rather than we've just... Uh, like you're finding out from other authorities what they're doing, but isn't there somewhere in the developers world say, have a look at this, tell me what you think, what do you think that the good or the bad or the or the ugly comes out of this, and do you see this working or not? And they may come back positively, they may come back negatively, and we haven't got to take any notice of what they say at all. But what it does do, Ed, is it means it goes out there and you, you just garner more knowledge and more evidence and to try to tweak it in a way that is really successful. Well, I take pride in the fact that what you're saying to me is some authorities haven't even got this far and we're a little bit leading the way 
Well, when you're leading the way with anything that you do, the more knowledge that you can gain and, and, and muster together to get it into a really good place to make sure it's successful and works, the better. And I'm just wondering whether there is a place for that to happen and how you do it. Well, I don't really know, but um, uh, I'm sure there's, there's ways of doing that because that's, that's how I would work in business. That's how I would be doing it. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Skinner. Mrs Shaw, uh, from a legal point of view, can I bring you in at this point? Yes, Chair. Um, just to reassure members that Homes England have been involved in the uh, setting up of templates and guidance notes, etc. in relation to this. There has been an early phase where other local authorities part participated in such drafting of legal agreements and monitoring. So we're not the very first in the country to participate in first homes, but we are quite early on in our processes for supporting um, when the MPPF drafts up the uh, guidance and the framework for first homes. So that's why you've got an interim guidance note rather than a supplementary planning document or a more formal um, guidance note. Thank you. That assists. Thanks. Thanks Thank that. you very really, much. Really appreciate it. I'll come to Councillor Allen in just two seconds. I think the only question I've got really for Ed is, will we be able to have any cost recovery? Obviously the amount of resources you've said is going to snowball. Is this going to be a case that obviously when you buy a new house, you, you've got to pay a certain amount of fees? Would East Devon be able to enter into a, a fee agreement that when someone buys the house, we will be able to recover our side of the costs? Because um, that's something that I'm, I'm not quite clear on. Or is it just going to be a case that the government's imposing this on us and we've got to suck up another, another basic re resource burden uh, with no way of funding it? Councillor Allen, can I bring you in and then we'll go back to Ed just to answer that. I'll give you some time, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, Ed's asked in this report for some ch uh, choices on options. And I just wanted to bring us to uh, point 3.7 uh, and the balance in affordable housing delivery and its impact on strategy 24 in the local plan and to suggest that we adopt option two which is what Ed's recommended because it seems the only way that uh, shared ownership can be fully uh, enhanced in these uh, discussions. I uh, just wanted to point out that it's not just a case of blanket acceptance there are some things that Ed's asked us to decide on and that's my recommendation and a formal proposal. Thanks very much, Councillor Allen. There are uh, actually further ones as well. I think it's 4.12, I need to find it again, 4.12. And then I think Ed did say as well, under the price cap, there's, there's some options. Uh... Yes, Chair. I just wanted to start that process of decision making so that we could move forward fast. Fantastic. Thank you. Ed, can I come back to you now, please? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, I mean, in going through all of this, we haven't identified anywhere that further resources come into the local authority to uh, help us to administer this. Um, I suppose we hold out in hope that there might be some new burdens funding coming at some point uh, to help with this, but we haven't, we're not aware of any at, at this stage. Um, I mean, just coming back to, to Councillor Skinner's point, I understand that there has been the government engaged with the development industry over the implementation of first homes uh, at a national level. So there has been some involvement with them. Uh, and the other thing I'd say is, as, as um, Mrs. Shaw has said, this is an interim guidance note. So I see it as kind of a fluid document that might need to be updated and amended as we learn from experience and have input from the development industry. So I don't see this as, as fixed and in stone is, is something that we'll need to evolve over time. And obviously we'll be developing this guidance into the new local plan moving forward as, as well. So it, first homes will need to be integrated into that as well. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much. Um, Councillor Allen has uh, made a proposal. Does anyone wish to second that? No, I don't see a seconder. So we'll move on to the recommendations as listed in the report. 
Um, we've got rec the three recommendations listed in front of us. Um, I'll propose those from the chair so we don't require a second go. And if there's no one else wishing to speak, Mrs Shaw, can you sum up for us, please? Yes, Chair, thank you. Right, there's three elements to the recommendation. Recommend approval of the draft interim guidance note, East Devon First Homes. Recommend agreement to delegate authority to the service lead planning strategy and development management in consultation with the portfolio holder for strategic planning to make any minor changes to finalise the interim guidance note and to publish that document on the council's website. Thirdly, recommend agreement to delegate authority to the service lead planning strategy and development management to authorise the use of the inter interim guidance note East Devon First Homes for development management purposes from the date of publication of the note. Members, if you're in support of the recommendation, please press your green tick. If you're against the recommendation, press your red cross, or if you're abstaining, please raise your electronic hand. Vote is currently taking place. So at present we have 11 votes in support, no votes against and no abstentions. Thanks very much for that Wendy and Mr Shaw. We'll, um, that, that's obviously carried. We move on to agenda item 11 which is the Torbay local plan housing update, growth options, consultation um, and it's over to Ed Freeman again please. Uh, thank you, Chair. So uh, this report is to draw members' attention to a consultation that Torbay Council are currently undertaking in terms of updating of their housing supply policies within their adopted local plan. So they have a local plan that runs from 2012 to 2030, um, and they have determined that the housing policies within that need to be updated. Uh, unlike us, they're, they're not doing a full new local plan. They are simply updating a number of specific policies in terms of housing delivery. Um, this is primarily because they are struggling to deliver housing sites. Um, they are do not have a five-year housing land supply and are struggling to meet the housing delivery test. Um, so the consultation identifies a number of uh, options. Uh, those are listed, uh, I won't read them out, listed in paragraph 1.2 and range from uh, talking about the levels of housing coming forward on greenfield sites uh, within the area through to um, options around uh, meeting their full full housing needs and you'll see only one of those options actually meets their full housing need um, which is of concern to us in particular because uh, while they are not an adjoining authority to East Devon they did write to us as members will recall in terms of our issues and options consultation and highlight that they were unlikely to meet their housing need and likely to be looking to the authorities within the Exeter housing market area to meet some of their need uh, and we are one of those authorities within the Exeter housing market area. Um, and hence uh, us responding to this consultation and seeking members views on, on that response. Um, so you'll see we have a number of concerns with, with their approach, um, in particular taking such a narrow approach to uh, addressing this issue. Um, and as I say, the fact that only one of those options actually achieves a growth rate that would meet their government housing figure of 586 dwellings per year. Um, it seems to us that some of these options really aren't viable options um, and um, that they're potentially raising expectations among their community that, that it's possible to, um, to move to a position where they're not developing any ground for greenfield sites and only delivering you know, 190 to 250 dwellings a year under option one, when clearly uh, with, with a, uh, an assessment of housing need of, of over 500, that's not a, a, an achievable option, it seems to us uh, as officers. So um, the report goes on to, to recommend a proposed response to Torbay Council, uh, which responds to the issues they're highlighting. And that there's no doubt that they have significant constraints to growth in terms of uh, landscape, uh, environmental designations and biodiversity issues. Uh, but of course, so do we <laughs> in, in East Devon as well. Um, and uh, I think it's important that we make that point to them uh, and also make points to them about uh, their approach as, as well. Uh, so there are specific points listed uh, A to F on page 139 within the report um, that seek to comment on, on their, their consultation from, from an East Devon perspective. 
uh, highlighting issues um, around their constraints, uh, our constraints and how potentially meeting the needs of people from Torbay and East Devon is not a very sustainable approach if, if their life and work is, is based in Torbay fundamentally um, as, as one of the key key principles. So um, the report is, is asking members to, to consider the consultation and officers suggested approach uh, to respond into that and recommends that the committee endorse the proposed response as detailed in the report and delegate it authority to myself to submit those comments accordingly. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Ed. I, I think reading the report, you, you'd love to have their, their, their problems, as it seems at the moment. Um, we've got a lot more housing needs to deliver and we've got a lot more constraints. So, um, personally, I, I think the, proposes, uh, the proposals are yeah, fantastic, great. Um, Councillor Allen, we'll, we'll move to you, please. Yeah, I simply wanted to move acceptance of an excellent response and very diplomatic response from Ed Freeman. Uh, I would have said just get stuffed, but um, it's probably more diplomatic the way that uh, Ed put it. Thank you. Thanks very much. I think Ed's uh, done a great job under the duty to cooperate. Councillor Allen, that's a proposal there. May I have a seconder, please? Councillor Arnold. Um, Councillor Rylance, we'll move to you now, please. Thank you. I just, I, I just wanted to make the comment that I think, uh, you know, we're in the middle of a climate crisis, and I think it's absolutely extraordinary that Torbay would attempt to outsource some of its house, some of its own housing, to uh, an area which is the other side of a major town. Um, and it is almost certainly going to require a lot of trips in cars. You know, we also are developing green fields. And I, you know, I, I totally approve of the, the response you've given them because, you know, if they haven't explored all the alternatives in their own area, why are they trying to outsource it to something somewhere 30 miles away? It, it just doesn't make any sense. And have they explored going upwards rather than, you know, trying to um, so see, see, seek out really difficult to develop sites? You know, they, maybe they need more flats in Torbay. I don't know. Um, but it just doesn't seem like it's a very sustainable option, really, to try and deliver them here. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Rylance. Councillor Arnott, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, and as, as I said, very happy to second uh, Councillor Allen's, the formal part of Councillor Allen's so <laughs> response there. Um, I, I, sh I should, I suppose... We have to be very cautious about this, about what we say, because there is a there's a level of diplomatic delicacy that's only come up in the last two or three weeks, which understandably isn't reflected in this report. And that is because of the government's levelling up white paper, there is an idea abroad that uh, in some kind of as yet to be defined unitary structure, both Plymouth and Torbay may join with Devon County Council and all of the Devon districts to submit some levelling up bid. Now, um, that is something that has got a long way to go, a long way, much discussion. Um, I suppose I can say here that certainly the leader of Exeter City is highly sceptical about that because he believes that would trigger a governance review, which may well imperil the future of district councils. And personally, I haven't had a chance to discuss this with too many colleagues yet, I'd agree with that. Now, one of the things that a combined authority bid to levelling up would do is it would take housing policy away from us and take it upstairs into this new, into this new whatever it is, um, housing delivery I should say not housing policy it's a real grey area it's quite the mess I've sat in on quite a few meetings including one earlier today to listen about that I'm sure the fact that Torbay are asking now is a coincidence but I would say that um, anything other than Ed's drafted response is really very dangerous because this stuff is live um, and we certainly wouldn't want to go into a more formal arrangement with a wider Devon that made it even more likely that we would have to, as the saying goes, consume somebody else's smoke, in this case, particularly Torbay. And I, I agree thoroughly with Councillor Rylance. I don't know quite where in our district is, a, is commutable for Torbay. 
um, you know, it's it's a good old journey, isn't it? So, um, yeah, that's that's just sort of for information, really, Chair. But I think just to reinforce, I think, the wisdom of the approach Mr Freeman's taking. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Arnott. And if it comes to it, I look forward to the uh, the, the election of between yourself, Councillor Bialik and Councillor Brown uh, for Lord Mayor of, of Devon. Um, Councillor Bailey, we move to you, please. Thank you very much. Um, I don't disagree with um, Ed's response, but I do think it's interesting, particularly um, point B, um, that the advice that we're giving to Torbay Council, I think we should be following ourselves. So that says, in exploring potential for housing development, Torbay Council should be more active in identifying suitable land for development and contact landowners to encourage them to bring forward suitable sites for development and, if necessary, explore options to seek to acquire land for development themselves in order to provide for housing needs. So I think we should be doing that rather than just taking the easy option, which is, I'm afraid, what we're doing largely, and building on green fields. So um, I agree with the advice he's given, but I hope that we can take it ourselves as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Bailey. Um, Ed, do you have any comments to, to make on any of the um, contributors? Um, th thank you, Chair. I mean, j just to say, in terms of Councillor Rollins' comments, I understand they are looking at um, building upwards within the urban areas and delivering more flats. I, I think they have a conflict slightly with what the market is is wanting in Torbay and that um, I, I believe the demand for, for flats is, is more limited. Um, and, and that's uh, causing them some issues there. As I say, I mean, the focus is about evidence really and, and saying to them that they just haven't demonstrated through evidence um, that, um, that they can't meet their need fundamentally. Uh, and, and that's the, the diplomatic approach to push back at, at the moment. And, and um, we may need to work with them to develop some, some joint evidence so that we can do like for like assessments of, of their work with our own. Um, and yes, I mean, uh, of course, I think we should should take our own advice uh, if, if we are struggling to meet our housing needs within the district on sites that are coming forward uh, and explore all options to do that. I certainly wouldn't want to see ourselves getting into the position of Torbay of, of, of seeking through the duty to cooperate to have any of our housing need met outside of the district um, if, if we can possibly avoid it. So um, we need to explore all options as we move forward. Thanks very much. So, Mrs. Shaw, I think with no further speakers, can you take us to a vote, please? Yes. Members, the recommendation is that Strategic Planning Committee recommends endorsement of the proposed response to this report and delegate authority to the service lead, Planning Strategy and Development Management, to submit comments accordingly. Please press your green tick if you're in support of the recommendation, press your red cross if you are against the recommendation, or raise your electronic hand to indicate you're abstaining from the vote. 11 votes in, 12 votes in support, no votes against, no abstentions. Thanks very much, that's passed. Moving to agenda item 12, self-build monitoring report, and over to you, Mr. Freeman. Uh, thank you, Chair. So um, members will recall that um, we try and bring you an annual uh, report on, on self-build, and this is the, the latest report covering the period uh, from the end of October 2020 to the end of October last year. Um, it shows um, maintaining, continuing to grow uh, demand for, for self-build plots. Uh, so 44 individuals uh, were added to the self-build register during the monitoring period. Uh, with uh, 26 on, on part one of the register, uh, which means we'll need to, to uh, permission service plots to meet that demand uh, indicated on part one between uh, October 21 and October 24. Uh, we continue to supply a good number of sites that are suitable for, for self-build and therefore for meet that requirement. Um, and we are now checking that, as it says in the report, against SID exemption on the basis of, of checking that they are coming forward for, for self-build. So there's that. Now that uh, tallying exercise between the plots that are granted against the SIL exemptions for, for self-build to ensure that self-builds are coming forward. Beyond that, um, I mean, those, those are obviously the, the sort of statutory requirements about recording need and, and meeting that need. Uh, the, aside from that, there's a huge amount of information in here about the nature of, of the demand for self-build plots in, in the area. 
um, and uh, the nature of that in, in the appendix, which um, I won't go through in, in, in detail, um, but there's quite a lot of interesting information about um, the budgets that most self-builders have, which suggests that um, they're, they're not necessarily, at, at the moment, self-builders um, majority are, are not sort of um, self-builders looking to deliver their first home or, or, or as an alternative to um, uh, affordable housing products delivered through registered providers. It's, it's generally more people um, looking for larger properties on larger plots as, as things stand, uh, which I, I found quite interesting in terms of the profile of the average East Devon self-builder. Uh, and that perhaps that's something that will change in, in the future as more um, expressly self build plots come forward uh, through the policy requirements in the Cranbrook DPD. And as we develop self build policies through the new local plan to perhaps broaden out the, the, the range of self builders coming forward in the district and make it a more, more common uh, occurrence for, for, for self build to take place in the district. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much. Uh, all the recommendations are just to note. Uh, Councillor Skinner, we go to you first, please. Thank you. And this is a really, really important policy, I believe. Um, and this is uh, when we talk about local uh, developers. And I'm talking about the little one-man bands, the one and two, two-man people who who get very much involved. There's been this has been the lifeline of what has been of, of their particular business uh, up up and down the district, all over the country, really. But in this particular scenario, up and down the district. Um, well, I think the question I'd like to ask, uh, Ed, is from a government perspective, sorry, from an East Devon District Council policy perspective here, I mean, there's quite a difference in there between, say, somebody down in my village in Tallaght and gets a bit of planning permission to build a house and they build a house and it's you know the one off sort of that sort of windfall site. I take it that falls into this uh, under this category through the process. But. Furthermore than that, you were talking about that we we as an authority having to in government given us guidance to to promote sites within. I can only assume you mean sometimes outside of the windfall, outside of the you know farmer building one for his son or daughter, or whatever it may be, or, or whatever that may be. I get those sorts of sites, but within a, a development scheme, how, how does that? Because I would imagine I can remember it being done in Exmouth and over Dean on Way, which was several. I think it was about. 20, 25 houses we had there going by going back sorry going back several years and that was self built where one came in build and then one had one trade and one had another and all that and it was really quite successful to a point it did and it didn't because the first one's got theirs and then the others got tired of doing that especially the ones that already got theirs finished um, but how does that how does this policy fit within a development scheme I, I'm really interested to know how that's that's going to work. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Skinner. We'll, we'll take a few more contributions and then go to Ed again. So, Councillor Rylance, we'll move to you now, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, my question, I, I seem to remember we had uh, some, somewhere in the local plan that we're, we're, we're discussing, in the draft local plan, there's actually a, um, a floor area space limit on, on, on the self-build policy, uh, which presumably is designed to, to improve access uh, by people who might be building as, as a way of delivering their own affordable home. Um, and obviously we don't want to stop people who want to build million pound houses, but it would be right and very proper if they, would all, they were contributing to the local budget. You know, it shouldn't be, it, it, you shouldn't be able to build a million pound dream home and then not pay any money at all into, into the, the, the local budget for um, delivering extra services. So is there any way we can draw off the policy that obviously permits people if they have a plot of land and want to deliver, you know, their dream home, and maybe live in it or maybe sell it on after a couple of years, um, that they should contribute to the local to the local authority budget, but without affecting people who want to deliver their own, maybe first, but you know, their own affordable home um, in within the budget that they have. Um, and it would be nice if we could have, you know, end up with a with, with a policy that um, that enables both. Because to be honest, if you can afford a million quid house then you can also afford to pay into the local authority. But it might be the it might be a deal breaker for somebody working on a much smaller budget who's trying to deliver their own first family home um, for themselves. So how can we make it work at every level for people, people within their own budgets? And also, how can we ensure that um, houses that are delivered, possibly larger ones, but um, possibly not, who knows, houses that are delivered are not 
built, maybe lived in for the exactly the required amount of time and then sold on um, by somebody who does this for a living. Is that possible? Thank you, Councillor Rylance. So I'll, I'll take the next two speakers and then we'll go to Ed to, to sum up. So, Councillor Arnold, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, I agree with everything that's been said by all previous speakers. And I was just looking at uh, a, a Collinson has a long tradition uh, going back right into the 60s and 70s of substantial self built entire roads, in fact, on the, on, on the Western Ridge. And Many of the people who built them are now a great age and still living in those same houses. Um, in uh, the most recent housing needs survey I can find for Collins, those people in housing need uh, identify six uh, alternatives that, they, that they'd like to consider um, to get them into houses. So, for example, nine would like to rent to buy. Eight would like discount market homes. Four would like a normal starter home. 18, affordable rented. Eight, shared ownership, shared equity. And four, self-built. And that's absolutely crucial. Now, I can probably guess who those people are. And as, as you'll know, um, uh, 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 Chair, you know, from your own knowledge and experience of our area and the skills that are present in these communities. Um, it's something we really need to look to try and give people chances to do. I completely take Councillor Rylance's point that there's the sort of grand design self-builder, isn't there? He's making something, you know, that's going to be worth a million quid. I tend to think that our focus needs to be, and we, we must consider that, and, you know, is there, a, is there a, a game that can be taxed and so forth or CI held or whatever for our general benefit? But I think we've got to somehow um, encourage and provide uh, opportunities for people who are at, so to speak, the other end of the market who just want to do it. Um, so anything we can do, I'd like to see happen. The other thing that always worries me about this is this issue of local connection. And you get some very straight, I had to deal with one quite recently about somebody who wanted to do something to a former local authority home. And in fact, it was a great idea. It would have saved the project, but they'd been, uh, they'd been brought up um, just over the other side of the border, just south of Chard which for us is local. So that's something I think we, we could benefit from giving a little bit of thought uh, because at the moment we have lots of criteria which are do, to do with very personal connection to a settlement. And I understand that, but I do think we could consider distance as well and even out of, out of district if it's, if it's geographically quite proximate. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, that Councillor Arnold. Just to say, obviously, the Cranbrook DPD, I think we Ed can correct me if I'm wrong, it's 4%, I believe, we, we've put forward in that for, for self-builds to come forward. I, I'd like to see that as a, a continued policy throughout um, the development that comes through um, East Devon, so that we've actually got service plots um, throughout the district. It's not just um, Cranbrook-focused. We can actually take that through our, our new local plan. It's, it's not a massive number, but it will make huge inroads in um, the actual demand across the district. Councillor Howe, we'll move to you, please. Thank you. Um, and I suppose this is my biggest regret for my time in planning, as chair of planning and everything else, of not getting this further along. I've met an awful lot of people who want to be self-builders, and they come from all mixes of life. And that's the fundamental issue. I, I, I can remember talking to a couple... Um, one was a nurse and one was a teacher, um, quite well off, but living in rented accommodation. They had four kids. They wanted to build their forever home. Believe me, their ambition wasn't a small home. I get that. But neither was it grand designs. It was a home fit for their life for the next 40, 50 years. And they were relatively well off and could do it, but we couldn't find the level. They couldn't get the land they wanted in the area they wanted to do it. And this is the fundamental problem we have. So I have some issue, although I sympathize with what Councillor Rylance has said, because it's hard to penalize one while giving to others, if you get my meaning, and it's a fine line to draw 
but I understand the line she wants to try and make out. But it is almost impossible to do, depending on each individual person's circumstances. Um, I mean, I'm so supportive of this. We need to do it. We need to get on with it. We need some service plots urgently, which I hope Cranbrook will deliver, because it's such an exciting thing. I, I went up to Kent and saw a scheme up in Kent. And, and it's just amazing. You go onto the service plot site and it was only half built at the time. And each house is unique. It's totally different. They were given, they were given, they bought a plot that was fully serviced. So it had power, water, gas, and planning permission granted to them. The only thing they had to do was build their house within the constraints of the height and the scale demanded. They designed the house as they wanted and it was their carte blanche. And there were some beautiful houses there, some really unique, exciting, what a character. And the residents I met there, they loved it, you know, because they grew up with their neighbours building as well. We so have to get on with this. We so have to really push this and get people growing a real sense of community and looking after their own thing in their own way. And I will support anything we can do to further those ends. And I hope Cranbrook will develop that as well for many leads. And I see Councillor Blakey will speak on that for various individual reasons, I'm sure. So good luck and let's get on with it. Councillor Blakey, I think you've been nicely teed up there. But... <laughs> yes, it's, uh, the, thank you, Joe. It's, um... Not much to add to that. Thank you, Councillor How You've stolen my thunder again. Um, yes, absolutely. The, uh, the, the, the requirement of uh, 4% of service plots for um, self-building in Cranbrook has got to be a very positive mood, uh, move. I, I think if you have a look at the stats that are contained within the report, it's pretty obvious um, that the uh, self-builder in East Devon is exactly who you imagine it is. Um, somebody who's already probably fairly well healed and uh, the, the, the majority of these um, buildings are being built um, as later life homes on a fairly large scale. Um, what I would like to see is a requirement on developers all over the district to provide service plots for, um, for self booting for, and particularly for um, for local younger people who perhaps otherwise aren't going to have the opportunity to uh, to get themselves onto the housing ladder to come in and and build for themselves, as as Councillor Howe said, you can see some very beautiful examples of um, of self builds around the country, and those of us who are avid watchers of uh, of grand designs have seen these things in in the past. Uh, there are, there are a lot of benefits. Number one is obviously financial from the point of view of the people who are doing the work, and particularly if they do genuinely self-build, which is they do a lot of the work themselves rather than simply handing over a contract to a builder. Um, and the other thing is, which I, I think um, we will need most certainly as um, large-scale development takes place in East Devon continues to take place, is to introduce a bit more diversity into the, um, the building designs. I, I, I think that, that I've said it before, um, we are in grave danger of producing very bland, um, monolithic uh, housing estates, or dare I say, new towns, um, that really could do with um, the, the landscape being broken up with a bit of originality. So I think wherever development is to take place on, on what we would call a, a major development, um, 10 plus, um, can we encourage and if, if necessary enforce um, the provision of a plot or two for self-builders um, and try and do it in, in a way that uh, enables people who are going to get involved and do the work themselves and produce housing for themselves and their families that they couldn't otherwise afford, um, get it done that way. So thank you. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Blakey. Ed, can I, can I bring you back in now as well? I just need to ask a question. Obviously, we've set aside an actual budget to, for the District Council to look into acquiring self lived plots. Is this something that we need to revisit? Um, now that obviously it's been, I think it was 2019, you originally brought the report to us. We haven't been able to, to find any service plots, well, any plots to then for us to service uh, and hand over. Is it 
time for us to to revisit that at a certain point? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I think we probably do need to review um, our sort of approach to self and custom build and how proactive we are um, and whether we could be doing more to help to promote that. And yes, there have been issues in terms of identifying suitable sites to, to, to bring forward and, and purchase ourselves. We do keep an eye on land coming on the market that might be suitable for these purposes. But um, as you can imagine, um, the land coming forward uh, on the market is, is quite, has been quite limited over the last couple of years for various reasons and um, quite uh, competitively uh, priced and, uh, and uh, demanded uh, when it does come forward, particularly suitable sites for housing purposes. So it's quite hard for us to compete within that, that market. Uh, so it would be worth potentially looking at that uh, again and in terms of whether or not those um, Resources could be better spent, perhaps looking at other ways of enabling and facilitating self and custom build uh, plots to come forward. Um, I mean, we, we have sought to address this through the new local plan, so policy 41, uh, self build and custom build housing does um, propose a policy that requires 5% of dwellings on sites of 20 homes or more through the new local plan to be delivered as self and custom build plots, uh, service plots. So that's taking forward the principle that we've established through the Cranbrook plan, uh, but across the rest of the district. Um, and it talks about a range of plots and types of housing. And, and obviously there's lots of different vehicles for delivering self and custom build. It's not just about uh, particular individuals who might actually have a, a, a skill or, or a trade that enables them to be involved physically in the build themselves. It, it, it can just be people commissioning uh, a company or a developer to, to build a house that's to their own specific specification. Um, but the, the principle is that um, you know, it gives them that opportunity to do that and, and delivers a range and type of housing that's, that's different from, from the standard off the peg housing that, that, that's currently being provided. And there are lots of different mechanisms for doing that in terms of um, we can investigate things like local development orders on, on sites that then uh, reduce the sort of red tape of the planning process and delivers a sort of plot passport, which I think is what's been done elsewhere on a lot of the larger sites that um, removes the need for sort of formal planning permission and, and just gives them requirements as you can go up to this height, this this sort of floor plan, this sort of arrangement, and then gives them the freedom to, 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 to do as they uh, they want on the site. So that's something we can certainly look at. Um, and certainly the policy 41 talks about looking at that through a supplementary planning document that, that sets out some of these details. So that's something I think we would envisage doing moving forward in any event. Um, just finally to, to pick up on Councillor Rylance's point about um, contributions towards infrastructure, um, my understanding is all self-builds are potentially exempt from paying community infrastructure levy because there's an exemption uh, mechanism in, in place that, that enables that and that's set through national legislation in the SIL regulations. So there isn't anything we can actually do about that, um, but I understand the frustration uh, in, in terms of that. Um, but we're, we're, we're stuck with that. Uh, I would say that we do enforce that quite rigidly in terms of ensuring that they are self-builds genuinely um, and that people do genuinely live in them. I think there's a requirement to live in it for at least three years afterwards um, to benefit from the exemption. And I think we have had a couple of cases where people have not complied with that and we have subsequently been able to go back and uh, and, and charge them uh, the, the SIL rate. So um, that that is all very closely monitored. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for that, Ed. Um, we'll take these last two speakers uh, and then hopefully we, we can just note the report. So, uh, Councillor Faithful, we will go to you, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I remember back in the 1980s where there was, I can't remember what it was called, where you got a half-built shell. It was like a whole series of them and you finished it off yourself. And I think they were a form of affordable housing, but you, you basically, you got the shell without it being finished off and you had to finish it off yourself. And I, I don't know, for some people, trying to start out with a, a clean site is quite an uh, undertaking. And I think, can, have we got space for, for doing that where you start out with just the shell and fit it out yourself?
help if I wasn't muted. I'll come back to Ed on that in a second. Councillor Moulding, over to you. Yeah, so I can remember further back than the 80s, I remember back in the 60s and 70s when uh, uh, a consortium of people, usually young, energetic people, decided that they would be able to form a group. And there might have been one of them was a carpenter, one was a bricklayer, a plumber, electrician, painter, and decorator, and those that couldn't do that were the labourers. And they worked hard on site all weekends, evenings and so on, uh, which was all well and good. They had a site worth with, um, say, eight dwellings. And, um, and if you were fortunate enough to be uh, the person who moved into the first dwelling that was completed, that was fine. But there wasn't quite as much energy or enthusiasm to carry on and help the person who was going to live in in uh, the bungalow number eight. But it was a, a way of, uh, of getting together as a group, working jolly hard, rolling their sleeves up and getting things done. And I'm delighted that, uh, that there is a provision in the emerging local plan for plots to be allocated from volume house builders where a group could do just that sort of thing and, uh, and create a, a brilliant way of building their own house. Now, I, I'm sure that the, the register of, of people who are wishing to self-build is, as we've already discussed, people who are probably well healed and, um, and would like to build a, a, a delightful four-bedroomed home in a, a good area, such as they mentioned, Budley, Exmouth, Sidmouth, wherever. Um, but I notice on the Appendix 1, which is the table of permissions suitable for self-build, uh, they're mostly plots for just one house. And a lot of them have already been commenced. So I presume the person who um, obtained the planning approval has now commenced work on that site. So I'm just wondering, is the, is the um, intention that this list of, of permissions which are suitable for self-build would be offered to those who are on our uh, self-build list so that they can, can hawk around and, and make contact with the people who own those sites to see if, if they're available to work on? Or, um, or, or, or is it just a bit of a wish list? Thanks very much for that, Councillor Moulding. I thought you were going to say that you, you, we're going to start a new group. I'll do the scaffolding, you do the block work. I've heard Councillor Howes a dab hand with a paintbrush. Um, we'll go to Ed Freeman just to answer that. And then I, I propose from the chair that we, we know the report and we move on. So, Ed, can you just cover off the last two speakers' questions and we'll, we'll then go to a vote? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I mean, uh, in terms of Councillor Faithful's point, there, there are lots of different options about uh, self-build, um, and they, they aren't, as, as you say, all about um, just a plot of land. They can be about uh, doing groundworks uh, for people right down to building a shell of a house for them to then fit out as, as they choose. There are lots of different options, um, and I think that's something that we need to cover off in terms of uh, supplementary planning guidance to accompany the new local plan policy about all of these dis different options. What will we accept to self and custom build under the policy? What wouldn't we? Um, and um, I think that then prompts a discussion about um, what the chair was saying about our sort of proactive approach and do we want to get into delivering uh, service spots ourselves? Do we want to... Um, facilitate this more uh, proactively in terms of um, development orders and putting plot passports that I mentioned in place that to kind of reduce the red tape and make it easier for people to come forward and through the planning process for self and custom build. There are lots of different options. We've had presentations before as have, have members uh, from this, the self build task force that's a sort of government body out there promoting and enabling self and custom build. There's lots of different resources out there to, to help people as well. So um, there's lots of work going on uh, and it's sort of a question for us I think as a council as to how proactive and how involved we want to be in doing that but to my mind it, it kind of starts with with having plots uh, available and that's where the Cranbrook plan policy and, and policy 41 in the new local plan um, would, would come forward in terms of delivering those plots to then uh, open up those options. At, at the moment, as I think Councillor Moulding is touching on, our, our approach is, is a bit more um, 
kind of uh, sat back and, and seeing what's happening. So we've, we've got a landowners and developers bringing full permissions for single plots. And we're saying, well, those are suitable for self and custom builders. And then we're marrying that up with our data that's coming through the seal process that's showing that a large proportion of those do come forward as self and custom build um, through, through that process. We're not proactively making that connection and saying to people, look, there's this plot, but that information is readily available on our website uh, anyway. And perhaps the fact that people are coming through and confirming through the seal process that those pops are going to self and custom builders shows that that is, is working, that people are making that connection, picking up on those plots and delivering them as, as self and custom build. But I'm sure there's a lot more we could do to be more proactive in terms of that. And I, I do see that as a work stream moving forward uh, in terms of developing the supplementary planning documents. But um, say so at the moment obviously resources are committed to to the the local plan and developing a policy framework that we can then work from as a starting point to then be more proactive and provide more guidance and support to self and custom builders thanks, thanks very Jeff. much for that ed um councillor blakey just quickly 20 seconds very quickly uh, just uh, interested in what can uh, councillor faithful had to say about the idea of building or buying properties that were part finished you know just basic shells in which you had to complete the, the job yourself uh, i honestly thought he was describing the experience of buying a house from a, a major builder um you know one of the national companies um as some of us locally have uh, have enjoyed in recent times um so um such schemes are available thanks very much councillor blakey mrs shaw can you take us uh, to the vote please Yes, Chair, thank you. There are four elements to this recommendation. To note the draft monitoring report and that it will be used to inform planning decisions, both in, in formal local plan production and in formal decision making on planning applications. Secondly, to note the 44 individuals were added to the self-build register during the latest monitoring period of the 31st of October 2020 to the 30th of October 2021. Thirdly, to note the need to permission 26 plots suitable for self-build between 31st of October 2020 and 30th of October 2023 to meet the level of demand shown in part one of the self-build register between 30... 31st of October 2020 and 30th of October 2021. And finally, to note that the demand for self-build plots indicated on the register should be taken into account in our planning, housing, regeneration and estate functions. Members, if you're in support of the recommendation, please press your green tick. If you're against the recommendation, press your red cross or raise your electronic hand to indicate you're abstaining from the vote. Thank you. The votes are currently taking place. So we have 11 votes in support, no votes against and no abstentions. Thank you very much. That's passed. So we move on to agenda item 13, which is a working draft of the proposed East Devon local plan 2020 to 2040. Ed, do you have anything you wish to say or are, you, are we just happy to go into the, the policy? Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, just very quickly to say that the version of the working draft local plan that's in this agenda, um, as, as per the note on, on the, the cover page, is slightly tweaked uh, from the previous uh, versions. We've done a few corrections from things that have been pointed out to us, particularly in terms of discrepancies between uh, site scoring in a number of cases and the colour coding on the on the accompanying plans and things like that. So nothing too major, but just to, to highlight that if anyone had picked up that this is a slightly different version. Um, the only other thing to say is by my recollection, we got to chapter five and strategy 10 extra science park on page 72, but I stand to be corrected if I'm wrong. No, that's exactly the page that I'm on, Chip. Um, Ed, and um, yeah, we'll start from there. So, um, as as just said, strategic policy ten, Exeter Science Park, page seventy two. We have the policy intent um, listed on that page, or, or two additional options, which is option B is to not expand the science park. Option C is to expand the science park elsewhere. Um, and I'll open it up to committee. We'll start outside of committee first. So, Councillor Rickson, we'll we'll go to you, please. 
Um, thank you, Chair. Actually, my uh, query is about the draft local plan as is, and I would like to protest most strongly on behalf of the um, Sidmouth Town Council about the inclusion under Strategy 21 of Plot 06, Land West of Two Bridges Road. Councillor, I just need to just stop in there. We're not discussing individual sites. This is, today is all about, we're leading with policy and they okay. are subject to change. So, um, so when am I allowed to make it? When am I allowed to discuss to discuss this with committee? I think it will be um, a, a, another day when officers, after we've finished the policy today, will officers will come back with a further report with a new set of site recommendations from the recommendations that the committee have made from December through to now, um, and then we can discuss it then. Okay, I just think we're, we're gonna we're gonna be repeating ourselves twice if we are going to be looking at all the individual sites at a future meeting. We are, by all means we can go through it today, but no, I apologise. I'll, I'll leave you repeating today. themselves uh, and doing the same work when everything's obviously subject to change. Okay, apologies. I'll wait until no. later. Please. Thank you, Councillor Rickson. Councillor Bailey, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of uh, just get to grips with how this is, how we're going to be doing this. So, so are we, so we're not going to be touching on the individual sites. And I think that probably makes sense because if there's going to be the HELA done, then we're going to be kind of, you know, going through things that are, are subject to change if we go through it today. But how far are you envisaging that, are we, are we still going to be going through the, the town so what are we going to be doing I'm not quite clear thank you no so what I envisage is that we go through chapter five and then leave it at that once we've received the HELA um, information as well as um, the updated reports from officers that we then go through each individual town so that we do it all in one hit I what I don't want to, to do is do everything today for it all to change in a month or two's time and then do it all again because it's just wasting your time as committee members. And I, I know that you've probably got other things better to do than sit in a meeting with me all day. That okay? comment. That's Thanks, true. <laughs> Philip, over to you. Um, I I first, it's first thing, uh, uh, Chair, first thing I've got to do is de declare an interest. I suppose I have to declare an interest because I was a previous um, Science Park Board member when I was a uh, portfolio holder for economy. So I, 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 I'll, I'll declare that now. I'm not sure that I needed to, but anyway, I thought I would anyway, let's put it out there. Um, wow, the Science Park, <clears throat> a fantastic conception, punching above its pay grade. The people that work there and the businesses that have come in as expansion has been phenomenal. Exeter Science Park is, is actually it's East Devon Science Park, but I always like to call it that. We always used to have a bit of a smile and a giggle because it's actually in East Devon and in the next it. But anyway, there we go. Exeter Science Park is, is, uh, is phenomenal in what it's achieving and its, and its success is, is I couldn't really rate it higher than, than, uh, than the things that they're doing. And anybody, honestly, if anybody's not sure of what it does or what it's the work that it does or what if, please just get hold of Dr. Sally Basker, give her a call and just say you'd like to come and have a look and understand what you're doing. And, and uh, uh, it, it is phenomenal. And, and I'm, just, I'm just a big advocate of it. So I'm, I'm going to go along with 10. I certainly won't be supporting B, not expand the science park. How can you not expand success is the first thing. Uh, and expanding it for elsewhere, um, only if it ran out of, ran out of room of where it is. And, and by looking at this report, and I, I do understand a bit of the lie of the land is, is I would just like to see it expanded where it is and where that holds into the future and where that goes. If it expands elsewhere, simply because we've taken all the land up because it's so successful, because it needs to expand somewhere else, great. I'd be all for that as well another day. I'm not sure that's something I want to support here. I wouldn't be able to put enough uh, uh, emphasis on how important this is. It not only delivers... Um, uh, the, the science park not only delivers on jobs, but it delivers at very high tech jobs and the sort of skills that, that we don't see in the normal walk of life that, that we have. And the connection between um, both Exeter City Council and the Exeter um, University uh, and the work with the college as well is just phenomenal. I'm, I'm just going to be supporting that. I just wanted to get that in. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Skinner. I think as well, I need to declare that um, 
I'm the chair of the Exeter and East Devon Enterprise Zone Board. Um, and that obviously relates to the next few policies or everything relating to the Enterprise Zone. Um, totally agree with what you're saying there, Councillor Skinner. I think that all throughout the pandemic, they haven't dropped below 95% occupancy. Um, and then even with the new building that they just, I think it was opened the week before last, they've already got 70% occupancy with contracts already in place to hopefully take that up to, to close to 95%. So they are doing fantastic work. It's uh, a well sought after area and um, yeah, long may it continue. Sally Baskin doing a fantastic job. Um, over to you, Councillor Langham. Uh, thank you, Chair. I totally agree with Councillor Skinner and yourself and what you've been saying. Uh, without doubt, Exeter Science Park is one of our golden eggs and we really have to look after it. And that's why, uh, Chair, I certainly support option A, but can I ask members, uh, uh, and not just members of the committee, but uh, all councillors listening to this, do read option C carefully and, and just have it on a back burner, you know? So in three years, five years, seven years time, when it raises its beautiful head that we have a problem that we have to expand our local economy you know exactly what's going on and you know that uh, this was considered on the 22nd of february in 2022 and you're aware of it because let's consider all for um, our future success and be ready for anything thank you chair thanks very much for that council Ian. And Ed, I think that's quite an apt time to bring you in. Is this uh, something that the Science Park has indicated to the planning de uh, department and yourselves uh, as a potential site for them to expand? Or is this something that we're identifying for them? I just want to know which way round it is, if possible. Um, I think the discussions we've had with the Science Park are, are clear that they, they want to have land to expand into and they're in discussions about where that land might be in relation to the existing Science Park. Uh, I, I suppose what we're saying is um, we don't know for certain at this point. Um, I think the preference would be to have land that um, abuts or is as near as possible to existing Science Park to benefit from the infrastructure that's there and the communal facilities that are, are part of the Science Park set up. Um, but if that's not possible for whatever reason, then an expansion sort of onto the land south of the A30 is, is an option. And you'll see later on, we also talk about uh, land north of Southampton uh, as, as either, you know, it could either be an expansion of Science Park or, or, or an employment development site of its own. Um, but I think certainly the preference of, for all parties is, is for it to be as close as possible to the existing science park. And I think that's certainly the science park's uh, preference, but discussions are sort of ongoing as to, to what land might be available and suitable for those purposes. So really just looking to establish those principles at this stage, I think, Chair. Thanks very much, Ed. Uh, Councillor Howe, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, right, first declaration, it's in my ward, the land south of the A30. And I suppose that's where I need to raise a caution. I'm all in support of A, don't get all well, the main option, yeah, strategic option 10, but not B or C particularly. C, I, I uh, have a word of caution about. It is part of the Cliss Valley Trail um, or the Cliss Valley Regional Park. Um, so it's wildlife considerations and everything else is quite high. And we need to be very careful about the continuous use of the Cliss Valley Trail and the routes that are encouraged, because this is the link into Southton Village, a conservation area. So it has to be very carefully thought out if we're going to follow option C as an option. Really, it shouldn't be there. I understand why it might have to be as a fallback. If it is a fallback, we have to be extremely mindful that it doesn't uh, raise above the height of the field boundary. So it can't be seen by the village of Southton and it impacts all the listed buildings there and all the rest of it. Um, so I don't believe the scale of land is as big as the planners believe uh, that are, that is an option on option C. As I say, we just need to be mindful and we need to take into account the Cliss Valley Regional Park as well that has a statutory um, body now, you know, in its mitigation for everything else and the harm and the cycle raised and everything else that needs to go down beside it. So we need to be really mindful. Thank you. 
Thanks very much for that, Councillor Howe. Councillor Blakey, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I should perhaps also declare a slight interest in having been, um, uh, by dint of being a portfolio holder, uh, director of Science Park in the past. Um, and certainly I support um, the, the option A. Um, option C is something to be mindful of, but there is, a, there is another alternative, and particularly taking into account what Councillor Howe has just said, um, there's a new town less than two miles up the road that's going to have a town centre in which this authority is likely to um, to own a, a fairly chunky piece of land. There, there would appear to be opportunities there, let's, let's call it Cranbrook, um, which will also provide those who are going to be working there the kind of um, uh, social environment that I know the Science Park are very keen on. So I think that, that should be um, uh, perhaps taken up and taken to Science Park. Uh, as a, a possible uh, option for them for uh, future development. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Blakey. Councillor Arnott, we go to you now. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, straightforward option A. Um, members may have noticed that at uh, the last cabinet, I think it was, they've come along quite fast. Um, we uh, allocated an amount of money to look into the idea of a, uh, a, a cultural, a digital hub um, in that area. Uh, now, um, at the moment, I, I can't say anything about this in public, but just to assure members that there is very purposeful work going on with um, local educational uh, institutions and other partners to try and see if we can deliver that uh, as soon as possible. Um, and uh, where that might go within the enterprise zone, not entirely sure, but if there's a technical technological aspect to it, which there, there would be then um, one part of it could be near where the Exeter Science Park currently is. So that's why I welcome the wording there, because it basically says policy will explain and expand on the types of uses allowed, phasing policies, design standards, and so on. And I think that covers the possibility of that. Um, but um, as I said, Chip, hopefully we'll be able to bring forward more news about that, uh, either at the next um, strategic planning meeting or perhaps the one after. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Arnold. Um, Councillor Bailey, um, can we come to you now, please? Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Yes, I support option A. I do see the A30 as a natural, very large boundary, um, and I would be keen for any expansion to take place um, uh, to the north of the uh, A30, uh, abutting the existing science park, although obviously taking into account what Councillor Blakey says in our new community um, at Cranbrook, well, newish community at Cranbrook, um, uh, to keep um, the, the jobs um, and options and opportunities um, on the north side of the A30. So, um, yeah, I'll be supporting option A. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, lastly, Councillor Hayward. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, again, I suppose, yes, I'll declare my interest as the current um, director um, of the Science Park on behalf of East Devon District Council. Um, and I applaud everything that uh, has been said, especially um, by Councillor Skinner, spot on. It's a, it's a credit to us, uh, it's a credit to East Devon, it's a credit to the South West of what it's done. Um, certainly not option B, um, that would be self-defeating. Uh, and there are merits in what has been covered by Councillor Howe um, and Councillor Blakey. Um, however, I think before you go down that route, you need to talk to, um, as I'm sure uh, Mr. Freeman and Andy Wood and Rob Murray uh, and others will, talk to Sally Basco and talk to the board about what their plans are, because you can't artificially determine where they're going to expand. They have got a big site there. They are improving but they are constrained by geography, they're constrained by financing, um, they're constrained by the, the very nature of the STEM product that they're, that they're selling. Um, so um, on balance, I'll be going for option A because they're doing incredibly well, they've got great plans moving forwards. I think 
in terms of providing facilities, yes, we'd, we'd love it to provide jobs. And in fact, it's intended to provide jobs for places like Cranbrook and the west of the district. And in fact, anywhere, the east of the district, anywhere in the UK. But expansion outside of the science park may well actually go against their core ethos because of what they're trying to create there. You know, they want it to become a hub, um, not just a series of offices and laboratories. They want it to be a place, uh, a home, uh, a thriving hub for that type of industry. Um, so, uh, yeah, on that basis, thank you for all the kind words. I'm sure, Sally, if she's not watching, I'll pass those on to her. Um, and um, onwards and upwards for the science part. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Hayward. Councillor Allen, we'll come to you and then we'll take it to a vote. Right. Um, I just wanted to make the point that um, while I'm totally in support of the science park, and I think it ought to be a, a, enabled to expand, there are other things to do with high quality science, which we need to consider as to how it will be located near the science park. Um, for example, the, uh, there's a move in Bridgewater to build a, a brand new EV technology uh, battery production site to link in with the um, lithium uh, situation in Cornwall. Now, if somebody came along and said they wanted to do anything like that, where on earth would we be prepared to do that in East Devon? But bear in mind that there are some very, very good new technologies coming along. The science park will generate the uh, young children companies, but we need to make sure that around the science park, there's enough room for expansion uh, and, and other companies to come along. And we need to make sure that there's other opportunities along the A30 to make sure that from Axminster and Honiton, people can travel to these uh, science park areas. The other problem is how on earth do they get to the science park easily from Exmouth, uh, Sidmouth and uh, other areas, uh, transport through the infrastructure isn't easy and that is another reason for looking very seriously at this whole issue of infrastructure, transport and economic development being looked at so that it's viable and sustainable. Thank you Chair. Thanks very much and totally agree we need to look at everything holistically. Um, at that point can we, Mrs Shaw, can you take us to a, a straw poll? Yes, Chair. Members, three options, the policy as draft or the um, policy will expand and expand on those points. Option B is not to expand the science park. Option C, to expand the science park elsewhere. If you're in favour of option A, please press your red tick. If you're in favour of option B, press your red cross. And if you're in favour of option C, raise your electronic hand, please. Members are in support of option. Thank you very much. Uh, so that's obviously passed. We'll take one more uh, policy and then we'll stop for lunch. So the next policy is high quality employment north of Salton, uh, page 73. Um, and we're looking for option A, B uh, and C. So option A is for policy. Option B is not allocating land for development and option C is allocating the land for an alternative or an employment use. A, B or C, Councillor Howe, uh, over to you. You're on mute, I'm afraid. Mr Freeman not going to take us into it? <laughs> we, we, I, I'm happy to open up to, to Mr okay. Freeman I, if I, he has anything further I, to add. I, well, in that case, I'll, I'll start if that's fine. Um, Everything I said about the previous science park allocation applies to this. It is a very sensitive area. Um, yes, it's right against the A30 and the M5, but there is limited land here for development without encroaching on Southern Village conservation area and the multitude of listed buildings, etc. cetera. Um, and I struggle to see how you're gonna get any sort of scale of development here. As such, option B is my favored, Add to the fact you've got a problem then, I suppose the opposite side, 
you've got a lot of housing development, so people could walk across the bridge if they can get there safely, but it's just not an ideal location. Um, and really, you know, when we're talking about the likes of poor old Exmouth without enough um, land allocated for employment, you know, Ottery St Mary, the, the same, and other places with lack of land for development, and we're putting more development land already in an area that has a lot of employment development already so it's it added to the fact we haven't used up all the rest of the de development land for employment all around this area um so i'm struggling to understand the reason for adding this um at present i haven't seen um a compelling reason to add it apart from for someone to make money uh, which is the way of the world i get um so i'm I'm against it without a lot further details. And as the ward member, probably understandable, if you get my meaning. Thank you, Councillor Howe. Councillor Ingham, over to you. Thanks, Chair. I'm quite happy for us to rely on Ed feeding us more details on, on, on this option. But without any shadow of doubt, it's quite clear in my mind that option A is what we should do because uh, of a number of reasons, but um, Councillor Howe covered a couple of them. It, you know, it's adjacent to the M5 and to the A30. It's proximity, I would suggest to you, to uh, Science Park, to Sky Park, um, and potentially for um, housing growth within the, within the area. Um, of course, it makes sense for us to earmark this area. And so, yes, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I can understand why Councillor Howe, um, who, who represents that board is saying what he's saying, but we have to plan for the future where it's most effective and efficient for us to uh, promote business and our local economy and interact nationally uh, and hopefully uh, uh, internationally as well. This is the right spot, Chair. Um, I support option A. Thank you, Councillor Ian. Ed, do you have anything you wish to add on the policy, just in light of Councillor Howe's um, comments initially? Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, I would say it is obviously early days, so we're just looking at establishing a principle again here in terms of potential further high quality employment space in that general location. There's a lot of evidence still being produced in terms of uh, an updated economic development needs assessment, further site assessment work of, of this particular site. And obviously it's been looked at at one of the HELAR panel meetings as well. So it will be covered in the HELAR report as well. Um, I mean, I think if you look at the plan on page 69 in the agenda, it is the next logical place to go in terms of uh, employment growth in that area, given the constraints of uh, the motorway obviously running to uh, the west of Science Park, uh, the railway line to, to the north apart from the identified land for potential expansion of Science Park and the residential developments to the east, the A30 to the south. Um, and obviously it's been put forward for, for, for these purposes. Um, we think that there will be a need for additional employment land in, in this area over the plan period, um, uh, which is why we're looking at this. Uh, I hear what Councillor House says about um, land already allocated that hasn't come forward, I guess, um, mainly at Sky Park, which has had some barriers to delivery to do with um, the landing systems at, at the airport that have had to be resolved, but have now been resolved so that those can come forward. So, uh, and we obviously have to look long term given the, the, the timescales of the plan. So I think that's where this site uh, comes forward. We think there's a need and this would be the most appropriate location available to do that. Uh, I hear what Council House says about the setting of Southern Village. It's obviously a very historic village with lots of heritage assets with, whose setting we would want to preserve in any development, uh, as, as well as the setting of, of the wider village itself. And I, I think that can be achieved from my knowledge of, of, of the sites, provided there's adequate separation and this is done sensitively in terms of the landscape. Um, and those are the things that I think need a lot of further work and, and uh, 
uh, assessment to define some clear boundaries to this site and some clear criteria for any allocation in that area to ensure that it it does respect that character and setting to, to the village um, the heritage assets within it um, and also the links into the Cliffs Valley Regional Park um, which I'll also acknowledge as being very important in terms of of this site equally it could help to deliver parts of that as well um, and, and help to deliver a, a link over the A30 to the other employment and um, housing spaces over there. Um, so lots of additional work to be done, I would acknowledge. Um, and so, you know, this isn't uh, by any means wouldn't be any kind of final decision in terms of allocation of the sites, but I think it would be helpful for policy progression to have members views on on, on whether this is something uh, we, we think is a, is a good option based on the information we've got at the present time. And obviously we can review that later as further evidence comes forward and, and, and refine that approach. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for that, Ed. Councillor Bailey, over to you, please. Thank you. Um, Ed, how many acres is this site, please, roughly? I think he's going to have to come I'll, back. I'll have to come back to you on that. I don't think it says, uh, but I can quickly check and come back to you. Thank you. Uh, Yes, I've just got a general reluctance about, I mean, presumably this is green, more greenfield development. Um, and what I would really like to see is redevelopment of existing brownfield lands for employment purposes, rather than more greenfield development, which seems to characterise our, our <laughs> development for our local plan. And I am, you know, it looks as though this is, it's, when you look out at the map on page 69, it's kind of encroaching into the green space south of the A30. And it's really difficult to, you know, support the endless, endless redevelopment of our green spaces in East Devon. And, you know, I'd be really interested to see where in the local plan, we have actually gone out of our way to redevelop existing employment lands um, rather than just doing the easy option, which is what it seems to me that we're constantly doing. So um, I'm, I'm not very supportive of this because I think that, you know, just as we've got a hierarchy of settlements, we need to have a hierarchy um, where we try and redevelop what's already built upon. Otherwise, there's going to be no countryside left or and we're going to just just it's just being wrecked, isn't it? Thanks. Thank you very much, Councillor Bailey. Completely sympathise with you. Um, I think with our earlier work and what we've done with the urban capacity study, that highlighted um, that it was a total of one year that we can do if we built on every single brownfield across the di across the district. It would give us one year supply of housing. I think it is a case of the local plan to maybe change the policies that we're putting forward, um, possibly to increase densities in town centres. Of our, of our own um, existing towns and such like, and then we won't see this kind of sprawl across our, our lovely green countrysides so that inevitably we, we, we are destroying at the moment. Uh, Councillor oh, Allen. Sorry, may I just come back to you? And Sorry, um, it's not that I would say that Exeter is kind of, you know, I'm not saying that we want to emulate Exeter, but you can see what's going on within their boundaries. You can see the fact that they're redeveloping within, within the city. But we don't seem to be doing any of that. We're just going out and out and out and out. And that applies. This is just an, another example of that, that we're just sprawling. And I note that the urban development um, capacity didn't give us much capacity, but it, it does seem to be a kind of tone of, you know, it's all terribly difficult redeveloping existing um, it, within existing sites. Um, but I, I really do think that we, we should be doing more of that. Thank you. Definitely agree. Totally. Councillor Allen, over to you. Yes, I'm, I'm going to be very brief because uh, I, I think the jury is out on where we should put high quality employment land. Uh, by all means, we should consider uh, the site north of Southern Village, but we also need to look very carefully at the flooding implications of the Colm Valley. And I don't think that at this stage it's very wise to make a definite decision on this particular issue. In addition, 
I think we ought to be considering other areas where high quality employment should be spread. And the last point I'd make is that the danger is if we don't designate it as high quality employment, <clears throat> what we're getting in this area is an infill of all the dirty type industries that Exeter doesn't want. So we're in a real cleft stick with this particular situation. Um, in general favor of it, but it should never go near the, uh, uh, the park and the wildlife sites that we've designated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Allen. Councillor Skinner, over to you. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I don't know, I suppose it has been said before, but I, I'm in support of, of this, provided it, it's, it's high, high quality, and that's been mentioned here, and that's, that's, what, that's what we were looking at. And I take on board Councillor Allen's view so that it doesn't become just a general consensus. And we need to, we will need to remember that uh, as we go forward with our employment land, that as Exeter has said to, as we put it when uh, previously, that they've got to consume their own smoke with their own developments. Well, part of that consuming their own smoke means they're building on parts of Marsh Bart and then I mentioned before about the service station all the rest of it. Employment is moving out of Exeter and it's going to move our way. So what I, I, I'm quite, for me, on the fringes, to have something of high quality development, knowing the sort of work we've just spoken about, the Exeter Science Park, what could be the expansion of businesses that would expand on, I think it's a, it, it's a perfect fit. So from my perspective, where I'm sat, and I, I take on board that if you start talking about high quality, it takes into account surely what Councillor Howe was talking on before in using the the um ensuring that that how we develop it and where we put it within within the landscape actually works and fits and i'm sure we can we could make that happen i'm sure we would be wanting to make that happen and and, and get it right so i'm supportive of the um um as it's set out in a um but it has to be particularly has to be lined to high quality uh high quality work going that way that's what i'm going to support thank you Thanks very much, Councillor Skinner. Um, Ed, can I bring you back in just to cover off anything or any make any comments you wish? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, um, we'll just say the, the site area is, is about 19 hectares, um, I'm told, <laughs> uh, to answer Councillor Bailey's uh, question. In terms of um, the brownfield land, I mean, I certainly agree we should be bringing forward brownfield land first. It's just that we don't have very much brownfield land in, in the district. Um, and um, that's the problem fundamentally, uh, which is why we end up proposing allocation of, of greenfield sites like this in order to meet the needs of, of the district. Um, we are looking at um, the employment land needs across the extra economic area. So the, the um, economic development needs assessment I mentioned earlier is a joint piece of work across uh, East Devon, Exeter, Teambridge and Mid Devon to look at the needs across the wider area. So while certainly Exeter are trying to consume their own smoke in terms of housing needs and have presented the Liverable Exeter programme for doing that, I think it's yet to be seen as to whether or not they can consume their own smoke in terms of employment spaces. Um, and that's something that we'll, uh, we will hopefully get some clarity of uh, through that work and also some work that Exeter have been doing, doing themselves uh, linked to that as, as well. So uh, that's uh, part of the further evidence to, to come forward uh, and inform production of this plan as, as we move forward. And that will also give us clarity about um, the needs for employment land in, in the area. Locationally, where are those needs in terms of our district? Are they needs within this um, sort of west end of the district for once or a better phase or, or or within the towns and the quantum of that need which will obviously feed into this uh, conversation in terms of the need to bring this site forward or alternative sites forward but um as i say we think that this site is is the best available in in this general location on the assumption that there will be a need uh, for that um the other thing i was just going to quickly pick up on was councillor allen's point I've, I've quickly checked and, and none of this site is within a flood zone um so that there are no flooding implications on on this site but obviously um its position in terms of the cliffs valley regional park and its environmental considerations in regard to that are obviously something that will be foremost in our minds uh in in terms of of how this this site comes forward and contributes to all of that if if that's members wish that it does come forward thank you chair Thanks very much for that, Ed. Councillor Howe, we go to you next, please. 
Thank you. I need to pick up first off on Mr. Freeman's um, guess, best guess of 19 hectares. I believe he's sorely misinformed. We've done some sums on it and to not impact Southern Village because the 19 hectares, we believe, takes you up to the ridge line, which means you will be in full view of the conservation area. You need to reduce that by about a quarter. So 25% less, if not a third less, to actually keep the buildings sustainable underneath the conservation areas view, view site line and the list of buildings. So I understand that and get that. The second one I need to pick up, and it's a point that's been made in case you yourself, Chair, made it about brownfield sites. Um, and our definition of brownfield sites are sites that currently aren't used and that could be reused. Um, whereas many other councils take the view a brownfield site is still possibly in use, um, but needs some redevelopment and improvements. And I use an example, I'll use the Magnolia Centre down Exmouth as a classic example. It's just our officers choose to ignore it, not willfully, don't get me wrong, but it's blooming hard work. And we need to make that hard work happen in our towns in particular, to get these town centres redeveloped and put housing there along with employment and the, you know, redevelop these great towns we've got to keep them fit for the next century. So it's not a dispute with Mr. Freeman at all. We've talked about it a lot in the past. I just think it's time we as a council gave the officers a firm direction to start the long work, and it will be long work, to pick these sites that are brownfield, they're just not empty brownfield sites, to start that work to really make a challenge and a difference to the employment and housing aspects of our major towns. So we put the heart back in them. Um, so I plead that we actually somehow get round to that. But I'm still against this development. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Howe. I'll ask Ed to come back on those points uh, at the end, but we'll, we'll go to Councillor Arnott next. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, like Councillor Howe and Councillor Bailey, um, I'd, I'd like to understand, and, and forgive me, we've probably already had a meeting on this recently, um, where we really are on the work on brownfields. And that's critical. Um, the tragedy is, I'm not sure you'll be able to cross collateralise that with this, which is the proposal effectively for a new town. Um, and Having heard everything that's been said, I, I, I do wonder if Councillor Skinner has a fair point. The one thing we would know about a new settlement in this area is precisely that there will be a very high standard of jobs um, just over the A30. So that's a very short commute. And I mean, this is a very hard thing to say really particularly mindful of what Councillor Howe, the sensitivities where he lives and in his ward, and Councillor Young, I'm not sure if Jeff's in today as well, you know, this is going all the way down to Woodby Sorterton and things. But my fear is if we if we don't if we don't do the work on this, these sites will come forward anyway and it will be it'll be havoc. And isn't the one thing that we've learned from Cranbrook, um, well, Kevin, and I think rightly say, one of the hundred things we should have learned from Cranbrook, but well, one of the key things is that if we don't have a coherent civic public policy on rolling out a new settlement, then we'll end up making some very serious mistakes. Um, so I'm really caught on this chair. I, I, you know, obviously the heart says let's only build on brownfield, and you know, obviously that's the thing to do. On the other hand, I'm thinking if we don't look to what might be inevitable and seek to control it in every respect, that may be a greater mistake. Um, I don't think that helps the debate, chair, and it doesn't really help which way I'm going to vote on it. Um, I think I'm probably going to have to vote for. For the proposed um, for the proposed policy, though, thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Arnott. Um, Councillor Bailey, we'll, we'll go to you next, please. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I think that's a really interesting point that Councillor Arnott made. 
And I think for me, the issue is that we, I don't think at the moment it is a cohesive um, approach because at the moment we still haven't got the information or the report on the local plan. So if this site, if, if the proposed, and I, maybe other people know, but I certainly don't, because we've had all these site developers that have talked about, you know, where, where they feel the new town should be. Now, if it's going to be south of the, the um, A30, well, this, sorry, the A3052, well, this site is quite considerably north of the A3052. So I think we do need to have a cohesive approach. And we do need to, if there's going to be a new town, understand where the employment opportunities are going to be. But I think that that should be considered in the round. And I think the problem with looking at it in this way is we don't actually know. We, we've got that whole dotted line showing where it may be, but we don't actually know. And what I really am reluctant to do is kind of commit to a specific employment land site without going hand in hand with all that detailed feasibility work around the new town. And what I would also say to um, Ed Freeman is that um, I've picked up on what um, Councillor Howe has said um, about what, what definition is uh, of Brownfield. And I really do believe there are many, many industrial estates across our district uh, that we could redevelop hand in hand with, with the owners to improve the employment opportunities and potentially accommodate residential development and in the town centres. But I just don't think we're doing that. So I'd, I'd ask Ed, how many owners of industrial estates has have been contacted as part of this local plan, plan process so that we can prioritise redevelopment of existing sites as opposed to just sprawling out into the um the green open space thank you thank you councillor bailey councillor faithful we're really pushing on time now for lunch uh, i wondered this i thought this would be a, quite a fairly quick item but it seems to we're, we're going on to to brownfields as well so councillor faithful thank you chair um to me, jumping over the A30 like that into this open countryside is, is kind of part of build this constant sprawl right across the whole end, that whole West End. And to me, you need to have some sort of buffer to, to separate the different areas. So there's the Science Park and, you know, and the A30, th this plot of land is does not connect with the science park prop either way, um, and it, it I, yeah, I don't support it, but I'm not voting anyway. But you know, I just thought, I think it's really important you have a, a a clean green buffer between the science park and moving south into Clis Clis Valley Park. Thank you, Councillor Faithful. Ed, can you um, just cover off any points you, you wish to make and then we'll go to a vote? Uh, thank you, Chair. As I said before, I mean, I, I, I certainly agree that we should be maximising the opportunity to redevelop brownfield sites, but fundamentally that starts with having a willing landowner. Um, and we haven't, um, haven't got to that many brownfield sites coming through in the call for sites. Whether we want to look at that again with this revised call for sites and uh, put some greater emphasis on um, trying to bring full brownfield sites. Um, we can certainly look at that in terms of the scope of this uh, additional call for sites and this additional report I mentioned earlier on a previous item as, as to how we can do that. Um, but fundamentally, it, you know, we need a willing landowner to be able to do that. So I think reference was made to the Magnolia Centre next month, and I'm sure it, it does have potential, but it hasn't been put forward. Um, and I don't know what, uh, what what the landowner's intentions are in terms of, of that. So um, we can't start allocating sites that haven't been put forward, that we don't have a willing landowner, that we don't have a route to deliverability of those sites, because all sites have to be viable and deliverable for the plan to be found sound. Um, but I will certainly look at that in terms of the scope of an additional call for sites and see how we can try and address members' concerns and try and do more to, to bring forward brownfield sites through that approach. Um, I suppose the other thing I wanted to pick up on was the relationship with the new community. I, I hear what members are saying in terms of that, uh, and if members feel 
you know, and unable to make a, a give us a clear steer on 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 this side at this point until we're further progressed with that. Then uh, that that's 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 fine. I understand that. I, I would say, however, I, I see this more as as a, a sort of addition to uh, the employment sites within the enterprise zone and 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 feeding into that rather than any new community. I think any new community would have to provide its own employment spaces within that area. And we will obviously want to understand uh, the transport links that would link any new community in that area, whether it's north of the A3052 or south of it, how it links to these employment sites that are coming forward in, in the plan or potentially coming forward in the plan in terms of transport links as how people can move between them if they live in that new community, how they could work here uh, and commute there in a sustainable way. Um, uh, and how that all fits together would need to be part of the strategy that's 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 developed moving forward. As I say, it's very much about a principle of of, of this site at this stage. Um, and as I said earlier, I can see few opportunities elsewhere within that area to provide further high quality employment spaces that feeds into to that that's already been delivered within the enterprise zone and enables that that um, strategy to progress through to the next plan period. Uh, so, so that's really how we've arrived at this site in terms of our initial assessment but I say there's a huge amount of evidence currently being produced and further work to be done um, that, that needs to be taken account of later in the, the plan period. Just finally the, the other thing I, I hear Council House point about the site area I should say the 19 hectares I quoted is the site area that's been put forward fully accept that part of that area would need to be landscaped and um, screening and it may be that parts of that site are not suitable for development the 19 hectares was just what's been put forward at this stage thank you chair thank you ed um members i'm not going to take any more questions so i think we've we've done this subject um we need to get back to focusing on what the the actual policy itself um so we we've we've got the three options the uh, ed's just mentioned a fourth option is to to not make a decision at now uh, and we would just make that an option D. Um, so Mrs Shaw, can you take us to a vote, please? Yes, Chair. Members, option A is to follow the policy aim as drafted. Option B is not allocating la the land for development. Option C, allocate the land for an alternative or any employment use. And option D is to not progress at this time. Therefore, members, please press your green tick for option A, your red cross for option B, raise your electronic hand for option C, and do a thumbs up for option D. Waiting for the votes to come in. Okay, so, um, oh. Okay, the thumbs up keeps, um, it doesn't stay, but I, I saw there was four thumbs up and five in, green tick so I would say majority is option A. Thank you very much for that Wendy uh, and Mrs Shaw. Um, so that's obviously passed so we'll we'll go to a lunch break now. If members you can join us back at uh, 20 to 2 we'll have half an hour um, and I'll see you back after lunch. Thank you. May I just ask a question of, of Ed would that be okay? By all means. So what I'm what I'm hearing it so it sounds as though no owners of employment land have been contacted from what you say for redevelopment for art but in just well for employment uses is that right? Apart from the call for site, have we reached out to any of the employment employment land owners across E Seven? Not directly, no. So that, as, as I say, you. that's something, uh, hearing members' views, we can see if that's a possibility and how we would go about doing that in terms of a further call for sites. Thank you. Thanks, all, and see you at 22. Members, can you just make sure you're muted and you turn your camera off, because I am going to leave the live stream running.
So welcome back everyone. Um, I hope you had a lovely lunch. We start back on strategic policy 12, which is page 74. Uh, it's aviation, aeronautical activity, employment provision, east of Exeter Airport Terminal. You've got the policy intent listed as your option A. Option B is to not allocate land for development. Uh, and option C is to allocate land for an alternative uh, or any employment use. So I'll open up to the committee. Um, do we have any comments we wish to make or are we just happy to go to a vote? Chair, sure. I'll put, put my hand up. You know, whenever you like. Right, so I, I, I'm, you know, Exeter Airport. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, Exeter Airport is absolutely vital to the whole of the Southwest region. Absolutely vital. Uh, without the airport, I always feel like all, all everything else we're just doomed. So <clears throat> the policy that we've got, and I read through this, I had to read a couple of times, to be honest, um, is just, I'm just happy to very much support anything that, that is very pro uh, Exeter, Exeter Airport, to be honest. So option B for me is not to have a policy, is that's not uh, for me, to be honest, and to not allocate to vote now that the airport would be wrong as well. So I'm quite happy with the report and I should be supported. I recommend it to go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Skinner. Councillor Ingham, over to you. Thanks, Chair. Um, totally agree with uh, Councillor Skinner. This is, this is really important. I would suggest to you that if we didn't have the airport, we wouldn't have the enterprise zone, which you're well aware of the vitality of that, Chair. And so we have to tie those together and we have to make sure that our uh, airport has every um, opportunity of being sustainable. Air flight is here for a very long time, you know, for, for, for hundreds of years, I'd imagine. Um, we're just going to be using, hopefully very soon, um, different energies to propel uh, aircraft and to propel uh, uh, vehicles. And so um, we have to make sure we don't fall behind in the southwest. You've seen what's happened with other airports, Chair. Um, that really mustn't happen to us. So uh, I'm going for a Chair. Thank you. Thanks very much. Councillor Allen, over to you. Yes, I'm totally in support of uh, this uh, policy. <clears throat> I do think, though, <laughs> There needs to be a policy on Dunkerswell Airport put into the plan that's uh, required by the NPPF. We, sh we must have a policy for Dunkerswell as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Hallam. I think that's noted by, by officers. So if uh, Mrs Shaw, could you take us to, to a vote, please? Yes, Chair. Members, the three options, one is the policy aim as stated, option B is not allocate the land for development, or option C, allocate the land for an alternative or any employment use. Please press your green tick if you support option A, option B, press your red cross, or option C, raise your electronic hand, please. Members are in support of option A. Thank you very much, members. Uh, thank you very much, Wendy and Ms. Shaw. Uh, we move on to uh, page 76, Exit Airports and its Future Operations and Development. So you've got uh, policy uh, in front of you as option A. Option B is to not have a policy. And option C is to not allocate development land at the airport. It's a lot, it's, it's very similar to the last, um, but with some small changes. Councillor Skinner, over to you. Um, I'm just going to go with the same. I don't think I want to add anything too much. I do take on board what Councillor Allen just said about uh, um, uh, Dunkerswell Airport. No, it's not here. I hope the officers are noting that down, as you quite rightly said, uh, Chair, because, uh, yeah, really important. I hadn't thought of that one. Well done, Councillor Allen. But uh, no, just going, going with this, I'm, I'm full support. I don't think there's anything. We've said it just now. So, yeah. Yeah, Thank, so you. Like, Thank you, Councillor Skinner. Councillor Ingham. You're up next. Thanks, Chair. Um, thank you, Councillor Allen. Quite important to uh, to raise that. I totally agree with Councillor Skinner. This all ties in, Chair, doesn't it? It's so important. 
for the next 50, 100 years that we plan meticulously now to get everything right, it will make a huge difference after 2040 and 50 if we get this right. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Councillor Arnott, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, I'm very glad that this report um, sets out in, in full and um, excellent detail the efforts that are being made uh, by the operators of the airport to get right out there with hybrid electric flight, potentially hydrogen, the whole future flight program. Uh, and I agree with what Councillor Ingham has said. One way or the other, flight looks like it's going to be here. Um, there are huge challenges to make it not dependent on fossil fuel. In my limited imagination, I simply can't imagine how that's going to happen, but clearly somebody's going to make it work. And so we do need to support that, um, the site and everything around it. But I'm delighted that this re report reflects what are, in fact, of course, the other concerns of this, of this council, which are to meet our own climate um, uh, action and uh, emission targets over the next few years. Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much, Councillor Arnott. Um, Mrs Shaw, can you take us to a vote, please, with no further speakers? Thank you, Chair. Yes, option A is the policy aim. Option B, not to have a policy. Option C, to not allocate development land at the airport. Therefore, please press your green tick for option A, your red cross for option B, or raise your electronic hand for option C. Support for option A. Thank you all. Um, we now move on. It's not a, a policy number, but it's the ongoing development and potential expansion for Cranbrook. Um, now listed in the in the actual draft plan itself, we, we are currently moving forward with the, the draft DPD. So we've only got um, two. Well, it's either we go forward with the option A or we've got option A and B, which is option A is to have a local plan policy that supersedes the Cranbrook plan. Option B is to allocate land at the edges of Cranbrook that are outside the Cranbrook plan area. Ed, can I bring you in at this point? I was going to bring you in anyway, just to, to further clarify. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. I was, <clears throat> excuse me, I just realised there isn't a green box for this one for the preferred approach. Um, I think the preferred approach box should have been around paragraph 5.28. Um, so the preferred approach is... is uh, basically that the new local plan does not supersede the Cranbrook plan effectively. We, we cut a hole in the local plan for Cranbrook. The Cranbrook plan DPD moves forward as, as the plan for Cranbrook and wherever possible um, uh, sits outside of the local plan. Um, and just need to note that um, that does mean that um, the new local plan <coughs> will need to be revised and replaced before the end date of the Cranbrook plan fundamentally so we just need to be mindful of that in terms of the review so that's the preferred approach and then and then you've got what are listed as options a and b in the kind of orange box further down which is to have a local plan policy that does supersede the cranbrook plan so effectively the cranbrook plan we we take everything we it's in the cranbrook plan and we put it in the local plan and ditch the cranbrook plan um or we allocate, and option B is then to allocate land on the edges of Cranbrook that are outside of the Cranbrook plan area, which is sort of then the DPD plus, as it were, in terms of then revisiting Cranbrook as an area for further growth beyond the, what's allocated in the DPD. However, that's not currently our favoured approach, given all of the growth that's currently planned to come forward in the plan period in the DPD, um, which is going to take the plan period to deliver anyway, I suspect. Hopefully that makes sense, Chair. Apologies for the Yes, it does. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. Uh, Councillor Ryans, we'll go to you, please. Thank you, Chair. So, um, as you probably expect, I've got quite a lot to say about this innocuous looking little um, chapter. Um, I'm rather perturbed about the thought that we might be um, potentially giving the go ahead to annexing parts of other, other communities, um, which is effectively what we're doing. Now, all three communities, um, I can't remember where, where Chris Honiton is, whether it's local, whether it's neighbourhood plan. <laughs> but um, Broadcast is certainly at Reg 16. Rockby has a made plan. I can't quite remember where Wimple is with its plan. But um, what we're 
essentially doing if we okay annexing parts of our neighboring communities is just riding roughshod over their neighborhood plans without so much as consultation. And I'm really not happy about that. Um, I would remind everybody here that one of the previous local plan items is uh, to avoid coalescence of settlements. Um, if we give, I think we, if we give the go ahead to this, this, uh, this, this strategy as it's, as it's emerging in this way, we'd effectively be tearing up coalescence of settlements and saying, it's absolutely fine. Just go ahead, grab whichever bits of any neighboring settlements you want, build right up to whichever boundary they've picked for their, their particular settlements. And, um, you know, allocate as much land as you like. And I'm not happy with that at all because it needs to be done with consultation. Um, so I would really quite like to not, ha not have anybody voting on this today, if possible, because I'm not happy with it in its current shape. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rylance. I'll bring Ed in just to cover off the, the comments in a second, but Councillor Blakey, we'll go to you next, please. You're muted, Councillor Blakey. It was gonna happen to someone. Yeah, it had to be me. Um, yes, as, as Mr. Freeman has already alluded to, 5.28 is the salient point here. And um, uh, an enormous amount of time and effort has been put into the Cranbrook plan as it now is, and which will be uh, determined by the government inspector, hopefully in a matter of weeks now. Um, hope not months. Um, so for me, um, if we are going to um, vote on the basis of the proposal based around 5.28. I would certainly support that. Um, it has always been the view of uh, Cranbrook Town Council and Cranbrook residents and me as uh, uh, both a town and district councillor, at which point I should probably, um, just for the sake of probity, declare um, a personal interest in this. So officers, please note. Um, but for me, the, the, the plan as is, um, is the one that we should be proceeding with. As, as Mr. Freeman has said, it's, it's going to take years, probably decades to bring to fruition anyway. Um, so I would say um, option A, as it might have been, would be the one that uh, I will vote for. Thank you. Chair, if I may. Yes, Mrs. Shaw. I do apologise for butting in, but Councillor Blake here says he should he should declare a personal interest in this one. But could he clarify on what grounds he's he's declaring a personal interest? Thank you, Shelley. Is um, a Cranbrook Town Councillor. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Councillor Arnold. We go to you next. Thank you, Chair. I, I hugely enjoyed Councillor Rylance's. Um, Putin-style analogies of annexation of parts of uh, parts of East Devon into this. Well, I do do take this seriously. Um, I I find this very difficult. Um, again, uh, and hear Councillor Blakey very very loud on this. Um, I suppose the, the 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 question becomes, which was a question I would have asked last time, but I think there's an answer to it is about what we're doing about the future delivery vehicles for more Cranbrook and potentially the item we had before lunch for another town. Now, as I understand it, I think um, Andy Wood is working that up at the moment, but I, I, I'd be really interested to hear from Ed just a little bit on you know, how we can be reassured that um, you know, stuff, there's the potential for stuff being done a bit differently um, as potentially we, we say, on we go with, you know, the rest of Cranbrook. In government. Ed, I think he's teeing you up there to, to yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. So, yeah, um, uh, we've, the recruitment process, uh, the procurement process even um, for, for that piece of work looking at delivery vehicles has taken much longer than we envisaged uh, but we are we have now offered that uh, a, a contract to uh, a company who have lots of experience in this area of work to undertake that work I think we're currently in the standoff period and things so I can't say too much but um, so yes we're, we're on the verge of having consultants appointed to undertake that work uh, that commission is in, designed to help us in assessing options for a new community first and foremost um, and helping us understand the infrastructure requirements and, and how that would come forward 
um, and then moves on to looking at delivery vehicles in further detail in terms of uh, what is the best vehicle based on our vision for that place in terms of how that could be delivered, whether that's through a locally the development corporation, which is what I think myself and Andy have, have talked about in meetings before, and I think is, is based on what we know at the moment, our favoured approach, which would give us a great deal more control over how a new community comes forward in that area, um, in terms of how the land is delivered, who's delivering what, the sequencing, the delivery of infrastructure, uh, and potential to acquire and deliver land at, at lower values, which is fundamentally a lot of the problem with the viability and delivery of infrastructure is land values are driven up as soon as it's allocated for housing. Um, and we lose a lot of the value uh, that could have gone into delivering community infrastructure. Um, so that work is, is ongoing. I've actually prepared a report for the March meeting that actually talks about some of that in a bit more detail and the work program and uh, timescales and the, the uh, outputs of that work and how that fits into the, the local plan timetable moving forward. Um, so perhaps something we can pick up in more detail at, at the March meeting. Um, in terms of that, while I'm speaking, I'll just pick up on uh, Councillor Rylance's point. I mean, obviously, the preferred approach would just deliver the growth that's envisaged in the Cranbrook Plan DPD, which is obviously going forward and we hope to be adopting uh, later this year. Um, but I, I assume her point in terms of assessment coalescence is primarily in relation to option B, in terms of allocating additional land on the edges of Cranbrook that are outside the Cranbrook planet area. Um, and I think if members are not aware, there is a plan in the appendix of sites within site assessment, Western side of East Devon appendix 3B, uh, which shows the land that has currently been put forward beyond the uh, Cranbrook plan area. Uh, which, as Councillor Ryland says, does involve incurring into green wedge areas between some of the neighbouring settlements. Um, so just to draw members' attention to that plan, which I, I think is is the concern that Councillor Ryland is raising, which I think as officers we would share to some extent, uh, and, and that's why the sites that have been put forward in the Cranbrook plan are, are, have been the preferred sites, and I think it's going to take the majority of the next local plan period to deliver those sites. Uh, so to some extent... Um, it would be fairly pointless to uh, allocate a lot more in that area on the basis that there's only a finite amount I suspect that would ever come forward during that plan period in any event. Hopefully that's helpful, Chair. Very much so, thank you, Ed. Uh, Councillor Allen, uh, over to you. Yeah, just, just for clarification, it says we've rejected options A and option B, and effectively what we are saying uh, is that the proposal by officers is that we bring in the Cranbrook DPD as a component of the local plan. It's not very clear that that's what we're saying, but I think that is what we're saying. We want the Cranbrook DPD to become part of the local plan, and we've rejected the other two options. So could I put that proposal clearly forward so that we've got the, the clarity we need. We are wanting the Cranbrook DPD to become part of the local plan. Yeah, I think, Ed, just to clarify, that is what you were saying is you were leaving a space within the, the local plan that's not covered so that the Cranbrook DPD would cover that. Yes, I need to be careful on wording though, because I don't think what Councillor Allen said is, is exactly what I have in mind. Effectively, I'm saying that we would develop a new local plan that, that leaves the Cranbrook Plan DPD in place for the life of the new local plan. And basically the new local plan comes in and works around it. So there might be links across, but we don't seek to replicate the Cranbrook Plan in the new local plan. It sits there as its own development plan alongside the local plan. Does so that, that make sense? Yeah, so that would be option A for members. And then the ones now that are, um, are listed as A and B will become B and C respectively, okay? Yes. Um, Councillor Howe, we, we, we go to you next, please. Thank you. Um, we at some point need to have a discussion about neighbourhood plans because frequently today we've heard about neighbourhood plans and how we shouldn't incur into them. 
And if I sit here in my ward, my ward has two neighbourhood plans. So Kiss and George, Ebford and Kiss and Mary would be no development. So we can take out a load of allocations there. Farringdon has a neighbourhood plan. We can take out a load of development there. We've got to understand the local plan comes first. And then the neighbourhood plans have to conform with a local plan. But we have to have this sensible discussion at some point because there's been a number of neighbourhood plans recently made. And we're now talking about throwing those neighbourhood plans out because we're doing the local plan. We need a sensible and full discussion. I'm more than happy to support our neighbourhood plans. To me, that's the way it should be. But if we do that, we need to do it consistently throughout the district. And as such, there'll be an awful lot of development that just can't happen because of neighbourhood plans. Which means we've got to come back to the original discussion. We have to ignore neighbourhood plans or do something different and better. Um, and that's not a go at Eleanor or anyone else, Councillor Rylance or anything else, but it's the pragmatic thing we need to work out because of the number of neighbour plans we have in our district and the number of areas that are covered by them and the allocations that aren't part of those neighbourhood plans. So I really would welcome a sensible discussion about neighbourhood plans and the way forward with them, because at present, we keep bringing them up, all of us, We've all got our own neighbourhood plans in the in our wards and we want quite rightly to defend them. But the practicality is we can't, but we need to be consistent in how we're not, if you get my meaning. So I hope that makes some sense. Um, and I'm going with the new proposed option A, if you get my meaning, because quite honestly, what else can we do at this time? Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Howe. Councillor Ingham, over to you. Uh, thanks, Chair. I think it's crazy to even consider ignoring neighbourhood plans. You can ask them to be revised as soon as possible. That's fine. I'm sure they'd um, work with us. But uh, it, you can't ask a body of people to do something and then walk away when you, you don't like the answer that they came up with and then you approved. That's just not acceptable. Um, but back to the point, you know, I, I really think... Um, well, let's explained it very well. We have to keep this simple. There is a route out of this. He's made it quite clear. So let's keep it simple. Um, it's interesting, Councillor Blakey was quite clear on this at the onset of this debate. So I'm certainly very happy to um, support option A. And, and as we move forward, we have to respect um, neighbourhood plans and invite adjustments as, as required. You can't stamp on other people's opinions after you've sought them and approved them. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Councillor Ian. Councillor Ryan, it's over to you. Thank you, Chair. Just quickly, um, so I know there is a wide variety of expression of neighbourhood plans, and clearly some of them are from communities that are feeling very, um, very under attack, and they tend to be defensive neighbourhood plans. The Broadcast one, which is relevant, it's I'm not being parochial because it's, it is the West End of East Devon along with Cliff and Mary, is emphatically not of that ilk. Um, it's taken an extraordinarily long time to get it to Reg 16. It's been, it's been several years in gestation. It's taken probably thousands of hours of human, human hours. And we're at Reg 16. And the thought that it could be superseded within 18 months, it, frankly, it makes me quite nauseous. Um, it's it, it you have no idea how complicated it's been to juggle the conflicting demands of our residents and the local plan and the, the, the national planning framework it hasn't been a case of we just draw a line and say there's going to be no development here we have planned for a large amount of houses but houses that we we need to see delivered not the houses that persimmon or bovis homes or taylor wimpy think that they want to deliver um so you know i i, I agree very much with what Councillor Ingham just said you can't ride roughshod over neighborhood plans especially not ones that have had an enormous amount of resources and time and energy plowed into them they're not all parochial they're not all defensive they're not all we're not building anything ever anywhere within our boundary that's just not true um but you know uh, there's a lot of resources within the broadcast neighborhood plan for example that the local plan could inspire inspire itself from you know, we haven't just pulled these things out of the air. We haven't just gone and reckons. We've actually evidenced everything. It's, to my mind, it's going to be an extraordinarily good plan. And the thought that after seven years of gestation, it could start, you could be made obsolete by the stroke of a pen somewhere in an office just makes me feel quite ill, actually. Sorry, I'm still- Thanks very you know, much. Settlement. 
Yeah, Councillor Morris, yeah. thank you for that. Um, just trying to focus members back onto the task at hand right now. We're not discussing neighbourhood plans. We're discussing the on de ongoing development and potential for the expansion of Cranbrook, which I know touches a few of the neighbourhood plans. But let's move back to the policy at hand. Councillor Allen, over to you. Yes, I just wanted to ask if we could move to a vote on the new option A and if uh, Shirley could potentially make it crystal clear what it actually is, because I've got confused now when people talk about option A and option B and, and the new option A and so on. I think what we said was that the new option A is focused on the DPD for Cranbrook. Obviously, Ed's got some finessing of the wording. Uh, we need to be clear what we're actually agreeing to, please. Yeah. So, Mrs Shaw, oh, over to you to sum up, please. And can the question be put? Members, we have the, as clarified by Ed, in paragraph 5.28, a new option A. That is, that the new local plan will not replicate the policies that are currently within the Cranbrook, proposed Cranbrook DPD, keep it separate. The new option B is to have a local plan policy that supersedes the Cranbrook, Cranbrook plan. And the new option C is to allocate land on the edges of Cranbrook that are outside the Cranbrook plan area. So, Please, members, press your green tick if you're in support of the new option A, your red cross if you're in support of the new option B, and raise your electronic hand if you're in support of the new option C. Support for the new option A. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we then move on to at the bottom of page 79. Strategic Policy 14, Green Infrastructure in the Cliff Valley Regional Park. Uh, the policy intent is uh, option A or option B. It's a currently rejected alternative options to the way that um, the planning of the green infrastructure of the Cliff Valley Park is to not consider park boundaries and potential for changes, including parts for expansion. I'll open that up to the committee or if there's no, wish, no one wishing to speak. No, we'll just take it straight to a vote then, Mrs Shaw, please. Unfortunately, you're yes, <laughs> I don't think I need to uh, repeat those options as set out by the chair. Option A, please press your green tick. Option B, press your red cross, please, members. Members are in support of option A. Thanks very much. Um, and then we move on to strategic policy 15, which is the development next to the M5 and north of Topsham. So, uh, option A is the, the policy intent as listed. Uh, option B is to not allocate land for development. And Councillor Howe, we start with you, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Another part of my ward. Um, this is outside of all um, neighbourhood plans, both neighbourhood plans covering the area. In fact, one neighbourhood plan in particular is only a few years old. Um, this isn't included in it, but the reality is this is as far removed from the villages of Clisson, George and Edford as you could be in their boundary. Um, it is Topsham. It is Exeter. Although Topsham is absolutely up in arms about it, but that's a different matter altogether. Um, that's Exeter for you. There is so much of this that I actually want to support um, because it is right close to a town centre, Topsham Town. Um, but it is quite a distance from Topsham Town and the access is not brilliant. So we need to be really careful about, again, the master planning of this and how it goes forward, if it goes forward at all. Um, so I'm cautiously, very cautiously supportive of it, um, bearing in mind the facilities around. But, you know, we do have to sort out a number of things, including the cycle trails that should go along these roads and everything else. Um, it's not as simple as anyone thinks. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Howe. Councillor Bailey, I'd like to bring you in now. Thank you. Um, where, 
And where's the plan, please, that shows where this is? I know it says um, um, uh, indicative boundary shown at this stage. Is it possible to share that? Or maybe everybody else knows exactly where it is. 84. Um, 84, thank you. Ah. Is it CLG02? It's so, all of them, isn't it? Three, yeah, three, yeah. Three, yeah three. All, sorry, Ed, yeah, come in. <laughs> through you chair um so yeah there's a number of sites that have been put forward within in this area um, and we sort of outlined them on that plan in a, in a red dotted line to sort of show the the total area that um could potentially come forward um will be the clg08 uh as well beyond that but i think that's scored lower there's also um i should say an appendix three B, I think it is, um, that I'm looking at, uh, is the scoring of, of those sites as well. Um, so, um, but this is something that was, um, just to give you some context, was looked at uh, through the GESP as well in terms of a joint development in this area that extends south into some land in Exeter, that some of which has already, is already coming forward and being built out at the moment, in fact, um, over the boundary into Exeter. And together, they could potentially form um, an area of about 1,500 homes um, between the East Devon sites and the Exeter site. Um, and the view was that that, that, that then uh, it became of a scale where it could deliver a level of services and facilities to support that community in terms of a community hall, potentially primary school, um, and better public transport links, et cetera, to make a sustainable settlement, really, um, in, in that area, but also with close links, as Councillor Howe has said, into Topsham uh, to the south, which obviously has a, a very good range of uh, services and facilities as well. Um, so really, that was the thinking behind this um, Hopefully, uh, the plan on uh, page 84 in the working draft gives you the, the sort of extent within East Devon. Unfortunately, I just realised we don't have a plan that sort of shows you the, the full extent going into the Exeter area as well. Um, and then, as I say, there's the, the site scoring, which is perhaps a more detailed plan of each pass than they're scoring on pages 10 and 11 within uh, the appendix. I think it's appendix 3. 3B, yes, site assessment, western side of East Devon. Hopefully that helps, Chair. It does, thanks, Ed. Councillor Ingham, we'll come to you now, please. Thanks, Chair. Uh, looking at page 84, uh, you know, if I have reservations, I'm glad to see, you know, that, that there's the... Um, 08 is not included. I do have some reservations about CLG 24. The reason is it makes perfect sense to me to, if you are going to develop, if, if you can um, near to uh, where jobs exist, that's a great idea. And it's right by the motorway. Um, and I would say between that road and the motorway, I'd say that's fair game. That makes absolute sense to me. Uh, and you ruin as little of the countryside as possible. So I'm not impressed with CLG 08 and any others, um, but I do like the idea that's being presented, the vast majority of it. Um, but uh, is it appropriate, uh, Mr. Freeman, to question uh, 24 and 20? Do, do you see what I'm saying? Um, because then you've got this nice wedge between the motorway and that road and nothing as you're driving out of Topson to the blue ball, nothing on the right hand side. You've kept it all between the road and the motorway. Um, it's such a shame that uh, this didn't come before, uh, forward before the Topson um, gap being filled in, which is, you know, gone. Um, but this to me does make sense. And so I'd be supporting that. I'd like to hear what Ed says about should we restrict it just slightly? Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Councillor Ingham. Councillor Rylands, over to you. Just a quick question, but it, uh, am I right in thinking that area is unbelievably flood prone? It's actually where the cliffs run through. 
Um, so obviously it wouldn't flood the existing houses, but it's very close up to the back fence of the existing houses, I would think. I mean, I, the presence of so many drains kind of gives it away. Um, it's essentially drained land reclaimed from, from, from floodplain, isn't it? So uh, uh, CLGE8 surely can never be a, a possibility. And, you know, I would question whether it's a very good idea to start hard, hard covering a lot of those bits as well, because at the moment, presumably, they're capturing quite a lot of water before it heads into the Clist floodplain. Just my two piece worth. I know, I mean, I just know how uh, horrendous the Clist can be at times, because living upstream from it, we see it, it it's, it's very moody. Yeah, okay. Um, we'll take Councillor Howe next, and then we'll go to, to Ed just to cover off all the questions made so far. So Councillor Howe, over. Thank you. Um, I, I actually agree with um, Councillor Ingham on CLGE24. I don't think that can be delivered, or at least part of it, because of that very reason. Um, answering uh, Councillor Rylance's point, most of this is above the floodplain. You're right, CLGE08, absolutely, I don't believe, could be ever delivered. Um, but the big problem with this is Blue Ball Pumping Station. This feeds right into a pumping station for sewage that is at capacity, as we all know. And that needs, has to be a serious consideration for all of us that has the problems of sewage flowing in our streets. Yes, we know Southwest Water are working on it, and I know we are working actively with Southwest Water, but this allocation needs to be in reserve, if you get my meaning, until Southwest Water has sorted out its problems. Um, so I, it's just, a, a, the other cautionary tale is it's, this is a single track road that runs through this. So I assume as part of this development, Mr. Freeman, we would be looking for a, a, an expansion of that road um, because it's just impossible to go along it, cycle along it or anything else at present without getting virtually put into the ditches or the hedge in particular. Um, it is unsafe for cyclists and motor vehicles to be on the same road at the same time. And that needs sorting, absolutely. So those cautionary tales, I suppose. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Howe. I think I totally agree. It's not something that we'd be sticking straight into our five-year land supply, um, but it's something maybe for, for later in the latter parts of, of the plan period, if it was to come forward. Um, Councillor Arnott, we'll, we'll go to you now, please. Thank you, Chair. I thought, not, well, everything that everybody said made, has made a lot of sense. I think particularly Councillor Ingham, uh, and I bow to his local knowledge. I did used to live in Topsham. It's a bit of a misnomer, isn't it? Land north of, I mean, north of Topsham. I mean, this is fringes of Exeter, really. It's it's it all kind of, uh, you know, I quote the, the M5. That That's what it is. And that's my main worry with this. Really concur with Councillor Ingham. It's such a pity that land that was actually north of Topsham, that's to the, I suppose, south of this, I think was overdeveloped. And that is a pity and that has affected the area. This is almost a no man's land, isn't it, at the moment? But my consideration would be, um, well, how can I put this? For the sort of health and well-being of people living so close to so much traffic noise, um, so I'd really want to see some serious work in the master planning in looking at, you know, mitigating that um, as much as as much as possible. Perhaps by the time it's built, we'll all be on, you know, personalised hovercrafts or something. There won't be any traffic noise, but it is always a worry. But other than that, and, and taking the points that have been made that perhaps it's a little bit over ambitious in one or two of those sites um, and good to see 08 not in there. Um, Yes, I think this is this is a, a good proposal to try and move forward with. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ed, can I bring you in at this point just to cover off anything that you, you wish? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Yeah, just to confirm what uh, Councillor Arnott's just said, um, CLGE underscore 08 is not proposed to be allocated. It was put forward, but it, as uh, Councillor Rylands and others have, have noted, it is that is within the flood zone. Um, and so couldn't come forward. Uh, the other sites are not uh, in the flood zone, um, so hence they've scored quite highly as, as level, level and accessible sites. Um, I, I think um, 
certainly improvements to cycleway and footways would be needed. Um, I think the development that's currently being built out to the south of this in Exeter has a cycleway and footway being delivered alongside the road um, as part of that. Uh, and so I think we would be looking to link into that and carry that on on through to keep that separation and enhance those facilities that then it can extend south to give good access into Topsham. Uh, and, and obviously there's also quite good uh, cycle links from here along Old Ryden Lane and into the city and to Sandy Park from there as well. Um, so it's joining all of that up and making sure you've got those good uh, cycle links and footway links through. Um, and, you know, worth bearing in mind in terms of the southern parcels, um, I think they, they actually work quite well and link quite well in because that boundary, that southern boundary of CLG underscore zero two and CLG underscore 24 is our administrative boundary with Exeter. So what you're not seeing is the Exeter developments coming forward south of that. Um, Final point was just the uh, traffic noise. Yes, I think we are quite mindful of that in terms of, of noise from, from the M5, and that would obviously need to be mitigated as part of this to ensure that noise levels weren't uh, overly dominant or intrusive to, to residents of this area. But um, I think it can all be made to work, um, but obviously those are detailed issues we'd have to work through if members are, are happy with the principle at this stage. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for that, Ed. Councillor Allen, over to you. Thank you. Um, taking up Councillor Arnott's suggestion of uh, personalised hovercrafts, I think that might be extremely useful if we go ahead with this development. The current understanding of what climate change is going to do is can be up to an increase of 20% of rainfall or more. I don't know. Um, who knows? But what is certain is that the Clist River does present serious flooding issues and may eventually get very much worse in this little patch. So I, I can't really go along with this unless a personalised hovercraft scheme is put into effect. Thank you very much, Councillor Allen. Um, Councillor Bailey, over to you. Thank you. Um... It's a strange shaped site, I think, very linear, very, very much alongside uh, a very big road. Um, and I'm not quite sure, sure, Ed, where the site that's being developed at the moment is in relation to that. And I, I note that there's going to be a master plan, but it's always really difficult, I think, to put, you know, to progress things like this when you don't actually know you know what the what the overall um, approach is going to be. So that you know what is the infrastructure going to be, um, and yeah, I I kind of have mixed feelings about this really, particularly because of the sewage as well. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bailey, Councillor Ingham. Thank you ever so much for letting me come back, Chair, because. Uh, I did answer my questions, but not with the answers um, I expected. Um, yes, I take on board how he was trying to envisage, as he says, how this fits in with Exeter and, uh, and uh, what they're planning to do. Um, I just want to mention and highlight poss a possibility, Chair, in my opinion, where I still disagree with Ed. You can have, I would say, half of 24, um, but I still come back to this idea. Look at that map on 84, please. I would say to the east of that road, and I would say, yeah, make that road much wider. Yes, before you start building, make the road wider. And then east of that road, how about temporarily until, you know, 2040, that that would be a green wedge. Um, then we are defining that we're allowing Exeter to expand. We're accommodating uh, residential development right next to jobs, but we're not going to uh, trash the Devon countryside just to hit figures and because it's easy to do so. Uh, 
Now is not the time to decide that, Chair, I realise, but I think it's important that we say we can accommodate quite a lot, but we should draw a line, and sometimes that's with the start of a green wedge. Just something to bear in mind as we move forward, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Ingham. Um, I think with no other speakers, uh, I'd go to Mrs Shaw to take us to a vote, please. Thank you, Chair. Yes, members, two options. Option A is the policy aim is set out, and option B is not is to not allocate the land for development. Please press your green tick if you're in support of option A, and your red cross if you're in support of option B. Thank you. I'm just waiting for the um, votes to come in. Support is shown for option A, green tick. Thank you very much. Um, I think with that, that, that pretty much brings us to the end of the, the policy intent of what we're looking to do today. All the rest of the items will hopefully be brought back to officers at the next available meeting. What I would like to do now, though, is to open it up to members uh, to get a bit more engagement on if there is any policies that we feel that officers may have missed out of the plan or anything that we would like to further feed into the plan. Um, just for the, uh, a, a short amount of time um, to hopefully bring back some further work later. So, Councillor Howe, we'll start with you, please. Well, I think we need to discuss neighbourhood plans. I think we need a direction to give our officers. Uh, Councillor Rylance on the previous item made a real good plea for Broadclist, but Broadclist isn't alone on that. Farringdon's only just completed. Chris and George in my ward is only a two years old and many others are currently just being completed as we see the emails. We need to give officers a steer into how we believe we should work with neighbourhood plans and go forward in that. And I, I think leaving this open to officers' interpretation or demands um, is bucking the, well, it's, it's just, you know, us sidestepping it and we need to give a decision. Um, and I just hope we can have that discussion. Thank you. So thanks very much, Councillor Howe. Councillor Skinner, over to you. Well, thank you, Chair. And as we've got <clears throat> just a few moments, I suppose, to uh, deliberations of where we are and, and trying to pull stuff together, I think is a really good idea. You suggested us just chuck into the pot about what people are feeling, where we are, where we're going, what direction. And I've been very keen and... Um, over many years now to look at how we deliver sport and sport uh, sport facilities. And not only the sport facilities, but on a grander scale, on a regional scale, um, but also delivering what would be the growth of what would have been uh, Exeter um, University and the growth of what could be Exeter rd &E, the hospital, and the growth of the hospital working uh, with the university and its um, expansions of the things that they wanted to do. When I was in post and some of these things, they don't particularly go away. They just sit there in the plans. And I think we've got a wonderful opportunity to deliver something really exceptional on a regional scale in our patch for not just here, but as for the other areas. And it's, it's where, where one really gets the opportunity to drop that into something like a plan such as this as a local plan that is a real forward thinking investment which brings embraces both education um, and, and brings the university plus the Exeter College and I think Exeter College punches above its pay grade the link up between the university and the college and the links of high tech business which we touched on earlier talking about Exeter Science Park and talking about the growth of those businesses and looking at how the expansion between that and how our, where do we want to be? What do we want to be? So you see the Northern Powerhouse, you see the West Midlands engine. And I can only go back to when I was in post that what we have in our natural environment is, is our natural environment. And we have the seaside, we have two national parks. There's only two, one county in the whole of the country with two national parks. We're in it. We've got a large area in our patch, AONB. Our natural environment is, is our catalyst of, of who we are and what we are, and it's our DNA. And how we work with that with working with people, and we, we embrace both 
developments of housing, education, young people going into the future and embracing all of that natural environment. We're very, very lucky where we live. We have to have nearly got almost everything. We've got everything, sandy beaches, stony beaches. We've got everything. And local plans that we're doing now, when we talk about local 20-year development plans and then working to the next plan, which will work to the next plan after that, it's absolutely vital where we put things. Because if we don't put things, it's rather like a jigsaw. If we don't put things in the right place, the jigsaw just, just doesn't work further down the road. So I think what I would like to have an opportunity at some point to engage with a strategic planning team on some of the thoughts and ideas that I'd had and worked within some of my group on very early stages about how we can progress some of these ideas forward and see whether or not both with the, with the members and with the officers that some of the ideas that are, are really quite expansive ideas are actually deliverable and work within these plans as we're going forward. Because if we don't set these things in place now, the opportunities get lost and if you put the wrong things in the wrong place, you then can't deliver on those aspirations because the opportunities are gone. So I think this is an opportunity here and now to be able to land those ideas, whether it's an informal or, or formal way in whichever you want to see it done, Chair. I'm not talking directly to you through how you may see this as an idea and progressively going forward. The thing I don't have knowledge of at this moment in time is that obviously when you're in post and in position, the leader, the deputy leader, and yourself as strategic, strategic lead and the economy portfolio holder, there are many discussions that take place. And I know the leader spoke earlier around the team, Devon, and some of the things that were coming forward with some of those ideas and how that working with the other authorities is absolutely key. And I don't want to get into the debate around guess whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. That, that ship has sailed for the moment. But what I will say is this is that the actual collaborative working with other authorities is absolutely key if we want to keep district councils going. Because if we don't want to keep those district councils going, we'll end up with a unitary authority because we don't seem to be able to work with each other. I think we can. I think we work neighbourly. And I think that the, the gifts of some fractions of between one authority and another, working with Mid-Devon, Teenbridge, and certainly Exeter, and then expanding that out, that this is the rock for the whole of this particular region. We're the rock here, right here. And the reason why we're that rock is because we're on the end of the motorway. We've got Exeter Airport and we spoke early, only earlier, did we agree? And many members agreed how important Exeter Airport was and is to this region. It's actually a global factor. And as the world grows and the world gets more, bigger, smaller in the way of its definition of people being able to both travel, not just through physically traveling, but traveling through the internet that has moved on in the last 20 years has been phenomenal. And how we pick those things up and make them work. And there's one particular aspect of, of um, which is close to my heart actually, with, with, of education, which doesn't get touched on, hasn't been touched on any of this. And it was Bicton College. Bicton College and agriculture and its agricultural working. And that agriculture, we talk about that our environment and our rural environment is very much based around agriculture. And the linkage between now and looking forward with the climate change and the climate change control and working with agriculture, the farming and the rural businesses as to how that engages with the lifestyles that we intend to lead as we go forward is absolutely vital. And Bicton College has never been mentioned yet. And I just find... I just find that all the things that we do, and when you've been doing this long enough, I've been doing this 22 years, I don't want to bore anybody. But when you've been doing this long enough, you actually get to understand that all the things that we're doing actually go back to what we're doing for the future for our children and our grandchildren. I was born in East Devon, I've lived all my life. What happens in this area really matters to me, and I know it matters to many, many people on this authority. That's why they're here. That's why they're putting in the time and effort. It isn't because of how much we get paid for doing this. This is because we love what we do. We, live the, we love the area where we want to live. And the things and the decisions that we're making and coming forward today matter to us and matter to us all. So I say to you, Chair, through you, that I don't know how to, how or when something like this could actually, given an opportunity, perhaps for either me or, or our group or however you want to work, I don't really mind. But I do want to have the opportunity to land some ideas about the possibilities of what could be. And all I can tell you is this, 
that when I was in post and I spoke to all of the people that were from the other authorities, people like Dr. Sally Basker, people like the university, Mark Goodwin and the like, Devon County Council, when I landed the ideas and dropped the ideas on businesses such as Oxygen House and all these other people that wanted to be part of, maybe being, being prospectively a part of something like this happening, everybody was on board, from Lord Courtney right down to whoever. And when you talk to people in the street of delivering something, a real aspiration, not just the usual housing, employment, land, poke them here, poke them there, which is, if that's all that we're going to get, let's have none if that was a choice. Just leave it as it is, because I actually quite like it as it is, to be honest. But that's not a choice. We don't have that as a choice. We have to deliver. So let's be aspirational. Let's have an opportunity of some ideas to put some things in, not just follow, follow the dictate of a plan. We as councillors, the officers have to deliver us a plan to say, this is the things we've got to do. We as the councillors have the vision to be able to shape that plan in the way that we want to see it happen for the benefit of not only ourselves, but our children and our grandchildren, and also never forgetting the people who visit our area and go away and go, wow, what a wonderful place to be. That's what's important to me. And I'd love to have that opportunity to be able to land that at some point. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Skinner. I think it is uh, more of a discussion for offline. Um, we'll have the, uh, more than happy to have those initial um, conversations. Uh, and then maybe bring back some actual firm uh, re recommendations to committee. Um, Councillor Allen, we'll come to you now, please. Yeah, well, you did want to open up the can of worms, didn't you? <laughs> um, of course, of course. Uh, my, my particular hang up about this uh, local plan so far is the need for some very clear housing policies on disability and frail elderly people. And it is enshrined in uh, uh, category C for nursing homes. But what it isn't is in terms of design approaches for housing for everyday living. And so I think that really there needs to be some attention to criteria for housing put clearly into the uh, plan. Now, that means including things like, do we want passive house standards? Do we want to make sure that there is enough room inside a house to move a wheelchair around? It's those kind of simple, straightforward, and maybe not very easy, and certainly uh, uh, economically sensitive issues. But if 70% of the growth of our population is forecast by Ed Freeman's people to be over 65s, and we ignore the whole issue of disability and progression so that we can find places where the frail elderly can live at home, which is current um, NHS policy, then we're missing the point. So I would love to see a clear policy put forward, which would take account of design components for the housing and specify clearly what it is we want. There are national standards, there are international standards. We haven't included them other than for specification of nursing homes. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Councillor Allen. Um, Ed, I think it'd be useful. What I'll do, I'll take a few speakers at a time and then come to you just to cover off. So you've obviously got neighbourhood plans, um, the grand grand um, themes of Councillor Skinner and design codes and standards um, by Councillor Allen. Do you have any comments just on those? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I mean, coming back to neighbourhood plans, I mean, the, the legislation is, is clear that... Um, the local plans at a district level uh, takes precedent fundamentally um, over the neighbourhood plans. Um, and that's because it has a different role fundamentally. It's about allocating strategic levels of growth to meet our housing need. Um, and that's what it will need to do. Um, 
that doesn't mean that we should ignore neighbourhood plans and ride, ride roughshod over them. Obviously, we need to have regard to the neighbour plans and the views of those communities. Um, but equally, we need to reconcile that with meeting the needs of the district um, in the most appropriate and sustainable locations. And those two things are going to be in conflict. Uh, I can't see any way around that. Um, if, if we are to progress a local plan that meets our housing needs, uh, and is going to be found sound at examination, then it is inevitable that it is going to be in conflict with one or more of our neighbourhood plans. Um, and I think it's, to my mind, it's about uh, having a process of good communication with neighbourhood planning groups, help them take us on that journey with us, help them to understand where we're going, why we're going in that direction, um, and, and um, have regard particularly to perhaps some of the more detailed aspects of the neighbour plans which we can help to meet in terms of uh, sites being allocated in, in those areas even if they don't specifically want the allocation, ensuring that uh, some of the principles of that neighbourhood plan are, are delivered through that approach uh, and it may be that it can deliver some of the infrastructure uh, and other um, things that the neighbourhood plan uh, aspires to deliver for that community. So. Uh, I don't think it's a case of riding rush all over neighbourhood plans. We do need to obviously work with them and with the neighbourhood planning groups and communities that have produced them. But there is inevitably going to be a conflict. But the legislation is quite clear how that conflict uh, is, is dealt with in that the, the local plan takes, um, takes precedent fundamentally. Um, in terms of other issues, um, uh, Councillor Skinner mentioned that the, the sports hub and facilities. I know that was was looked at, uh, at at guest stage to some extent. I think that comes into potentially, if if we're having a new community in that part of the district, what is its role? How do we deliver deliver facilities within that space? Does it does it have a wider role in terms of um, uh, a regional role or a focus in terms of facilities, sports or otherwise that it, it could deliver given its location on the main uh you know trunk road network um that's something that i think would need to be looked at through sort of visioning of any new community which i think if that's the route members are minded to go down is is part of this commission i've been talking about some of the latter stages are about you know if members are wanting to pursue a new community visioning of that work master planning of it uh and and those sorts of ideas could potentially play a role in in terms of that um bicton college is, is a good point that um perhaps does need to be picked up on uh, or looked at in more detail. I know land at Bicton College was put forward in the Gila back in 2017, I think, for, for housing purposes. Um, whether we want to do, uh, which I don't think we felt, well, I think we had concerns, shall we say, about um, it coming forward for housing. Um, but um, whether there's a need for policy provision in terms of supporting its uh, continued use for educational purposes, um, it's perhaps something I need to take away and have a look at, I think, um, and, and perhaps more broadly in terms of um, education as, as, a, as a part of this and how we support education provision um, and particularly further education through, through the local plan. Uh, finally, I think Councillor Allen was talking about housing standards and accessibility standards. I, I, from my point of view, I think we have addressed it in, in the Work and Draft Local Plan. There is policy 39 accessibility standards uh, within the plan. Uh, we've also got policies about zero carbon development and the nationally um, described space standards as well. Um, so I'd be interested to have uh, Councillor Allen's detailed thoughts on, on why those don't uh, tick the box, as it were, from his perspective and, and are, are insufficient so that we can take that forward and, and look at how we can improve on, on uh, the intent of policy, at least, that's, that's in the plan as, as currently drafted. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for that. I really appreciate it. Councillor Allen, can I ask that you do that uh, via email or offline and outside of the meeting, just so that we can obviously move this further on at pace? I've got five more speakers. I'll take these five uh, and then I think we'll, we'll call it a day after that. So, Councillor Ingham, I'll start with you, please. Thanks, Chair. I just want to remind Ed that uh, we, we have discussed, you'll remember, Chair, uh, the idea of um, giving planning permission to an outstanding planning application. Um, ordinarily, that, that's, that may be great in open countryside, but I still think we should be saying, where possible, no to that happening in, say, for example, a green wedge, where we're trying to prevent coalescence, because suddenly that house gets it, then you'll get five or six applications of 
outstanding houses and your whole intent of, of, of a green wedge can be um, you know, ripped to pieces. I'll, I'll leave that, Chairman. I don't expect Ed to comment on that. I just hope he remembers that he said, oh, we might do something. Uh, the, the other one, I, I want to um, just add to what Councillor Skinner was saying. Um, years ago, not that long far, actually, I, I did an MSc and I, I, I was sponsored by my employers. So that when it came to the thesis, they explained to me exactly what I was going to choose to do that. And I had about two or three seconds to agree with them, which I did. And, and then what that was about was selecting where is a good place or the perfect location to build a new factory or a center of excellence for research, okay? And I had to go and do loads of research on this. And um, I came across several papers, one in particular, that said, uh, and this was in, in America, uh, and they had evidence of where it succeeded and where it failed. And what you had to do is you wanted a new center of excellence. There were a couple prerequisites. One, you had to have um, a youthful access to a youthful population because you wanted students and graduates to start working for you. And you had to have, because of that, um, close proximity to a, a top university. And surprise, surprise, we've got a top university, haven't we? We really have. We're so lucky how Exeter's progressed. And uh, uh, as councillors mentioned, you know, Exeter College is not to be sneezed at as support. So the reason I mentioned this to, and of course, the youth culture associated with those, the reason why that's so important is, um, with regards to our local plan, is do we aspire to have centres of excellence in the science park? the Sky Park, the airport, uh, all those business centres on the periphery of Exeter? Of course we do. So um, if that's true, it's also potentially going to be uh, true for what Councillor uh, Skinner was saying. Now, I'm not saying he's right. I'm just saying that you need to have the right mix for success. And some of those ingredients are right on our doorstep. Now, I'm not saying we've got to take them, but I'm saying we really should appreciate the fact that they exist. And it's up to us to plan them in or plan them out. But we will be judged because it will be in black and white whether we succeed or we fail. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Councillor Ingham. Councillor Pratt, we'll come to you now, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, if I could just mention again, uh, neighbourhood plan. Um, the Ottery St. Mary uh, neighborhood plan was uh, made in 2018. And it was good to hear from Roger Giles today, who was on that committee with me. And I think Jess Bailey, you were on the committee with, with, with us. And uh, the, um, the uh, letter that uh, Roger uh, mentioned, which I believe did go to Ed, um, from the uh, West Hill Parish Council and the Ottery St. Mary Council dealt with uh, a conflict between the neighbourhood plan provisions and uh, one of the uh, proposals put forward for a development uh, in green, on green land. Um, so th that, that's, a, that's a conflict on that case, which uh, there are going to be many conflicts, in fact, between the neighbourhood plan and the uh, and the local plan, but where you have established uh, uh, neighbourhood plans, uh, you all know what happens on, on uh, getting to that stage with all the public consultation, the uh, the um, the public meetings, and then finally on the, the draft, which is uh, put then to uh, a vote for the public. That is uh, something which you can't ignore, Ed, and uh, I think it's something which is going to test your, uh, your mind quite uh, considerably in the next few months. Um, but uh, that, that, that's a point on the neighbourhood plan. There, there are going to be uh, conflicts there. Um, the second point we did mention uh, today about uh, the EDDC uh, position regarding housing 
And I, I know you weren't quite sure what the position was there, and I expect you will look it up. But uh, it's important that EDDC take a, 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 a step forward in this uh, local plan. I mean, they own land. Uh, I know there are two sites uh, in uh, Seaton where uh, um, the, the, which is owned by the, 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 the council, and that can be used for res residential uh, use. Uh, and uh, they may wish to, to build themselves on, on, that si on those sites, uh, or they may want to go in with a, a housing association, but there is po possibilities there. And there must be other possibilities regarding commercial land. And, and that needs to be looked into a bit further, uh, Ed, in my view. Um, and uh, the, that, that's, I think, the, the two main things that I, I'm concerned about. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Pratt. Um, I think with the further call for sites, hopefully um, Tim Child and other officers will be putting some, some land forward into the next healer. Um, Councillor Bailey, we'll go to you next, please. Thank you. Um, if I had to sum up my thoughts in one word, it would be, and my concerns and where I think we absolutely cannot lose focus, it's sustainability. And I think that we're being buffeted around with our very constrained district. Um, and if we're not careful, we'll lose, lose sight of sustainability. Um, and I've seen that in the, a lot of the sites that have come forward. And I think we really need to remain focused on sustainability. And in order to do that, we've agreed a call for sites. We need to be really specific and we need to get sustainable sites to come forward in accordance with the hierarchy of settlements. That's absolutely essential. We cannot have sprawling sites all over the countryside. Um, and that would be contrary to the MPPF. And I'm concerned that actually we're, we're distancing ourselves from the MPPF, which recognises the intrinsic beauty of the countryside. And linked in with that, I'm really, really concerned that we haven't done more proactively with the um, with the or with the brownfield sites. And I do mean sites that are in operation as well. And I think that we need to take a more proactive approach to redeveloping brownfield sites rather than just taking the easy option and just uh, encroaching further and further into the East Devon countryside. So um, I'd like to see a report. Um, on how, and I know that we've had the urban capacity study, but I think that that was only in relation to residential development. Um, and I don't, and I don't think, believe that we've actually, um, as Ed said earlier, um, sorry, my phone's ringing. Um, I don't believe that we've looked at our industrial estates or done anything with our with the commercial operators to see how we can shape the future of our district by not incurring in encroaching into the countryside. So I'd really like to see that done. Um, and the final thing that I would like to see is, I think, well, I find it quite difficult, Ed, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's difficult to find on, uh, on our website, a local plan page. I mean, I think there is stuff there, but what I'd like to see is a full set, a full suite of documents um, in one place, because what I'm finding is I'm having to trawl through previous um, agendas to try and find studies and documents. And I think that that will become more and more the case um, as as the um, uh, local plan progresses and just one final point again on sustainability I'm really worried about the fact that we've got still got sites in there that have been turned down at appeal and yes circumstances may have changed but I think there's a real risk that we're we're um, we're kind of you know allowing those to be in there on the on the basis that we think that they are acceptable and what happens if we find that they're not so I want to see more development in brownfield already developed sites and I want to see sustainable development. I do not want to see personally fields in the countryside, you know, just because that's that's easy. Thank you. Thanks very much. I think you make a great point towards the end about uh, the website. There is a lot of, well, we have an emerging local plan page, um, but it, there is only the introduction, the issues and options statement and the draft plan. There's not the evidence base, and that is something Ed, I think we can maybe discuss offline about introducing it so that there is all of the, the background information available to, to members of the public without having to go through each individual agenda. Um, 
Councillor Faithful, I have said I'm only taking two more members and then we're, we're going to call the meeting. So I w unfortunately, I won't be calling you. Um, Ed, can I come to you now just to cover off the, the speakers that have spoken? We'll then take the last two speakers of the day. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. So, um, yeah, just to pick up on um, uh, Councillor Pratt's point about East Devonland. I mean, obviously, we have been constituting this housing task force to... Um, to, to uh, put the resources in place to look at EDDC land uh, and what's available to come forward. So um, and I know um, Joe Garfoot, who's heading that up, was in the meeting this morning and listening in. So I'm sure she heard your, your comments and others on that and we'll be taking that, that forward to try and identify sites that we could be maximising in terms of EDDC land. All I can tell you is at the moment very little East Devon land has been put forward um, and that's something we do need to work on and understand what land assets we control that might be able to be brought into this equation as part of the, the forthcoming call for sites. So I'll also be liaising with Joe on, on that. Um, in terms of brownfield sites, as I said earlier, I certainly agree to the brownfield sites first approach and we do need to go back to the urban capacity study and see what opportunities that might uh, present uh, and whether or not we can contact some of the landowners in that. That, that did look at, um, I think, to some extent of the industrial sites and obviously we need to be mindful that, um, you know, we don't develop our industrial sites for housing and lose the jobs uh, that, that are on those sites. We need to... Um, protect those sites uh, for industry for employment purposes as well whether there's potential to have residential spaces on upper floors or or, or associated with them or uh, through more intensive use of those areas uh, we, we can perhaps look at um, and certainly take the point about uh, the local plan uh, website pages we do uh, in planning policy team meetings have a regular item looking at the website so I'll pick that up at the next uh, meeting obviously with, with you chair as well in terms of your ideas for that to ensure that that's uh, kept up to date and improved. Thank you chair. Thanks very much for that Ed. Councillor Moulding over to you please. Yes thank you chair. Um, now I want to really understand and probe the function of deliverability because today we've looked at a number of uh, uh, very um, uh, interesting and exciting projects, Topsham, uh, extension to the Science Park and Exeter Airport, the development of a second new town. And for in order for all these projects to be deliverable, major injections of infrastructure will be required. And we all know that that comes at a considerable cost. We also know that it is unlikely that SIL will be able to pay for all of it or even a fairly small percentage of it. And so I go back to the funding towards the cost of the relief road in Axminster. And remember that three years ago, we were almost about to secure the funding to enable delivery of the relief road. And then government changed the rules and the grant that we anticipated to deliver the relief road was changed and it was to become a loan. Now, that is something we're going to work towards. And our Member of Parliament is currently working on this with Homes England. And so I therefore cannot just ditch the proposed urban extension of Axminster on the basis of current deliverability. Because I've seen no um, a project uh, uh, requirements for the development of the second new town and whether it's deliverable. Is it deliverable? I don't know that Ed can tell me that at the moment, but it seems as if it's going to be included in the local plan. Whereas the Axminster Urban Extension, where developers have got options on all the land, uh, the plans are all in place, but it's current deliverability. And therefore, I just want to understand where we are with that, because for me, it doesn't make sense. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Moulding. Um, I'll bring Ed in after um, I've taken the last question from Councillor Howe. So, Councillor Howe, for the last speech of the day, over to you. Uh, it's going to be short and sweet. Um, I just wish to bring back to a discussion we had about Devon County Show and protecting the Devon County Showground and the parking related to it. Um, I do believe our showgrounds and other such 
uh, fundamental event space should be protected by policy. And that doesn't just include the showground. It has to include the parking spaces around it. Otherwise, we will lose it. And we don't want to lose it as far as I'm concerned. Um, so I think we, again, it's another policy we ought to have in there somewhere and something that needs a bit of thought and, and temptation. Um, other than that, I'll leave all the rest because the short speeches we've just had was really good. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor How Ed, over to you just to cover off those last two points, please. Um, thank and you, Chair. So um, in terms of uh, Councillor Moulding's point on, on deliverability, I think the, the, the point in terms of what's informed the working draft of the local plan is the evidence and information we have at this point in time on deliverability. Um, he's quite right. Obviously, I can't say hand on heart that, that, many, that a lot of the sites in there are deliverable at this point in time because we're still building up the evidence base and trying to understand what infrastructure would be needed to support them, to ensure that they are sustainable developments, the costs associated with doing that, and then how that stacks up in terms of what's viable for those uh, sites to deliver and how any shortfall would, would be met. So still a huge amount of work to, to be done on all of those sites. I suppose the, the reason we've taken the urban extension of Axminster out at this point in time is because we have a, a huge amount more information about that site. And that information tells me that at this point in time, it's, it's not deliverable. Um, that doesn't mean that that's not going to change. And I certainly am not, uh, haven't ditched it or, or not, have not given up on it. I'm still looking at ways of delivering it. And goodness knows I've done a lot of work over the years to try and deliver it as, as Councillor Moulding knows. Um, and I'm not willing to give up on it just yet. Um, but what I didn't want to do was, was leave it in uh, the working draft of the local plan. Uh, knowing that it's, um, well, currently, according to the Master Plan, 850 houses, which vastly skews the housing figures as things stand with a site that, hand on heart, I can't say is deliverable based on the extensive evidence we've now got. Um, if ways of delivering it come forward, and I'm still working on that, then obviously I would, would recommend that it goes back in. Um, but uh, I didn't want it to skew the discussions in terms of the working draft local plan. Um, and I assume that... Um, we, we had those sites as at that land as it were because I don't think we have based on the evidence we've got at the moment um, but I'm still having discussions with the developers and trying to move that forward discussions with Devon County about how uh, it could be accessed um, how we can deliver the relief road how we deal with highways issues in Axminster as a whole in terms of moving forward the local plan and the strategy for Axminster so that work's still ongoing so um, I, I haven't given up on it but um, I can only work on the evidence we've got at this point in time. <laughs> um, in terms of Councillor Howell's point about Devon County Showground, uh, certainly hear what he says on, on that. Um, certainly we can, can look at that, uh, certainly in terms of the showground it, itself. Difficult in terms of car parking areas because there's sort of overflow car parking off site sites as well, aren't there, that um, are, are fields used for a couple of days of the year. <coughs> Excuse me. So. Um, whether or not there's a need to, to protect those or just ensure that there is adequate space uh, it's perhaps more of a car parking strategy for the county show I don't know uh, I'm talking off the top of my head need to do some more work on that and have a look into that but certainly uh, can see that there's a, a principle there in terms of uh, protecting West Point as, as a local uh, event space shall we say um, so we'll, we'll take that away and have a look into that thank you chair Thank you very much, Ed. Um, so what we need to do now is just take a formal vote of all the policy made in the previous meetings from December up until now. Um, the, our, all of the votes previously had just been straw polls. So we just need a formalised vote that um, all the decisions made previously uh, are for officers to take forward. So uh, with that, Mrs Shaw, can you sum up, because I think I've done a really terrible job of explaining that, um, uh, and please take us to a vote. Thank you, Chair. Yes, members, if I can take you back to the report that the draft local plan was uh, appended to. There are three recommendations within that report. Um, if I could highlight in the third recommendation, some of you may have noticed that there is no paragraph 6.9 to the report. That should read 8.1 to the report. So. In essence, the, rec the three recommendations are 
that the committee recommends endorsement in principle of the proposed working draft local plan, recommends agreement to delegate authority to the service lead planning strategy and development management to progress with refinement and final formulation of draft policies, including through engagement with internal staff in key public sector outside partner bodies and service providers, and having considered paragraph 8.1 of the report have given a clear steer on the favoured approach to ensure allocation of sufficient and appropriate sites to meet housing and other development needs, noting that as currently drafted there is a significant element of housing need for which suitable sites have not been identified. Now those are the recommendations. Unfortunately I don't have a mover or a seconder, I don't know whether you wish to move from I'll, the chair. I'll move it from the chair. So Thank you very much. Just, just for, for members' benefit, obviously, as I've said, and just to reiterate, we will be bringing the sites back once the officers have done the further work um, on the utilising the policy to inform site allocations. Thank you. Members, please would you press your green tick if you're in support of the recommendation as just set out. Press Ed, your can I just bring you in just before we take that to a vote? Sorry. Apologies. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. So, uh, in terms of recommendation three, uh, it probably probably doesn't make uh, much sense as as it stands. Thinking about it, because it's referring to members giving a steer um, to the options in paragraph eight point one of the report. Um, so, members just voting on whether they're giving us a steer probably, probably doesn't help. Uh, it's possibly helpful to refer back to the minutes of the previous meeting where members took a straw poll on those options. And just to remind members that in that straw poll, uh, members were in favour of uh, options C, G and I uh, within that table in paragraph 8.1, option C being to look to, this was about meeting the housing shortfall that members will recall was in the plan. We had a shortfall of about 900 units. Option C was to look to villages below tier four for growth. G was search for extra sites, the extra call for sites that's been referred to. Um, and I be less restrictive to development in the AONBs. Um, so I, I would have thought members need to be voting on a motion that actually contains one or more of those options to be taken forward presumably based on the straw poll that was taken at the last meeting, assuming members are still in agreement with that. I think that they will Apolo be. Apologies, Shirley, no, but I think that council, makes more sense. I don't really understand this. I don't really understand this. I don't really understand why we're being asked, because I can't find a recommendation. I don't really understand why we're, we've been through everything. We haven't been through any of the sites. I don't really understand why we're now being asked to vote when we've done all our straw polls and why, why we're now having to revisit it. It, we're not revisiting, we're, we're just agreeing that the straw polls as a whole, instead of doing one vote, uh, one vote for each one, which is a binding one, we're doing one as, as an, a holistic vote to basically ratify all the decisions previously made as straw polls into one decision for saying your officers to then go away and do the, carry on with their work. But it's some just of a us procedural didn't, matter. But some of us didn't agree with all the this. this I mean, there've been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different straw polls, and it's yeah, and, and it's not just all formal. of us agreed with everyone. And now we're having to have a single vote. So I don't really understand why we're doing this. And also, you know, we haven't actually even looked at all the sites. So I'm I'm confused. If I may, chair. Yes, um, of course. Councillor Bailey, as the straw polls were informal, and as the report that came to members that had the draft local plan appended to it. These three recommendations were set out in the report, not in the policy document, the local plan document. But there's no recommendation in these agenda papers. The recommendation came from an agenda months and weeks and weeks and weeks ago. I, be, um, I do apologize, let me just check. On through you, Chair, the, the covering report to the Working Draft Local Plan is replicated in this agenda for today's meeting. Where, sorry? Yeah, so it's... Uh, Page 196. Councillor Ingham, we'll, we'll go to you while um, Councillor Bailey finds the page. Thanks, Chair. I, I have no problem at all accepting that they're straw polls and it's in principle, isn't it? 
Yeah. I'll give you a for example, and it's funny that Ed picked one out where, you know, I totally agree with C, G and I. Uh, it's a shame that they're all in silos because there's part of A that I agree with, with Axminster, but I don't agree with it for everywhere else, which is why I, you know, couldn't support it. So it is just in principle, isn't it, on these straw polls? That's how I see it. Thank you, Joe. It's just to give officers an indication of what to bring back when we when they bring back a revised working draft. Um, so with that, Councillor Rylance. Sorry, I hate to be that person, Chair, but um, we are not able to make decisions anyway, are we? Because uh, we're meeting virtually. So what, why would a, um, a blanket vote on all the things we've already have given an indicative vote on have any more weight than the previous indicative votes? I don't understand either. It, they were just straw polls. It's just a, a thing that we're this is trying just a to straw poll as well. Up. We're trying to mop everything up so that it's basically giving a decision on the recommendations listed in the report to senior officers to, to enact. We've done that. I'm afraid you haven't yet. It's, um, not the, it's not what the legal advice is. So what I'd prefer to so do we, is take, take the legal advice of our planning barrister and just follow through with the vote, please. Council just for clarification, we're, we're just confirming the things that we've voted on before, are we? Pretty much, yes. The results of the previous votes? Yes. But in a more way? Yes. Right. Councillor Skinner. Right. And let's, let, let, let's, crack, let's crack on, because I've got a Thank lot you. to do. I've got to close this. Fantastic. Yeah, That's what we're doing. Councillor well, Allen. Yes, uh, I must say that in terms of the overall strategic integration and holistic approach, I can't vote for this because it's clearly deficient in regard of integrating economics with housing, with infrastructure. And that's this fine, is not, and This we'll, is not adequate. And, and therefore, I am declaring my intention to vote against this. OK, fantastic. You can vote in a second. Mrs Shaw, can we go to a vote, please? Thank you very much. Members. If you're in support of the recommendation, please press your green tick. If you're against the recommendation, press your red cross. And if you wish to abstain, please raise your electronic hands. Waiting for the votes to come in. Okay, we have six votes in support, seven votes in support, two votes against and one abstention. Thanks uh, everybody for that. And then, so that brings our meeting to an end. Do you have anything further just to add just before we finish? Are, are we completely clear and happy moving forward? Um, well, I don't want to extend the meeting necessarily, but I, I'm slightly confused about what we're doing with recommendation three because the recommendation in the printed papers was that members give a clear steer on a favoured approach. And I thought um, that was clear from the straw poll that we did that we decided those three options that we would go out okay, to so, do a call to the sites. So we, take, we would look to AOMBs and uh, we would look to the smaller smaller villages outside of tier four. Okay, so we're, we're, we're taking the recommendation three was a vote to confirm that. And that's done yes, fine. yes, please. Apologies, Thank you. Yeah. No problem at all. Um, so with that, that brings our meeting to a close. Um, I'd like to thank everyone, including the members of the public, uh, for their attendance. Members, can I remind you that until Democratic Services confirm the live stream and recording has stopped, you can still be seen and heard. And any comments may, may be recorded. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to Ed Freeman. You're brilliant. Well done, Ed.